first thing to consider with the adoption of cloud computing is how it solves business problems. The first consideration is operating expenses versus capital expenditures. Operating expenses, or OPEX, would apply in a cloud computing environment where you pay on a monthly basis for cloud services used. That's as opposed to capital expenditures, or CapEx, which would apply on-premises. It's a capital expenditure when you have to pay for hardware and software and licenses and the configuration of those items. The other thing to think about with Microsoft Azure is high availability. There are Azure data centers all over the world, so it's a global presence. And what this means is that you can have services deployed in one geographical region, configure it to be replicated or exist in a secondary region so that a primary region disruption doesn't mean you lose access to that service. The other thing to consider is that we've got managed service capability in Azure. What this means is that most services, the underlying infrastructure is taken care of for us. For example, if you're deploying an app service web application, the underlying web server configuration is taken care of by Microsoft Azure. You don't have to manually deploy the VM to do that, although you could if you chose to. When you're preparing to use Azure, the first thing to think about is the skill set or the expertise to configure and manage it. So that might involve training IT staff currently on payroll, or it might involve hiring consultants that specialize in Microsoft Azure. You then need to map your business needs to Microsoft Azure services that are being offered. We'll look at that in a moment in further detail. And then you also have to consider whether you're going to migrate any existing on-premises services to Azure. Microsoft Azure has a lot of tools available to assess on-premises environments, whether they're physical or virtual servers, as well as databases to determine their cloud readiness. Now let's take a look at some example business needs and how Azure would address it. The first business need is secure, redundant storage. In Azure, this is possible with an Azure storage account that uses customer-managed keys for encryption, so that's the security side, and then geo-replication to ensure we've got an additional copy in a different region, should there be a failure in the primary region. The next business need is mission-critical app redundancy and high availability. Well, we could configure load balancing for the application using an auto-scaled virtual machine scale set. Now, this means that we would configure threshold settings that determine when things are busy, when we need to scale out or add virtual machines to handle the workload, or to save on costs, to scale in, to reduce the amount of virtual machine nodes supporting an app when things quiet down. The next business need is secure user sign-in for Office 365 access. To do that in Azure, we could enable user multi-factor authentication or MFA and configure Azure AD conditional access. If the business need is the analysis of big data, then we could use solutions such as Azure HD Insight. The next thing to consider in the cloud are service level agreements or SLAs. An SLA is a contractual document between a service provider and a service consumer. So it's not necessarily specific to the cloud, but it certainly applies to the cloud. So it could be between a customer and a cloud service provider or a CSP. The SLA might be between a customer and an internet service provider or an ISP. Or within an organization, you might even use SLAs between departments for chargeback, so between the sales department and usage of internal IT resources. In the Microsoft Azure Cloud, each cloud service offering has its own unique SLA. Service level agreements consist of a definition of the service that is covered by the agreement, service credits and how they are allocated, and also SLA exclusions or conditions under which the SLA might not apply. So for example, it's all about performance and reliability, and there is always a percentage of uptime that's specified within the SLA for a calendar month or a year. So for example, the SLA might guarantee 99.99% uptime, but if we have less than that, then we might end up with a three-day service credit for future Azure costs. Or if it's less than 95%, we might get a seven-day service credit. The next thing to consider in Azure are preview features. Microsoft Azure is constantly being improved, and this is a good thing. And so a lot of new features are released, 
However, they are released in a preview state, and you can turn these on or off for some services. So you might have to turn it on to use a new preview feature. However, often preview features are excluded from Azure SLEs until they reach general availability or GA. The Azure portal is the primary GUI tool used to deploy and manage Azure resources. It's available at portal.azure.com. When you sign in, your sign-in name will show up in the upper right. You can click on that so that you can sign out, but you can also switch between multiple Active Directory tenants that you might have. So if I were to choose Switch Directory, I could then get a list of all of my Azure AD Active Directory tenants listed here. And I could click on one to switch to it. Now, once you're in the correct tenant, and you'll see the name of it listed here, in my case, Quick24x7, you can then start to manage resources for that Azure AD tenant. Now, you can open up the left hand navigator where you can see a number of different views and actions. You can actually click create a resource. And from here, you can select from the categories of resources. So if I were to choose compute, on the right, I can select virtual machines, reserved VM instances, or even container clustering solutions like the Kubernetes service. I can also search for stuff. So if I search for virtual network, for example, I could choose from virtual network or virtual network Gateway. So you can search for or you can browse through the categories to select a resource that you want to create here. You also see that you have a breadcrumb trail as you start navigating through here. For example, if I click on virtual networks here in my recently used list, I see that up in the upper left, but I can click home to go back there easily. Of course, I could also click on my navigation bar on the left and also navigate to things like virtual machines or as we were just looking at virtual networks. It doesn't make a difference. I'm going to go back home here and I'm going to go to the all resources view, where as it implies, we see all of the resources that we've got created for this Azure AD tenant. We can see the name of the resource. We can see the type of resource it is and the resource group it was deployed into, the location and the subscription it's tied to. We can also filter items out here. We can filter by subscription, by resource group or by resource type. Currently, it says type equals all. Well, if I click on that, I can deselect select all. And all we're seeing here are or is a reflection rather of the types of resources that are available. So we know we've got one recovery services vault, one storage count and one virtual network. So let's say, for example, all I want to see are virtual networks. I could turn on that check mark, click outside of that, and the list is filtered in this case to show me only my one and only VNet, VNet1. Now, the other thing we can also do is filter it out by location. So currently we can see all we have is Canada Central, but this will become more and more relevant the more resources you have here in the portal. You can also configure various aspects of the portal's behavior by clicking the settings or the cog icon towards the upper right. So you can specify whether to sign out when inactive or the default home view, whether it's the home screen or a specific dashboard where you've added items. You can choose a color scheme. And as we scroll down, you can also enable pop-up notifications, which show up here in the notifications bar area. Now you have to click to see them unless you turn on pop-up notifications, in which case, as it implies, the notifications would pop up here on the screen. You also have the option here of going into Cloud Shell. Now, when you click on Cloud Shell, what you're doing is spawning a new instance in the background. It actually is a VM instance, but it lets you run PowerShell or the CLI. The first time that you do that, like I'm seeing here, it asks me to set up a storage account. However, I don't want to go any further with that, so I won't do that. You can also search in the top center search bar. For example, if I search for the word sub, it shows me everything related to that, such as subscriptions. Click on subscriptions. I can then see any Azure subscriptions associated with this tenant. We can see the tenant listed in the upper left here, Quick 24x7. And I can click on the subscription if I want to manage it further, such as creating a budget or viewing the last build amount and breaking down where the costs stem from on invoices.
While using GUI tools, graphical user interface tools to manage Azure can be simple, there are times when you want to use command line based tools, whether it be PowerShell or the CLI. Sometimes you're quicker at typing, and so it might be easier to manage things that way. Or you want to create a script to automate something using CLI commands or PowerShell commandlets. Now, we can either download PowerShell for Azure or the CLI and run on-premises, or we can run it here through the portal, which we're going to do here. It's called Cloud Shell. When you've signed into the Azure portal GUI, you can click on the Cloud Shell icon in the toolbar at the top. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. The first time you do this, it's going to tell you you don't have any storage. It needs a storage account because you might have some persistence requirements. You might want to upload files and have them stored in the storage account so they're available to Cloud Shell. When you run the CLI, the command line interface, or PowerShell commandlets on premises, they have access to your local file systems. But what about Cloud Shell? It has access to what's in the storage account. And so that's why this is important. So I'm going to go ahead and simply click on Create Storage. And after a moment, we're in Cloud Shell. Now let's just minimize that for a second. And in the left-hand navigator here in the portal, I'm going to go down and choose Storage Accounts because we want to verify the cloud storage account here that was created for our Cloud Shell persistence usage. And there it is. We can see it automatically was created and named. We can just go right back into Shell. I had minimized it. I didn't close it with the X. You can also maximize it. And you've also got the option of selecting between PowerShell and Bash. Now, when I'm in PowerShell, I can issue PowerShell commandlets. So for example, get command asterisk, let's say storage asterisk. Show me commandlets that have storage in their name, and that works fine. And if I run the AZ command set and press enter for the CLI, that also works here. I can switch over here to Bash. So I'm going to go ahead and click Confirm to do that. Now, if you find it's not large enough for viewing, you can click the Settings icon, Text Size here, and choose Large or whatever the case might be. So if you're more familiar with working in a Bash shell environment, which you would be if you have extensive experience with Unix and Linux, you might want to work here. Now, from here, you would be able to use the Azure CLI. So there's the AZ command set. If I were to run something like get dash command storage, just like I had done previously in PowerShell, comes back and says, I don't know what get dash command is, because that's for a Windows environment specifically, for PowerShell. Now, you also have the option here of uploading and downloading content. So you can upload files, for example, that you might have on premises, maybe script files or data files, or maybe it's an ARM template or some kind of config file that you want your CLI commands or alternatively PowerShell, to reference. So you can simply upload them and have them available here for your usage. The great thing about using Cloud Shell also is that you're already authenticated to Azure. So for example, if you're in PowerShell, there's really no need. It's not necessary to run connect-az account. Just like if you're in the CLI, there's no need to run az login. You're already authenticated. Microsoft PowerShell was introduced way back in 2006. And it's not just for developers. PowerShell is a command line way of managing items such as Windows stations, or in our case, Azure resources. So it allows administrators and not only developers to automate tasks, in this case related to Azure. Here in my web browser, I've gone to the Azure PowerShell documentation where we have many options. We can choose to install Azure PowerShell. So we could install that on our on-premises system. We could also install Azure PowerShell, not only by downloading, but also by installing the appropriate module. We could see here, we can run install-module-name AZ for Azure. Now you could do this from your PowerShell command prompt on your on-premises system. However, I'm going to close that out. You can also run PowerShell directly through the portal. Here in the Azure portal, if I go into the Cloud Shell, here's the Cloud Shell icon at the top, I can do that and I can select to either run PowerShell, there's a drop-down list on the left, or Bash. 
Now, a bash shell would be more applicable if you didn't want to run PowerShell commandlets, but instead you wanted to run Azure CLI commands in a Unix or Linux type of environment. So I'm interested in PowerShell, so I'm going to let that continue and I'm going to maximize the Cloud Shell screen. Now, the first thing I'll do here is I'll clear the screen with CLS and I'm going to run get module and I'm going to use asterisk az asterisk. Here we can see we have a number of PowerShell modules that start with az. Now, a PowerShell module you can think of as being a library or a collection of related PowerShell commandlet definitions. So we've got one for az.compute for virtual machines and containers, az.network to work with vnets and subnets and so on, az.storage to work with storage accounts and so on. If I were to run git dash command dash module, I could specify a module name like az.storage. And from here, I would see all of the commandlets available within that specific PowerShell module. You would do the exact same thing if you were running PowerShell on premises and you had installed the AZ modules. You can also do things such as git dash command. And maybe you're interested in how to add a new storage account, but you're not sure what the command let's call. You can start to kind of guess this stuff by using asterisks. The asterisk symbol is a wild card. So if I say git dash command asterisk new asterisk storage asterisk, basically, as long as we've got new and storage within the name of the commandlet, we're going to see it. So for example, new dash az storage context. And if we kind of scroll back up, we've got all of these items, new az storage account. Once you start determining what the name of the commandlets are, you can then start getting help using get dash help, such as new dash az storage account. I can even ask for detail. And I might even pipe that to more to stop after the first screen full of output. So I can learn how to use this commandlet. So I can see the syntax here showing all of the many available command line parameters, which are explained further down below in an alphabetical format as we go all the way down through. And eventually, if we do run that, I'm going to run that again. I'll use the up arrow key, but I'm going to run it without piping it to more. The reason I'm doing that is you'll notice when you ask for detailed help, you'll see some examples at the bottom of how to use that specific commandlet. So for example, here I'm looking at example five for creating a new Azure storage account. So there's plenty that you can learn very easily directly within PowerShell. Of course, you can then search online and refer to the Microsoft Azure PowerShell documentation. The last thing to bear in mind, we don't have to do it here because we're in Cloud Shell, but on premises, you would use the connect-az account PowerShell commandlet to authenticate to Azure. The Azure CLI or command line interface allows Azure technicians to work at the command line to deploy and also to manage existing Azure resources. Here in my web browser, I've searched up Azure CLI, and in the Microsoft pages here, I can see I have the option to install the CLI on Windows or on the Mac OS. Now, you can also do that. Now, aside from downloading and running the CLI on premises, you can also run it through Cloud Shell here in the portal. Click the Cloud Shell icon up at the top. When it opens up, I can select either between PowerShell and Bash. Now, you can run the CLI within the PowerShell environment. The difference is that when you're in PowerShell, you have a Windows type of environment. So if you're used to Windows commands and how variables are treated, that's what you should do, even if you're going to use the CLI. But if you're more used to the unix -y environment, you might elect to switch over to Bash. So either way, it doesn't matter. You're going to have access to the Azure CLI command set. To get started, the first thing that we should do is take a look at the version of the CLI that we're running. Now, the reason this is important is because there are different versions of the CLI. And when you look at documentation online, it might be specific to one of those versions. So I'm going to run az as a prefix, command prefix for Azure, dash dash version. And what it will return back is the versions that we're running for the various items here. So let me just scroll back up a little bit. 
we can see the Azure CLI version here is 2.2.0. Again, that's going to be important if you start referring to CLI syntax examples out on the internet. I can also run AZ-H for help. Now, when I do that, it'll give me help for the next level command following AZ. Now, I'm scrolling back up here. I could, of course, clear the screen, use the up arrow key to bring up that previous command and pipe it to more to stop after the first screen full. So currently, we already know that we have the AZ command because we've typed it in. We've asked for help beyond that. And beyond that, we have an alphabetical listing of subgroups for CLI commands. So we could run AZ account to manage Azure subscription information or AZ batch to work with Azure batch and so on. Quit out of that. So the next thing we might do, say, okay, well, what about running virtual machine types of commands? If I run AZ-H and pipe it to more again, and if we kind of keep scrolling down, we'll eventually get to the point where we can see whether or not we know what the command set to work with virtual machines is. And it looks here like it's VM. Quit out of that. AZVM-H. What's next after VM? Well, the subgrouping for VM then, if we kind of take a look at the output, would be to do things like create an Azure virtual machine or to delete one or to list them. Interesting. So I'll clear the screen again. AZVM list. And then from there, ask for help again, dash H. So we'll see the next subgroup of commands that would be available in this case for AZVM list. So we can see what would be available here. So this is a great way to learn how to use the CLI. The last thing I'll mention is that we are running the CLI here through Cloud Shell. So we're already authenticated to Azure. If you're running the CLI on-premises, you won't automatically be authenticated to Azure, in which case you would run the AZ login command first. When it comes to computer programming, an application programming interface or an API is a collection of related functions and allows the control of either a hardware solution or in our case with cloud computing in Azure, a software solution. So APIs then expose functionality in this case for Azure services. Each Azure service like virtual machines, storage account, content delivery networks, and so on is exposed via APIs. And the benefit of this is they can be controlled programmatically. So Azure APIs exist then for content delivery network configurations, Azure storage blob services, Azure Compute, which is virtual machines as we've mentioned, Azure network components, and many other items. Representational state transfer or REST APIs is very common with calling upon APIs that are exposed. So when we talk about REST APIs, we're really talking about a software design style where the access of that web service is called upon programmatically normally over the HTTP protocol. It doesn't have to be, but that by far would be the norm. So using tools like the Azure CLI and PowerShell commandlets, they actually use the Azure REST API. Of course, you can also call upon these APIs directly using the programming language of your choice. Another aspect of APIs in Azure is the API gateway. You can deploy an Azure API gateway that sits between your API calls, so software components that might sit outside of Azure, and the API definition itself, which can be hosted in Azure. So it provides API packaging, publishing, and even documentation. Calling upon an API is only possible when you know details about the API through documentation. Things like required parameters and data types and return values. There are benefits of using the Azure API Gateway, one of which is throttling. This gives you the ability to limit the amount of incoming requests so that your API is not flooded with too many requests in a busy environment. You can also monitor the health of your API, monitor connections to the API through the Gateway, and also look at usage analytics so you can determine if performance is at an acceptable level or not. You can also configure API gateway policies. Now, policies allow you 
to control the behavior of the API. Policies use an XML file format, and these will affect API responses and also how API requests to the API are treated. Now, there are a number of built-in policies you can use with the gateway, or you could build your own. Some of the built-in policies exist that can handle send requests, so sending specific REST API requests to a different URL, or checking the HTTP header for a specific value, or requiring authentication with a client certificate. So, in this course, we've examined how Azure addresses a company's business IT needs. We've looked at tools for managing Azure resources and exposing Azure services to developers through APIs. We did this by exploring the business case for Azure and how Azure can address business IT needs. We looked at how to manage Azure resources using the Azure portal, how to manage Azure resources using Azure Cloud Shell. We also looked at how to manage Azure resources using Azure PowerShell commandlets, how to manage Azure resources using the Azure CLI, and finally, how APIs can be used to deploy and manage Azure resources. In our next course, we'll move on to explore Azure virtual networking, including how to create a VNet and a subnet in the Azure cloud, and how to use VNet peering to link VNets together. There are a number of virtual network components to consider when planning your Azure virtual network design. The first is the VNet itself, which contains one or more subnets. Then we have IP address ranges we have to consider. You configure an IP address range for a VNet, and the subnets within that VNet must have their own IP address ranges that fall within the VNet subnet range. So it's all about IP addressing at that level, whether we're talking about IPv4 or IPv6. Then we have to think about whether we want to configure a VPN, a virtual private network, to allow connectivity over the internet to Azure resources through an encrypted VPN tunnel. An Azure virtual network or VNet is defined as a resource in the Azure cloud. When you define its IP address range, you have to think about the IP address ranges that will be used by the subnets within that VNet. You can also determine if you want to use Azure provided DNS servers for name resolution, which happens to be the default config, or whether you want to specify your own custom DNS servers if required. So your Azure virtual network can also be considered an extension of an on-premises network if you were to link them together, let's say, through a site-to-site -site VPN. Azure VNet subnets, as we know, have an IP address range that must fall within the VNet IP address range. You associate network interfaces with subnets. The network interface, by extension, is, of course, used by a virtual machine running in the Azure cloud. You can also associate a network security group or an NSG with a subnet. An NSG contains security rules that determine what type of network traffic is allowed or not allowed into or out of the subnet. So if you've got a bunch of virtual machines that are in a subnet through their network interface association and they have the same firewalling needs for network traffic, you could associate the NSG to the subnet. There's also a route table that can be associated with the subnet if you want to control network traffic flow through custom routes. And remember that subnets are contained within a VNet. You can manage Azure network components using an ARM template. ARM stands for Azure Resource Manager. An ARM template uses JSON syntax. And within that template, we can define Azure resources, such as VNets and subnets, that we want to define. We can also use PowerShell to manage our Azure network components, the Azure CLI, and of course, we can also use the portal. So if you were going to use PowerShell, let's say, to create a VNet, it would look something like this. The first thing I'm doing is creating a subnet variable, dollar sign subnet. In PowerShell, variables must be prefixed with the dollar sign symbol. What I'm doing is storing in that variable the result of running new dash az virtual network subnet config. So I'm defining the config of the subnet first. 
I'm naming the subnet subnet1, and I'm setting the IP address prefix in this case to 10.0.1.0 slash 24, so 24 bits in the subnet mask. Down below, I'm creating the VNet using the new dash AC virtual network command lib. I'm specifying the dash resource group name parameter to put this in a resource group, specifying the dash location parameter. Here I'm setting it to Canada East, and I'm setting the name parameter to name this VNet VNet4. Then I'm using the dash address prefix parameter, and I'm setting the VNet address prefix to 10.0.0.0 slash 16. Notice that the subnet address prefix up above falls within this VNet range. Finally, I use the dash subnet parameter and associate our dollar sign subnet variable here with the new VNet we're creating, VNet4. Next, creating a VNet using the CLI is fairly straightforward. I use the AZ network VNet create syntax, dash G for the resource group where it will be deployed, dash N for the name of the VNet, in this case VNet5, dash dash address dash prefix for the VNet address prefix, dash dash subnet dash name for the subnet I want to create, in this case subnet1 I'm calling it, and of course dash dash subnet dash prefix for the subnet's IP address range, which again must fall within the VNet IP address range. Azure DNS is a name resolution service. DNS, of course, stands for Domain Name System. The idea is that it's commonly used to resolve friendly names on the internet to IP addresses. DNS in Azure can also be used to host zones where a DNS zone is where the records for a DNS domain are stored. A DNS domain is just a name, it's a string, but the zone is actually the configuration of it. For example, if we have a DNS domain called quick24x7.com, we can create a zone for it to store records so that we would be able to resolve things like www.quick24x7.com to its related IP address. So you can host private or public domain names in Azure. There are many different types of DNS records that we can create in DNS record sets within an Azure DNS zone, such as an A record, which is used to resolve friendly names to IPv4 addresses, or a quad A record, which is used to resolve friendly names to IPv6 addresses. Interestingly, IPv6 addresses are four times longer than IPv4 32-bit addresses. There's MX or mail exchanger records for SMTP mail transfer between servers. There are CNAME records. CNAME stands for canonical name. Essentially, it's an alias record that points to another DNS record. So you can have alias or multiple names for the same host. And we've got PTR or reverse lookup pointer records. This means that you already know the IP address. You want to resolve that to a DNS name. In Azure DNS, you can go with Azure provided DNS servers. Now this is done at the VNet level, the virtual network level. This is the default configuration and it's used to resolve public DNS names. So if you've got virtual machines deployed in a VNet, you can expect that they will resolve public DNS names correctly. You can also use it for virtual machine name resolution within the VNet. And the DNS names here are applied to virtual machines that are deployed in that VNet and network interfaces. You can also configure custom Azure DNS server settings. You might do this for virtual machine name resolution across VNets or because you've got infrastructure as a service or IaaS virtual machines as Active Directory domain controllers. And Active Directory, if you've set it up manually in the cloud, uses DNS for name resolution. So you might want to point to them that way for that reason. You can also use DNS forwarding to Azure if you are using your own custom DNS server. So you get the best of both worlds that way. Here we can see the configuration of DNS servers within a VNet. And this is being done in the Azure portal. On the right, we can see instead of the default Azure provided DNS servers, custom has been selected here and two IP addresses for two different DNS servers have been specified. You can specify more than two DNS servers. I've specified five and you can even go beyond that when required. 
Now, if you're going to host a public DNS zone in Azure, in other words, it's going to be used to resolve names publicly out on the internet, you have to make sure that you already control that DNS zone through a DNS registrar. In other words, you have to own that DNS name. So you manage DNS then using normal Azure credentials because you could sign in, for example, to the Azure portal and manage the record sets in your DNS zone through that interface. So using the portal, you could also use PowerShell or using the CLI as well. In this demonstration, I'm going to use the Azure portal to create a VNet, a virtual network. Now, just like you would do this on premises, you need first to have planned things such as how many VNets you're going to need and subnets within them, the IP addressing that will be used, which types of services you're going to deploy into those VNet subnets, and so on. I've already thought about those things. So to get started here in the portal, I'm going to choose create a resource. And what I'm going to do is search for virtual network and I'll choose virtual network from the list and then I'll choose create. I'm going to deploy this into an existing resource group, although there is a link where I could create a new one. And I'm going to call this virtual network VNet1. I'm going to deploy it in a specific region in Canada. So here in my case, Canada Central, and then I'll click next for the IP addresses. So the IP address space it wants to assign is 10.0.0.0 slash 16. So 16 bit subnet mask. I'm okay with that default. So I'm going to leave that as it is. I'm not going to assign additional IP address spaces and I'm not interested in adding an IPv6 address space. Now down below, it's going to create a subnet called default and we can see that it's going to use the entire subnet address range 10.0.0.0 but with the 24-bit subnet mask. I want to control that a little bit more than what is presented here by default. So I'm going to remove that subnet and click Add Subnet. First of all, I'm going to call this Subnet1. Next, I'm going to use 10.0.1.0 slash 24 as this subnet's IP address range. So our network, our VNet is 10.0. So I've gone beyond that to 10.0.1. So that's the first three bytes or octets. That works out to be 24 bits in the subnet mask. So that's what I'm going to create here and I'm going to click add. So now there's subnet one listed down below within our VNet. I'm gonna click the next security button in the bottom right. I'm going to leave the default selections for DDoS protection and firewall. I'll click next for tags. I could assign tag information here. I don't want to. And I'll click next. It's going to run the validation. And once it's passed, I will click create to deploy the VNet. Once the deployment is complete, I'm going to click go to resource just so we can examine the VNet a little bit. So we can see VNet1 here exists. We can see the location is Canada Central and the resource group association. We can see the address space over on the right. Notice that the DNS server configuration is Azure provided DNS service by default. We'll see that as well if we were to click on DNS servers over here on the left to open up that blade. Notice it's set to default Azure provided DNS. If I click subnets, here we'll see the subnet that we defined upon creation, subnet one, along with its IP address range. Now, when I go to the overview blade again for VNet one, notice under connected devices over on the right, there's nothing because we've just created the VNet. And so we haven't had a chance yet to deploy anything into this VNet. But once we start deploying virtual machines that have network interfaces and so on, we would start to see this populated. You can use the Azure portal to create subnets within a VNet. Here in the portal, I'm going to start by opening up the navigation bar on the left so that I can go down and choose virtual networks in which I will see I've got a VNet called VNet1. So I'm going to click on it to open up its properties. Now in the properties, I'm interested on the left in the navigation bar and scrolling down and clicking on subnets. When it pulls up the subnets blade, I'll see on the right that I've got one subnet here already. It's called subnet one. Now I want to add an additional subnet. Now when we do that, we have to make sure that 
the subnet IP address space falls within the VNet address space. Let's just go back up here and go to the overview blade for the VNet again. Notice that the address space here is 10.0.0.0 slash 16. So 16 bits means 10.0. So we have to at least have that as a prefix for our network address for the subnet we're about to create. Okay, so let's do that. Let's go back to the subnets blade and let's click the add subnet button. Then when we do that, we'll have to specify some details, of course, like the name. I'm going to call this subnet2. And down below, we can see here the CIDR block address range that we need to specify. In this case, I'm going to put in 10.0.0. Two. We can see in the background for subnet 1, we're already using 10.0.1.0/24 for subnet 1. So this one I'm going to be calling 10.0.2.0/24. Not calling it, but configuring the CIDR block range to be. I'm not going to associate a NAT gateway or a network security group or a route table with this particular subnet. So I'm okay with it as it is. I'm going to click OK. Now, once we've done this, we'll see that we will have created a new subnet, subnet 2. We can see the IPv4 address range that we assigned. Notice that we only have 251 available IP addresses. Now, if you work a lot with TCP IP and addressing with IPv4, you might say, well, wait a minute. With 24 bits in the subnet mass, that leaves an entire byte, which is 8 bits, which really works out to be 256 IP addresses. Normally we subtract the fact that we can't have all zeros and ones at the binary level. So normally 254. Well, we don't see 254 here, 251. Where are the other three? They're used internally by Azure. And so when you're planning out your IP address spaces for subnets and how many devices you need to accommodate with IP addressing, such as virtual machines, remember that it's normal that Azure consumes a handful of IP addresses for its own internal use. In this demonstration, I'm going to use PowerShell to create a VNet, a virtual network in Azure. I'm going to choose to do this using the Cloud Shell built into the Azure portal. So here in the portal, I'm going to start by clicking on the Cloud Shell icon at the top. And I've already had it open and it timed out, so it tells me that it's timed out and I can either reconnect or quit. So here I'm going to choose reconnect. So the next thing I'll do here is clear the screen with the CLS command. And I'm going to begin by creating a subnet variable that contains the subnet config before we build the VNet. So I'm going to call that variable dollar sign subnet. In PowerShell, variables are always prefixed with the dollar sign symbol. Then I'm going to run new dash AZ virtual network subnet config. I'm going to name the new subnet subnet one. And I have to have planned this ahead of time. I've got the address prefix set here as 30.0.1.0 slash 24, a 24 bit subnet mask. So I have to have planned this ahead of time in terms of knowing what the IP address range for the VNet will be because the subnet IP address ranges must fall within the VNet IP range. So I'm going to go ahead and press enter. Now at this point, I just get some warning messages about the fact that this commandlet may change down the road. And one of the things I can do to suppress these warnings, because it doesn't mean that the commandlet is currently deprecated. But one of the things that I can do here is set the environment variable using set dash item env for environment colon slash and the item is suppress azure powershell breaking change warnings and i'm going to set that to a value of true because it's true i do want to suppress them now let's just take a look here at our dollar sign subnet variable to make sure it looks like it contains the appropriate information it looks like it does we've got the name set to subnet one and we've got the subnet address prefix configured according to our command line perfect so the next thing I'm going to do is use the new dash AZ virtual network commandlet to build the VNet. I'm going to specify the resource group where I want the VNet deployed and the location or region. I'm going to name this VNet VNet2 and I'm setting the address prefix here to 30.0.0.0 slash 16. So of course, it's important that we remember that the subnet IP ranges fall within the VNet range and, they, and it does in this particular case. 
Then finally, I'll use the dash subnet parameter and I'll give it the variable we created previously, dollar sign subnet. Remember, dollar sign subnet contains the subnet configuration information, the name of the subnet and the IP address range for it. So I'm going to go ahead and press enter to do that. And it looks like the provisioning state succeeded. So we can see here our subnet definition. And as we go back even further up, we can also see that our VNet VNet2 was successfully created. Now this is interesting. Notice that we've got some tags automatically added here. We've got the cost center tag added without us doing anything with a value of YHZ. That would be because there must be a policy in place that automatically make sure that those tags are added if they are not specified. So it's a default tag that's set up at the policy level. Okay, so let's clear the screen again with CLS. I'm gonna run get dash AZ virtual network. Let's just try to see if our network is showing up here. And how about we pipe that to select, and we tell it we wanna see the name. And indeed we can see we've got a VNet called VNet2. We can also check our work in the portal. So if I were to go, let's say, in the left-hand navigator and choose virtual networks, we'll see VNet2. We're going to open it up and just poke around for a moment. There's VNet2. I'll click to open it up. One of the things I want to do here is click on the subnets blade to open it up. And indeed, we do see there is subnet1 with the address range that we had specified. In this demonstration, I'm going to use PowerShell to create a subnet within an existing VNet, a virtual network. You can see here in the cloud shell in the portal, I've already issued the get dash AZ virtual network commandlet. I've piped it to select and I've specified that I only want the name property. We can see that we have two VNets here, VNet1 and VNet2. I want to create a subnet within VNet2. But before we do that, I'm just going to examine it a bit further here in the portal. So I'm going to minimize Cloud Shell. Here in the portal, I've opened up VNet2 and I'm looking at the subnet's blade. Currently, we have a subnet called Subnet1 and it's using the address range of 30.0.1.0 slash 24. So I can't use that. So I'm going to create Subnet2 and I'm going to use 30.0.2.0 with a 24-bit subnet mask. Okay, so let's go back into the cloud shell and let's make this happen. So the first thing I want to do is make a virtual network variable. I'm going to call it VNet. So dollar sign VNet equals get dash AZ virtual network dash name and VNet2. So I want to store VNet2 in the dollar sign VNet variable. The next thing I want to do is show the existing subnets within VNet2. We just did that in the portal, but we can just as well do it here. So get dash AZ virtual network subnet config dash virtual network. And why don't we just use our VNet variable here, dollar sign VNet. And here I can see that we've got subnet1, just as we saw in the portal, along with its IP address prefix for IPv4. Now I'm going to use the up arrow key to bring up that command again. I'm just going to pipe it to select. Tell it I want the name, comma, address prefix. You don't have to do this. It just weeds out the stuff you might not be interested in at the moment. And in this case, it only shows us the name of the subnet and the address prefix. So just something to think about. Now I want to make a new subnet. So to do that, I'm going to use add dash AZ. This is a long one, virtual network subnet config. So it's a bit of a mouthful. It's a long command let name. I want to name this, so I'll specify that with the name parameter. I want to call this subnet2. I'm going to specify dash virtual network. I have to tie it to a VNet. Well, we've got a variable to do that, so that's pretty easy for us. Dash virtual network dollar sign VNet. And I'm going to set the address prefix dash address prefix. In this case, I want it to be 30.0.2.0 slash 24, and I'm going to go ahead and press enter. And it looks like it's good to go. Well, let's just verify that that's the case. Clear the screen. We'll use the up arrow key to get back to our get dash AZ virtual network subnet config command where we piped it to select. And now when we do it, we can see, in fact, the presence of subnet 2 with its configured IP address range.
In this demonstration, I'm going to use the CLI in Azure to create a virtual network, a VNet. So the way I'm going to do that is here in the portal, I've already launched Cloud Shell. So to get started, I'm going to try to get a bit of help here. I'm going to run AZ, which is the first part of the command syntax for the CLI, but I don't know what follows that. So I'm going to use dash H and I'll press enter. Now I'm wondering what the next level command would be after AZ. And by looking through the alphabetical list of subgroups, I'll eventually come across a lot of the options that are listed, such as network. That sounds like it's probably what I want. We could verify this, of course. I can do AZ space network space dash H. And at this point, I'll have the options such as VNet. This is all making sense. So this is how we can start to determine what the syntax should be if we want to use the built-in help for the CLI. Let's put it together. AZ network VNet create dash G. And I'm going to specify the resource group I want this VNet to be deployed into. In this case, I've already got one called R. G1, resource group one, dash N for the name. I want this to be called VNet3. The next thing is dash dash address dash prefix, which I should have planned ahead of time. In this case, I want my VNet to use 14.0.0.0, so 14.0.0.0 slash 16, which really means that the network address for the VNet here is 16 bits long. In this case, it's 14.0. Okay, that makes sense. So once we've done that, I need to specify some other items because I want to build a subnet too. So dash dash subnet dash name. I'm going to call the first subnet here subnet one dash dash subnet dash prefix, which must fall within the VNet IP address range. In this case, or I'm going to type rather 14.0.1.0 slash 24. So 24 bits in the mask. Notice, of course, it's using the same VNet network address of 14.0, so it falls within the range correctly. Let's press enter to build both VNet3 and subnet1 within it. And after a moment, it looks like it's good. The provisioning state here is succeeded. So let's just verify this. I'm going to clear the screen with CLS. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is check my work. I can do that with AZ network VNet list. However, it lists a lot of details, and that might be fine. You might want to see all of the properties, but really, the only thing I'm really interested in seeing here is the name of each virtual network, which we can see here is the name properties. How do we filter that out? One way to do that is to do this. So AZ space network, space VNet, space list, dash dash query, space, open and close square bracket, which implies we have an array. We have a collection of potentially more than one VNet and we want the name property of each one. So open and close square bracket dot and the property is name. And when I press enter, we can see now all we have listed are the names of the VNets, including the one that we just created in the CLI VNet3. In this demo, the goal is to use the CLI to create a new subnet within an existing VNet. So the first order of business is to determine which VNets already exist. I've already launched Cloud Shell within the portal. So the next thing I need to do is start issuing commands to start figuring out which VNets are already there. So I could do that by running AZ network VNet list. Now what I'm going to do is add dash dash query space open and close square brackets because we're referring to a collection or an array of multiple VNets potentially. And then I'm going to put in dot name because I want the name property for each VNet. And we can see here that we've got three VNets, VNet1, VNet2, and VNet3. I'm primarily interested in adding a subnet to VNet3. So I'm going to clear the screen and to get this going, let's run AZ network VNet subnet create dash G for resource group. I've already got a resource group called RG1 where my VNet exists. Dash dash VNet dash name. Well, we just saw it there. It's called VNet3. That's where we want to add the new subnet. Now we have to name that subnet. So dash N and how about we call it subnet2. And I must assign an IP address prefix for it. And it must fall within the VNet range. 
So I'm going to use dash dash address dash prefixes. And in this case, I already know the range used by the VNet. So for the subnet, I'm going to put in 14.0.2.0 slash 24. Now, before we go ahead and do that, let's just figure out something here. Let's determine what the VNet IP address range is. So I'm going to minimize cloud shell. And I'm interested in looking at VNet 3. So I'm just going to make sure I'm refreshing the portal and seeing the latest info. There's VNet 3. And within VNet 3, I'm interested in its subnets. Aha, there it is, subnet 1. We can see it's already using 14.0.1.0 24. If I go to the overview blade for VNet 3, we'll see the address space at the VNet level is simply 14.0.0.0 slash 16. Okay, I get it. So that's how I know that I've got an address range here that's valid and fits within the VNet address space. Let's go ahead and press enter to create the subnet. We can see that the provisioning state is such that it succeeded. I'm going to clear the screen. I'm going to run AZ network VNet subnet list. And I'm going to run dash dash query space open and close square bracket dot name. I want the subnet names within a particular VNet. But of course it says, well, that's fine, but you didn't tell me the resource group or the VNet name that you want to check. That's okay. Let's bring up the up arrow key and dash dash. Or I can use just dash G for resource group or G1 and dash dash VNet dash name. Well, in this case, it's VNet3. Let's see how we fare this time. So now that we've told it all of the required information, it now returns that we have two specific subnets in VNet3, subnet1 and subnet2, which we just created. VNet peering lets you link VNets together in an Azure environment. Now these VNets can either be within the same Azure region, but they can also be in a different Azure region. The purpose here is that when you peer VNets together, resources deployed in each VNet appear to be on a single or on the same VNet, so it facilitates connectivity. VNet peering also can reduce network latency. Now, this is definitely true if you are peering VNets that are in the same region. The other thing to think about is that the traffic sent between VNets is private. What that means is it does not go over the internet. Instead, the traffic goes through Microsoft's backbone network, which is a global network. We can enable VNet peering directly between two VNets, as pictured here, between VNet1 and VNet2. But you can also link VNets together indirectly to a centralized or a hub VNet. So what you'd be looking at here is sort of a hub and spoke topology. So in our diagram, in our hub VNet, we've got a VPN gateway. Now, let's say that we did that because we want to allow remote connectivity from outside of Azure securely through a VPN tunnel into the hub VNet. Well, if we've enabled VNet peering from VNets 1 and 2 to the hub VNet, and we've got a VPN gateway, that means after VPN connectivity is established into the hub VNet, access is available to resources in both VNets 1 and VNet 2. We can enable VNet peering using GUI tools like the Azure portal, but also we can do it through PowerShell as seen here. In the first example at the top, I'm creating a variable called $VNet1. And what's going to be stored in that is the return value of running get-az virtual network. I'm pointing to a VNet named VNet1 in a resource group called RG1. I'm doing the same thing for a second VNet called VNet2. So I'm establishing my two variables in the first chunk of code. In the middle, I'm then adding the peering using the add-az virtual network peering. I'm giving it a name. So in this case, I'm just naming the peered connection vnet1-vnet2. I'm specifying dash virtual network of vnet1, my vnet1 variable. And then the remote virtual network I want to peer it with, I'm referring to my dollar sign vnet2 variable and then calling upon the dot ID property. Then the last thing I'm doing is the same thing in the opposite direction. I'm adding the network peered connection from VNet2 to VNet1. 
You can also set up VNet peering using the Azure CLI. So the first thing I'm doing in the first line is I'm setting a variable called VNet1 equal to running AZ Network VNet show, and I'm pointing to a resource group called RG1, and a VNet name called VNet1, and I'm querying for the ID property. And that's what I'm storing in VNet1. I'm also storing for VNet2 its ID in a variable called VNet2. Then in the middle, I'm setting up the peered connection from one direction. Specifically, I'm setting it from VNet1, and I'm setting it to the remote VNet ID of VNet2. And then I do the same thing at the bottom. I set up the VNet peered connection from the opposite direction, which is possible. So I can set it from VNet2 to VNet1. You can use the Azure portal to peer VNets together. You'd want to peer VNets together because number one, you might want to take advantage of the fact that the traffic doesn't go over the internet. Instead, it goes through Microsoft's backbone network. And if the two VNets are in the same region, you have even more reduced network latency when traffic is transmitted. To get started here in the portal, I'm looking at my list of existing virtual networks. I've got VNets 1, 2, and 3. I'm going to peer VNets 2 and 3 together. And so to do this, I'm going to start by clicking on VNet2 to open up its properties. I'm going to scroll down in the navigation bar and I'm going to click on peerings. Now, when I pull up the peerings blade on the right, I'll see if any existing peered relationships exist. Currently, there are none. It says no results. So I'm going to go ahead and click add. I want to peer VNet2 directly with VNet3. So I'll click add to do that. Now I have to give a name for this peering connection. So I'm going to call it from VNet2 to VNet3. And down below, I'm going to select the target virtual network, which is VNet3. And I'm going to scroll down below there, and it wants a name for the peering connection from VNet3 to VNet2, because it's essentially a two-way street. You have to do the same config of both directions. So let's let's make that configuration. I'm going to call this one from VNet3 to VNet2. Now down below, we have a number of options for this peered connection between the VNets, depending on how we want it to behave. So first of all, we want to allow network access from VNet2 to VNet3. That is enabled. And also from VNet2 to VNet3, those are both enabled by default. Then we've got an option below that to allow forwarded traffic from VNet3 to VNet2, and it's disabled by default. So that means if we have traffic that doesn't originate from VNet3, do we still want it to be able to forward it to VNet2? So we can enable that if that would be the case. Now, in this case, we're just linking VNets2 and 3 directly together, but in other cases, you might be going through an intermediary VNet, such as a hub type of VNet in which case you could enable the gateway transit option. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to click OK. All I want to do is to have resources in each of the two VNets communicate as if they were directly on the same virtual network. And after a moment, we'll see the VNet connection from VNet2 to VNet3. Now, we're currently looking at the peerings for VNet2. Let's look at the same thing from VNet3's perspective. So I'm going to go ahead and click on VNet3. And in the same way, I'm going to make sure I view the peerings blade for it. Here we've got the connection named from VNet3 to VNet2. And notice that the peering status is connected. So we've now used the portal to successfully peer or link together VNets2 and 3. Now, this is good news if you've got resources in each of the VNets, such as virtual machines with only private IP addresses, because now they'll be able to communicate with each other in their different VNets using those private IP addresses. You can use the Azure CLI when you want to peer VNets together. Now, why would you want to do that? I might want to do it so I have a direct link between two VNets, so it's almost like I've got a single VNet. What that would mean is if I've got virtual machines on both VNets, after I set the VNet peering, they'll be able to talk to one another using their private IP addresses only. So to get started here, I'm in Cloud Shell within the portal. Specifically, I've got PowerShell selected here. You can use PowerShell or Bash to run Azure CLI commands. However, depending on what you're referring to in the operating system will determine 
whether you need to switch from PowerShell to Bash or vice versa. Let's take a look here. I'm going to paste in an example here where I'm attempting to create a variable called VNet2, but I'm not doing this in a way that would work in a Windows environment, which is what PowerShell is using. So I'm going to flip over to Bash, rather, and when I'm prompted, I'm going to click Confirm. Now, the Bash shell environment you might use if you're more familiar with Unix and Linux. Now, I'm going to paste in the exact same code, and this time it works. So let's look at the code and see what's happening. In essence, what I want to do is have a variable that stores the full ID of a VNet. I'm going to do that for the two VNets that I want to peer together. So the way I'm doing that is creating a variable, in this case, called VNet2, after which I've got an equal sign, and then a dollar sign and an open parentheses. The command I'm running here within parentheses is az network vnet show dash dash resource dash group. In this case, rg1 is the resource group where I've got a vnet. Then I'm using dash dash name, and the value of that is vnet2, and then dash dash query, and I'm looking for the ID property, so ID. Then dash dash out to set the output format to TSV, which is tab separated values. So let's take a look at what's in that variable. I'm going to use echo dollar sign and the name of the variable, of course, is VNet2. And we can see we essentially have the full path or the ID of the VNet, starting with the subscription, then with the resource group and the provider. Perfect. So we're going to do the same thing, except for the second VNet that we want to peer with VNet2. Two, the one we just set a variable for. It's for a VNet called VNet3. So really, we've got the same type of code, the only difference being it's a different variable name. This time it's called VNet3, and we're referring to a virtual network called VNet3. And in the same way, if I were to echo that variable, so echo dollar sign VNet3, we can see we've got the full ID of it. So now that we've got that, we can set up the peering connection. To do that, I'm going to run the AZ Network VNet Peering Create command. Now, there's more to it than that. I'm going to use dash dash name to give a meaningful name to this peered connection. Dash dash resource dash group. I'm going to specify RG1. Dash dash VNet dash name. And in this case, I'm going to refer to the source VNet in this perspective. It's VNet2. Not the variable, but it's actually called VNet2 in Azure. Then I'm going to specify dash dash remote dash vnet dash id. And the remote vnet from this perspective, I'll just scroll back up here, is going to be vnet3. So I'm going to refer to our dollar sign vnet3 variable. So I'm peering from vnet2 to vnet3, and I'm allowing vnet access with dash dash allow dash vnet dash access. So it looks like the provisioning state is such that it succeeded. Let's minimize this. Let's take a look at our virtual networks here in the portal. I'm going to go to VNet2, and I'm very interested in looking at the peerings blade for VNet2. I'm just going to click the refresh button. So we've got a peering connection that's been initiated to VNet3. Let's go to VNet3 and look at what's happening from its perspective. So I'm going to scroll down and click on the peerings blade for VNet3. Make sure I click refresh. Well, there's nothing here because it's a two-way street. You have to build the peering connection in both directions. We've only done essentially one half of the equation. Let's go back into the cloud shell and let's set the peering connection from VNet3 to VNet2. So let's set up the second half of that peering connection. That means I'm going to run AZ Network VNet peering create, much like I did previously, but the only difference is that the source virtual network here is going to be VNet3, and that the remote VNet ID I'm going to refer to here with the dollar sign VNet2 variable. So we'll just give it a moment for that to kick in. Okay, it looks good. The provisioning state is succeeded. Let's minimize the cloud shell. I'm just going to refresh the peerings for VNet3, and notice we now have a peered connection to VNet2, and the peering status doesn't say initiating or anything like that. Instead, it says connected. In this demonstration, I'm going to use PowerShell to set up VNet peering. I'm going to link two VNets directly together, VNet1 and VNet2. These VNets already exist. So I fired up Cloud Shell here in the portal. And the first thing I'm going to do is create a variable for VNet1. Naturally, I'm going to call it $VNet1 and for 
VNet2, I'm going to call the variable $VNet2. But how are we populating those variables? So let's take a look at that. So for VNet1, what I'm doing is populating it by using the get dash az virtual network commandlet, specifying dash name and the name of the VNet, in this case VNet1, and dash resource group name and the resource group that that VNet is deployed into, which in this case is RG1. I'm doing the same thing for VNet2, the only difference being that, of course, it's got a different name. It's called VNet2. Now, the next thing I want to do is add the peering connections. And to do that, I need to refer to the ID property of these variables. So what that means is, for instance, let's say I did this, dollar sign VNet1. That returns everything about VNet1. So what I can do is refer to dollar sign VNet1 dot ID, and that returns the full path to VNet1, starting with the subscription and the resource group and the Microsoft.network virtual networks provider type and so on. That's what we really need. Same goes for VNet2. We need its ID. So given that we can call upon it that easily with the variable, we're ready to go. We're ready to start setting up the peered connections. We're going to do this by using add-az virtual network peering. I have to give a name for the peering. So I'm just going to call it VNet1-VNet2. I have to tell it the source virtual network. So just, let me just scroll back up here. The source virtual network in this case is my VNet1 variable, dollar sign VNet1. And then I have to specify the remote virtual network ID that I want to peer with. So dash remote virtual network ID, I'm going to refer to dollar sign VNet2, but I'm going to call upon the ID property. So I'll separate dollar sign VNet2 and ID with a period. So now that I've done that, we will have one half of the connection. And if we just minimize Cloud Shell, let's say, and here in the portal, let's go to VNet1 and look at its peerings just for fun. So I can see I've got one peering here from VNet1 to VNet2, the target peer is VNet2, and the peering status currently says initiated because only half of it's done. We have to do the same thing in the reverse direction from VNet2's perspective. And actually, if we look at VNet2 and look at its peerings, there are none because we've not done it yet. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. So back here, in the cloud PowerShell environment, let's make that happen. We need to peer VNet2 now to VNet1. To do that, I'm gonna use the same command, let add-az virtual network peering, give a unique name to the peering connection. The virtual network here is VNet2, and the remote virtual network ID is VNet1 ID. So the dollar sign VNet1 variable dot ID property. So at this point, if I were to minimize this and go back into, let's say, the portal and refresh the peerings for VNet2, we could see it's connected with VNet1 and the peering status is now showing as connected. Now, if I flip back into Cloud Shell here, we can also view the peering status from here as well. So I can use get-az virtual network peering specify the resource group and the virtual network name I'm interested in looking at peering connections for. So in this case, it's VNet1. And I'm going to pipe that to select. And I want to select the peering state property. Now, all of that is within an open and a closing parentheses because I want that executed first. Then I'm going to call upon the dot peering state property outside of the parentheses. And I can see that we are now getting the peering state is showing as connected, which is consistent with what we would see back here if we went to VNet1 and looked at the peering connections, the peering state is showing as connected. So in this course, we've examined Azure networking components, creating VNets and subnets, and configuring VNet peering. We did this by exploring the Azure networking components that are available and how Azure supports DNS. We then looked at how to create a VNet using the portal, PowerShell, and the CLI. We looked at how to create a subnet using the portal, PowerShell, and the CLI. And we looked at VNet peering, including when it should be used, as well as how to use the portal, PowerShell, and the CLI to link VNets directly together through peering. In our next course, we'll move on to explore creating and managing Azure storage accounts, access keys, and shared access signatures, as well as configuring storage account security, as well as working with AD authentication for storage accounts and limiting network access to the storage account.
Azure storage accounts provide cloud storage in the Azure ecosystem. And there are plenty of considerations when you think about how your organization can benefit from the use of Azure storage accounts. The first consideration is compliance with laws and regulations about where data is stored, so where the storage account resides geographically in which region, and also where data is replicated to. So compliance and data residency are definitely going to be something that needs to be considered depending on the nature of the business. The other thing to consider is what we're using on-premises as a storage solution currently, whether we've got file servers or storage arrays that are perhaps shared by multiple servers on a storage area network. And we need to map that to how we might use Azure storage solutions to meet business needs in the Azure cloud. In some cases, we might even consider using a hybrid data solution. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means, for example, we still might have local access on premises to files. However, those files are also being synchronized into the Azure cloud for safekeeping. So we've got essentially the best of both worlds, so a hybrid data solution. When we talk about Azure storage, we are talking about things like Azure storage accounts. A storage account is an Azure resource that you can create and manage, and it allows you to store binary large objects or blob files. So standard files. You can also create a NoSQL table in a storage account. You can work with message queues. That would be of interest for developers for decoupling software components and using queues to store messages. You can also work with Azure files. An Azure file is really a shared folder in the Azure cloud that you can map a drive letter to or a mount point to, respectively from Windows or Linux. You can even enable file sync to synchronize files that are accessible on premises into the Azure cloud. Storage accounts by default use server-side encryption, but they use Microsoft managed keys. You can of course use your own encryption keys if required. Then we've got other types of storage solutions like databases and key vaults. On the database side, we can use solutions such as Azure SQL database in the cloud where encryption is possible with Transparent Data Encryption, or TDE. Key vaults essentially serve as a secure... Key vaults serve as a secure central storage location for secrets. Secrets meaning things like PKI certificates or usernames and passwords or encryption keys that you either import or generate. We also have a number of RBAC roles available. RBAC stands for Role-Based Access Control. A role is a collection of related permissions. For example, there is a storage account contributor role that could be assigned to Azure AD users or groups, so they have permissions to contribute content to the storage account. Or maybe just storage blob data contributor would be a more applicable role, depending on your needs. There are other roles like storage queue, data sender, SQL DB contributor. You can also work with storage account permissions in the sense of storage account access keys. Every storage account in Azure gets two keys by default. You can use either one for programmatic access or command line access to everything in the storage account. But you can also generate a shared access signature to limit what is accessible in the storage account programmatically, for example. And the shared access signature can also be time limited. It can expire on a particular date and time. Another design consideration is if you need replication of storage account content. We can do that with Azure Geo-Redundant Storage, otherwise called GRS. So pictured in our diagram on the left, we have the primary Azure region. That simply means that's where we first created an Azure storage account. And with that, we have local redundant storage or LRS replication that occurs first within that region. Next, through asynchronous replication, we have that content being synchronized to a secondary Azure region for safekeeping, where then LRS or locally redundant storage replication occurs in that region again. Asynchronous replication means that data is written to the primary storage location first, and after that completes, it then synchronizes to the secondary region. This means that if we have some kind of an outage in the primary Azure region, we can access the data in a secondary. Azure region where the data has been replicated. Then we have lifecycle management available. You can configure data retention policy rule action sets.
This is for storage account blob movement after modification, and that's measured in days. So for example, after a certain number of days, you can have blobs move to cool storage, or you can even archive the blobs. You can also configure the number of days since a blob was created, after which you might want any snapshots that were generated of it deleted to free up storage space. Storage account lifecycle management allows us to create our data retention policy rule filter sets. What this means is the scope. What does it apply to? So we can have our lifecycle management rules filtered by container. Now, a storage account container is essentially a folder used to organize blobs. Or we could filter by specific blobs, even using wildcards. So maybe we only want our lifecycle management to apply to VHD files stored in a storage account. You can manage Azure storage accounts using PowerShell commandlets, using the CLI through the REST API, which is used by PowerShell in the CLI, but the REST API is also a programmatic developer way to access storage accounts. Of course, we can use the Azure portal to manage storage accounts and the Azure Storage Explorer tool. In this demonstration, I'll use the Azure portal to create a storage account. To get started here in the portal, I'll click Create a Service, and I'm going to search for Storage Account. When you're creating an Azure Storage Account, you have to have planned a few things ahead of time, besides just the name. So let's choose Storage Account and Create. You have to think about the resource group you want to deploy it into and how you will actually end up using the Storage Account in terms of what's its purpose. So I'm going to deploy this into a resource group that I've already got created, although I could create a new resource group. I'll adhere to organizational naming standards for the name of the storage account. And I'm going to put this in a geographical region, in my case, nearest, and where users that access the content will be. In this case, that's going to be the Canada Central region. Now, down below, for performance of the storage account, the default is standard. The account kind is storage v2. And replication is set to read access geo redundant storage. Now, as opposed to geo redundant storage or GRS, read access geo redundant storage means that we, as the cloud customer, nor Microsoft, need to first initiate a failover if the primary region is unavailable, if we replicate this to a secondary one, before we have read access. So it would be automated with read access geo redundant storage. Of course, locally redundant storage, LRS, only replicates our data locally. So it doesn't do it across regions. So we have limited availability options in that sense if we leave it on LRS. The access tier is set to hot. A hot access tier storage account means that it has frequently accessed data. If the data is not accessed often, so less than once a month, for example, you could use a cool access tier, which means you don't have as much storage throughput when accessing the data but it doesn't normally matter because you're saving on costs because you're accessing that data infrequently. If I were to choose premium for performance, notice that we lose the cool and hot access tier option that we had when standard was selected. So depending on our selections above, we'll determine what some of the options below are. I'm going to click next for networking. I'm gonna let it create a public endpoint for all networks. By default, we can change these things later. And under advanced, I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to continue to tags. I'm not going to add tags. I'll click next for review and create. And once the validation has passed on the storage account, I will click create to deploy it. And we can make configuration changes after the fact. If we decide we no longer want replication to a secondary region, for instance, all of these things can be changed. Before too long, we'll see the deployment is complete. So I'm going to click go to resource to open up the properties for the newly created storage account. And so in the overview blade, we can see the resource group. We can see the region or location. We can see the replication here is currently set to locally redundant storage LRS. Now I did say that these things can be changed and they can. So for example, I could go down to configuration. And from here, I could make a variety of changes to the config such as the replication type. If I go to the access keys blade, you'll see that we have two keys, key one and key two by default. So you have two keys and two connection strings that can be used to gain access to the storage account. 
for example, through command line tools, even some GUI tools that require this for connectivity, such as connecting using the Azure Storage Explorer tool. And certainly for programmatic access, you can use these. You have two keys here because you can choose to refresh or regenerate a key, which you should do periodically for security reasons. Now, when you do that, anything that was using that key previously will no longer work. That's why you can have another key in use when you regenerate one of them. So we have a number of options available here. As I scroll down, I can also see I've got a blob service section, binary large objects. So from here, I could go to containers. A container, a blob container is really just a folder. We get out a folder here to organize files that we're going to upload into the storage account. We also can see here that we've got file service where we can set up Azure file shares, essentially SMB shared folders hosted here in the Azure cloud. We could build a NoSQL table. We could also create message queues here under queue service that developers might use and they would write their code to drop messages into these queues so that other components can read those queues and get those messages as required. Azure Storage Explorer is a free GUI tool you can download from Microsoft to connect to and manage the contents of Azure storage accounts. This is a great solution if you don't want technicians to have direct access through the Azure portal. Instead, they could just use this tool that they install on their on-premises Windows station. So here I've gone in my web browser and searched for Azure Storage Explorer and then gone to this download page. So I'm going to choose Windows as the platform, although notice that if we happen to be using Mac OS or a Linux variant, we can also get Storage Explorer for those platforms. I'm going to leave it on Windows since I want it running on my Windows 10 laptop on premises. So Windows, and then I'll click Download Now. Down below here in my browser, I'm going to choose to run it immediately. Then I'll choose to accept the license agreement, and I'll click on Install. I'll accept the default installation path, and I'll click Next. And if I already have a previous installation, it'll ask me if I want to install there anyway. I'm going to choose yes. And I'm just going to continue through accepting the defaults. We can now see it's installing the Storage Explorer tool. Before too long, the installation completes. It's set to launch the Azure Storage Explorer automatically. I'm going to leave that check mark there and I'm going to click finish. Now, once the app loads up, we can see here we're looking at the Explorer view where we can see local and attached options for storage. So storage accounts, we can also see Cosmos DB accounts and Data Lake Storage Generation 1. What I'm going to do is click the Manage Accounts button over on the left. It looks like the silhouette of a person where we can choose to add an account. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now, as opposed to adding a direct connection to our Azure account, we could click the plug icon on the left and we could choose to add a connection again through an Azure account, but through other means. So for example, using a connection string or a shared access signature or using the storage account name and key. However, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go back and I'm going to add an account. So I'll click the add an account link. It's going to be an Azure account as opposed to an Azure China, Azure Germany, or Azure US government type of account. So I'll go ahead and click next and I'll put in my credentials. And we'll then see that that account shows up on the left. So if I go back to the Explorer, what we're going to see now is any existing items within that subscription. So for example, if I drill down under storage accounts, I can see I've got a storage account in that subscription. If I expand it, I can see I have access to blob containers, file shares, queues, and tables. So we've successfully downloaded, installed the Azure Storage Explorer GUI tool and made a connection to our Azure account. After you've downloaded and installed the Azure Storage Explorer tool, you can then use it to connect to Azure storage accounts in a variety of different ways to manage storage account items. So to get started here in the Storage Explorer, I've already clicked the Manage Accounts button here and I've connected to my subscription. So if I go to the Explorer view, I can drill down under my subscription and here I can see I've got a storage account and I can then navigate into things like blob containers and so on. A blob container it's essentially a folder used to organize files in the storage account. I don't have any yet. So to create one, I can do that here by right-clicking on blob containers and choosing create blob container. I'm going to create one here called 
projects and I'll press enter. Now we have projects selected. We can see on the right that we have a number of options. We've got buttons across the top, such as to upload content, which I will do here. I'm going to click on that and choose upload files. And I'm going to click on the context button here to the right of selected files. It says no files selected. So I'm going to select a couple of on-premises files I want to upload. So you can see I've got a number of text files selected here I want to upload. I'm going to leave it on block blob. It says upload VHD, VHDX files as page blobs. So for larger files that will have random access to the file content, like with virtual hard disks, page blobs make sense. For standard other files like these text files, block blob makes sense. The destination directory, I'm going to leave as it is, and I'm going to choose upload. And under the activity section at the bottom, we can see the transfer has succeeded and we can now see up above that the files have been uploaded into the project's blob container. Now, there are so many other things that we can do here in the Azure Storage Explorer tool. You can see once we start selecting blob items, we have a number of options with buttons such as downloading, copying the URL to that blob, deleting it, and so on. But I can also right-click on my storage account over in the left-hand navigator and do a number of other things such as copying one of these storage account access keys. Maybe I need that for programmatic access, or I can even get a shared access signature. I can generate a shared access signature with a valid start date and time and an expiration date and time. And I can determine what kind of permissions should be available in this shared access signature and for which services. Now I might do this if I wanna have limited access to a storage account maybe for programmatic purposes. So that could be done as well. So there's a lot we can do then here in the Storage Explorer tool. In this demonstration, I'm going to create an Azure Storage account using PowerShell. Here I've already launched Cloud Shell through the Azure portal, but it really makes no difference whether you're doing this through Cloud Shell or on-premises where you've installed the AZ modules. The only difference would be if you're on-premises, you need to first make sure you run connect-az account to authenticate to your Azure account. Because I mean, Cloud Shell, I don't need to do that. It's already done because I'm authenticated to the portal. So to get started here, let's figure out what we can do. I'm going to run git-command. I don't know what the name of the commandlet is, so I'm going to assume it's got storage account in its name. So git-command, asterisk, storage account, Asterisk. I want to see any PowerShell commandlets containing the text string storage account. We can see there are quite a few of them. Well, that's good news. One of which is shown here as new dash az storage account. Okay, so I could run git dash help new dash az storage account. And I could ask for detail and I could pipe it to more and I could learn about the syntax and all of the parameters that are available here for creating a storage account using PowerShell. Now, as I go down through all of the parameters, I can see, let's just scroll up a little bit here. I can specify the dash SKU name parameter and specify whether I want geo-redundant storage or locally redundant storage. And I can see the values that go along with them. For example, if I want to use premium locally redundant storage, I could use dash SKU name with a value of premium underscore LRS. So I'm just gonna press Q for quit to get out of that. So now we have a sense of what we need to do here in PowerShell. So I'm gonna use new dash AZ storage account, and I'm gonna specify dash resource group name as a parameter. I wanna deploy this into RG1, that's an existing resource group, dash name. I'm gonna use a name for the storage account that makes it unique but yet adheres to organizational naming requirements. The next thing I need to do is specify the location. Here it's going to be Canada East. That's the region. Then the SKU name, dash SKU name. And in this case, let's say I want it to be standard underscore LRS. And that's it. I'm going to go ahead and press enter to create that storage account. And after a moment, we can see that the creation of the storage account has succeeded. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run get dash az storage account to retrieve storage accounts. 
When I do that, it's going to return the information I asked for. I can see I've got three storage accounts available. So I can see the storage account name. I can see the resource group name, the location, and I can see the kind, storage V2, the access tier. I can see the SKU name. In this case, they're all standard locally redundant storage, LRS. If I really want to, I can tell it I only want to see certain properties or fields. So I'm going to clear the screen. And what I'm going to do is use the up arrow key to bring back get-az storage account. But this time I'm going to pipe it to get-member. And I'm going to ask for type property, dash type property. I only want to see properties, not methods. And one of the reasons I would do this is because I want to know what the names of these properties are if I want to only see a few of them, such as storage account name. Okay. So up arrow key back to get dash AZ storage account, pipe to select, and I'm going to tell it all I want to see is the storage account name. And now all I'm seeing is that information. So it's pretty easy then to use PowerShell to create a storage account and to verify storage accounts in the subscription by using get dash AZ storage account. In this example, I'm going to be creating a storage account using the Azure CLI. I've launched Cloud Shell here within the Azure portal. If I'm running the Azure CLI on premises, then I'm going to have to make sure I first authenticate to my Azure account, which I can do in the CLI by issuing the AZ login command. I don't need to do that though, because as we've said, I'm in the Cloud Shell. Let's go ahead and get a bit of help here. So AZ-H, what's the next level command to work with storage accounts? Well, the subgrouping of the next set of commands is alphabetical and in the S's, indeed, I see storage. Okay, AZ storage dash H, what's next? Well, the next thing I really want to do is create a storage account. So let's just kind of scroll up. Oh, there's account. I see account in the A's. All right, let's start putting this together. AZ storage account dash H. And of course, we want to create one. There's create the next level command. Okay, I'm starting to see how this goes. So let's just go and get help on AZ storage account create dash H at the end. And finally, we're getting some details about what the syntax would be and what the various arguments are that are available here. Now, as we scroll back up through here, we can see a lot of the specific parameters like dash dash skew. And we can see the variations on the values, depending on whether we want read ahead, geo redundant storage, or locally redundant storage LRS. I'm going to go with standard underscore LRS. So, this is how you can determine what the values for some of these parameter names are, because otherwise, how on earth would you know? Okay, so let's go ahead and do it. AZ storage account create dash n for name. I'm going to give this a name that adheres to my company's naming standards and also a name that's unique. And always remember when you're dealing with storage account names and storage account containers within the storage account, that the names need to be lowercase letters, doesn't like uppercase letters. I'm going to use dash g and deploy this storage account into a resource group called rg1, dash l for the location, I want to deploy this in the Canada East location or region, dash dash skew. We were just looking at that in the help screens. I'm going to set that to a value of standard underscore LRS and I'll press enter. Okay, it looks good. We see the provisioning state is such that the command succeeded. That's good news. Let's clear the screen with CLS and let's check our work. We can do that in many ways, including AZ storage account list dash dash query space open close square brackets because we have an array or many storage accounts potentially here and what we want from each and every one of them is the dot name property well it's actually called just name but we separate the reference from the property with the dot and we can see all of the storage accounts now the one that we just created here is called store account yhz 1978 so indeed we do know that it was created successfully. And if we wanted to take that a step further, we could also show some details about that storage account by running az storage account show dash dash name. What is it called? Store account yhz 1978. 
dash dash or even dash g for resource group. I could put dash dash resource dash group dash name or just dash g. Dash g is quicker. So in resource group one, and let's press enter. Now we have a message that says it didn't find it. Well, that's because the name is incorrect. It's not called story account. It's store account. So that's a typo on my part. It's not a problem. Up arrow key is our friend in this case. Brings back the previous command or commands, depending on how many times you press the up arrow key. Let's just correct the name of the storage account. There we are, and I'll press enter. And now we can see it's giving us details about that storage account. So we know that it was successfully created, and now it exists as a result of us creating it through the CLI. Every Microsoft Azure storage account has two account access keys. Here in the portal, I've already navigated to an existing storage account. So I'm just going to scroll down under settings and click access keys. Here we're going to see we have two keys and connection strings. So key one and key two. Now the purpose of these is that we can provide these keys to command line utilities or could be a graphical utility or to developers so that they have access to this storage account. That's what the key gives is access to everything in the storage account. So what I want to do is copy the first key, key one. So I'm going to click the copy icon to copy it to the clipboard. I'm going to test connectivity by using the Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer GUI tool, which allows me to make a connection to a storage account in many different ways, including using these access keys. So here in the Storage Explorer, I already have an Azure account connection to the entire subscription, but that's okay. I can also add a connection to a specific storage account using its access key. And that could be useful, for instance, if the storage account is in a different subscription and I don't have access to the entire other subscription. So I'm gonna click the plug icon in the left-hand navigation bar of Storage Explorer to open the connection dialog box. Because what I wanna connect with this time is using the storage account name and key. So I'm gonna click that option and then I'll choose next. So I need to specify the account key, which I've pasted in here, and the storage account name in Azure and a display name, which I'll essentially use to be pretty much the same thing as the real name, except I'm gonna use some uppercase letters. And then I'm going to click next and then connect. Now, once that's done, we'll see that under storage accounts here in the Explorer on the left navigation bar, we've got our storage account and in parentheses, it says key. So we've got the storage account access key that allowed access to that storage account. And if we drill down under it, for example, and go to blob containers, sure enough, we can see blob containers and files. And essentially, we have access to the storage account now through that access key. It's not time limited access. It doesn't limit me to read only or anything like that. It's full access to the storage account. So if I were to right click, let's say on one of these uploaded files, one of these blob files, I can choose to delete it. And I'm not going to enable soft delete. I'm just going to delete the item. And after a moment, it disappears. And down below in the activities window, I can see the deletion succeeded. So I do indeed have more than just read access. I have full access to the account through the access key. We know that every Microsoft Azure storage account has two access keys that provide full access to the storage account. You would use that with command line utilities or pretty much any tool that you choose, such as even Microsoft Visual Studio or the Storage Explorer, you name it. And it gives access to what's in the storage account. However, we can refresh those keys or regenerate them periodically for security purposes. I'm going to click here in the portal on an existing storage account so we can take a look at its access keys under the settings section. Remember, there will be two access keys shown here, key one and key two. And we've got this little regenerate icon to the right of each of the two keys. Now, what we can do is we can regenerate one of the keys whereby the other key would remain intact for a period of time so things would still work. For example, here I'm going to regenerate key one. Now we have to be careful when we do this because when you regenerate a key, any use of the previous key will no longer function. And that's why you have two keys because you might, for example, regenerate key two and then you'd have time to change over any references to key one before you regenerate it. 
But in this case, I'm going to regenerate key one. So I'm going to go ahead and click the regenerate icon. It asks me, are you sure you want to do this? The current key will become immediately invalid and it's not recoverable. I'm going to choose yes. Let's make it happen. And we've now generated a new key. Now, what about if we've already used that old key one elsewhere? Well, it's no longer going to function. Let's take a look at that. I'm in the Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer tool, which I've downloaded and installed on my on-premises Windows 10 computer. Now, one of the connections that I have here, if I look at the Explorer, one of the connections I have is to a storage account via a key. So if I start expanding storage accounts under my subscription, I've got full access. But if I start up above going under storage accounts here, one of the references here has key in parentheses. That means as opposed to connecting to Azure with my entire account, I've got a connection to a storage account here using an access key. Now, this is key one for the storage account we were just looking at that I've just regenerated. So by all rights, this should no longer work. Well, let's see if that's true. I'm going to try to expand that. And let's say we drill down into, well, it's already working. We can already see it says that the server failed to authenticate the request and so on. This worked previously, but it no longer works because we've regenerated the key. And the overall purpose of doing that is to ensure security by not keeping the same keys for long periods of time. In this demonstration, I'm going to renew a key for an Azure storage account using the CLI. So the storage account in question here is going to be this one, store account YHZ 1978. I've already navigated to it here in the portal, and I've already popped up the access keys blade, where we can see both keys one and key two are here. So I can see key one, for example, starts with E, A, L, J, L, A, plus, and so on. Well, we're gonna change that in a moment using the CLI. So let's click on the Cloud Shell icon to switch over to Cloud Shell. In order to do this, I need to specify the account that I want to make the key change to, and of course, ultimately, the key itself. So I'm going to start here by running AZ storage account keys list dash dash account dash name. And here's the name of the storage account that we were just looking at dash dash resource dash group. And it's in a resource group called RG1. Let's look at the keys from here as well. Okay, so we can see just as we did in the portal a moment ago, key one and key two. So let's go ahead and update the first or the primary key. So to do that, I'm gonna run AZ storage account keys renew dash G, and I'm gonna specify the resource group that the storage account is in, which in this case is called RG1, after which I'll use dash N and specify the name of the storage account, and I'll use dash dash key, and I'm going to specify that I want to change the primary key, which is showing up here as key one. Let's go ahead and press enter to make that happen. And let's go ahead and use the up arrow key to the command where we were listing the storage account keys. And what I want to do is take note here of key one, which now starts with IOG. Well, previously, if we go up here, it started not with IOG, but rather E, A, L, J, and so on. So we've successfully refreshed or regenerated is another term you could use, the primary key for the storage account using the CLI. PowerShell can be used when you want to work with storage account keys, such as viewing them and also refreshing or regenerating them. So to get started here, I'm going to use the get dash az storage account key command lib. I'm going to specify dash resource group name, rg1 in this case, dash name, and then the name of the storage account, which in this case is store account yhz 1978. All of that is within open and close parentheses. So we want to make sure that we get the storage account keys. Remember, there are two of them for every Azure storage account. So we refer to the first one by referring to the dot value property, and that's an array. It's gonna contain two elements or items because there are two keys. The first one is referenced as item zero, not item one, whereas the second key would be value one. So let's just go ahead and press enter to see what we get. 
Okay, looks good. It returned what looks like a storage account access key. In fact, it is. Let's use the up arrow key to bring up the previous command. I'm just going to change the zero to a one so we can see the value of the second access key for that storage account. And it looks good. So it's returned the value. So what I want to do here is I want to generate a new storage account key. So in order to do that, I have to use the appropriate commandlet. In this case, it's new dash AZ storage account key. I have to use dash resource group name and tell it the resource group and dash name and tell it the name of the storage account I'm interested in. And then the key name I'm interested in generating a new one for. In this case, I'm going to specify key two, the second key. There are two. All right, so we've pressed enter and we've done that. So what I want to do is bring back the value of both of the keys in that storage account. So I'm going to use the up arrow key to bring back the command where we're referring to dot value zero. Remember, it's a key array. So when we do that, it looks like it's the same value from up above. It starts with IOG because we didn't change key one. We changed key two. So let's use the up arrow key again and bring up the second key. So that would be value one. And we can see here up above, when we looked at the second key here, it started with OJY, but now it starts with something different because we've just regenerated it or refreshed it using PowerShell. In Azure, within a storage account, a shared access signature provides limited access to the storage account. Here in the portal, I've already navigated to an existing storage account. Let's start by scrolling down and under settings, clicking access keys. Every storage account has two keys, key one and key two, and you can periodically regenerate them for security purposes. Either key can be used to gain full access to everything in the storage account. But what if you need to provide, let's say, a developer with limited access to the contents of a storage account only for a small period of time? Maybe enough time for them to do some development and testing. Well, an access key isn't going to work. Instead, you could generate a shared access signature. So down under settings here, I see shared access signature. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. The first thing I have to determine is what type of item in the storage account access is needed to. So in this case, it's only for blobs. So I'm going to uncheck file, queue, and table. I have to then determine the appropriate permissions. So let's just scroll down here. So I'm going to allow, let's say, read and list for the developers. So they don't need to write or create anything inside of the storage account. I only want them to be able to list and read blobs. We have a start and an ending date and time. So the expiration end date, I'm going to click here. Let's say we want to make it a week from now. I want to use HTTPS only. You can use either of the two keys that are always available in the storage account to generate the signature. I'm going to use key one, and I'll choose the generate SAS and connection string button. And it will generate three items down below, a connection string, a SAS token, and a blob service SAS URL. You might be scratching your head wondering which one should be used. The answer is it depends on what you are using to make a connection to the storage account, whether you're writing code or whether you're using command line tools or GUI tools. In this case, I'm going to use the Azure Storage Explorer GUI tool to connect using the shared access signature. So I'm going to copy the blob service SAS URL. So I'll click the copy icon to copy it to my Windows clipboard. And I've pasted it in here to the URI field. Now, if I just go back here, what I've done here in the Storage Explorer is clicked the connect button to add a new connection. I've specified use a shared access signature, SAS URI. And of course, this is where you just paste the URI in. It fills out everything else for you. So you can just click next and connect. And if you look in the left-hand navigator, you'll see you now have a connection to that storage account. And in parentheses, it says shared access signature. After you've created an Azure storage account, you can go back and configure various properties. Perhaps you've changed your mind about some of the options that were available when you initially created the storage account. So you can configure it after the fact. Here in the portal, I'm going to open up an existing storage account. Now, when I open up the storage account, one of the things I can reconfigure, among other things, is things like the replication of that storage account. So, for example, if I go to configuration, 
to pull up that blade, then we'll see that we have numerous options, including the replication options and other things like setting a cool or a hot access tier. So let's just scroll over a little bit to the right and let's see what we've got here. For instance, currently the replication is locally redundant storage. And of course, if we take a look here, the current access tier is hot, so we could change those options. Before we change anything, let's go to geo replication on the left. The geo replication lets you replicate the contents of a storage account to a secondary region. Now, here, all we see on the map is the primary location. We have a blue indicator that shows us where we currently have our storage account. So it looks like central to eastern Canada. Now, if we scroll over to the right and scroll down, we'll see more details. We can see it's in Canada East. Now, we don't have the option of putting it in a secondary region. Well, that's because if we go back to configuration, you might remember it's set to locally redundant storage or LRS. Well, if you want to replicate to another region, you're going to have to choose something else, such as read access geo redundant storage, RAGRS. Now, I want that option as opposed to just geo redundant storage, because with read access geo redundant storage, if there's a failure in the primary region, then the copy of the data that will have been replicated to the secondary region is automatically available. It doesn't require a failover initiated by you or by Microsoft. So I'm going to choose Read Access, Geo Redundant Storage, and I'm going to click Save. So we're reconfiguring that aspect of this storage account. And as a matter of fact, if we go to the Geo Replication Blade, we'll see that it should be in the midst of setting it up in the secondary region, which it would have selected. And it would have been something reasonably close, just a different region. In this case, our primary region is Canada East. And now we see our secondary region for the storage account is listed as Canada Central. One of the things you can configure for an Azure storage account is network access. You can determine from which networks the storage account is accessible. Let's take a look at that. So to start here in the portal, I'm going to navigate to an existing storage account. When I open it up, what I want to do is scroll down in the navigation bar until I see firewalls and virtual networks, which I'll click on. Now, the default behavior for a storage account is that it is accessible, as we can see here, from all networks. That includes the internet. What we can do is choose selected networks, and then we have a number of options from there. So the first thing that we can do is specify a virtual network and subnet. So you can either add existing virtual networks or add a new virtual network and ultimately a subnet. Here I've already added a VNet called VNet1 and a subnet called subnet1. So any resources deployed in subnet1 will be able to access this storage account. I could also add my client IP address for the station that I'm administering the settings from in the first place, or I can specify a CIDR IP address range. And down below, you can also determine if other Microsoft services should be able to access this storage account. Now, having done that, I'm going to go ahead and click on Save. So I'm saving the fact that I have to be connected to a resource in Subnet 1 within VNet 1 to be able to access this storage account. It's called Store Account YHZ45. Let's test access to that storage account externally using the Azure Storage Explorer tool. Here in Storage Explorer, I already have my subscription added, so I've authenticated to my Azure account here, so I have access to everything in the storage account. Here I can see the storage account we were just looking at in the portal, Store Account YHZ45, so I'm just going to go ahead and expand that and drill down into the blob containers. This is the kind of message we're looking for. It's unable to retrieve child resources because we've just blocked access, in this case, from the internet. I'm running this on my on-premises station. Only resources deployed in Subnet 1 and VNet 1 will be allowed network access to that storage account. You can configure custom DNS domain names to be used with an Azure storage account. Here in the portal, I'm already looking at the overview blade for an existing storage account. I'm just going to scroll down and under settings, I'm going to go to the properties. The reason I'm doing this is because from here, we're going to see the blob service endpoint, the primary blob service endpoint or the URL. So here it, it's in the form of HTTPS colon slash slash. We have the name of the storage account followed by the default 
DNS suffix here of .blob.core.windows.net. However, what if we want to refer to blobs in that storage account using a different URL? That's where custom DNS names come in. So what I'm going to do is scroll down further here and go under blob service, where I've already configured a custom domain. I'm going to click custom domain. I've called it www.lachance-it.com. And up above, I have instructions that state that I need to go into my DNS provider. In my case, GoDaddy is the provider of my DNS domain listed down below. I need to go into that config tool for that DNS provider for that domain and create a CNAME or an alias record so that I can have it point to my storage account DNS name. So basically, I'm going to redirect a name under my control, like www.lachance-it.com, to the default name used here with the storage account. So we can do that, or we can create a CNAME record down below with a verify component as well. But I'm going to go with option number one. Here in GoDaddy, I've signed into my account, and I'm looking at DNS management for my domain, lachance-it.com. And if I go down below, I've already created the CNAME record. So I've got the name of www. That's going to be within my domain, of course, lachance-it.com. And it's a CNAME or alias record that points to, and here I've put in the URL with the default storage account name that uses the default .blob.core.windows.net DNS suffix. Now here on my on-premises computer in the Windows command prompt, I'm going to run the NS lookup tool to test that DNS is functioning correctly. Meaning I'm just going to type in www.lachance-it.com and I'll press enter. And we can see here that it indeed is pointing to our Azure storage account. So now, depending on how the container access level might be set in the storage account, we have access to blobs and blob containers using a meaningful DNS name under our control instead of the default nomenclature used for Azure storage accounts. In cloud computing parlance, a content delivery network, or a CDN, has the singular goal of speeding up end-user content delivery. In other words, reducing network latency. When a user requests something, we want to get it to them as quickly as possible to give them a good experience. And this is possible due to public cloud providers like Microsoft Azure having a geographical point of presence or POP servers around the world that cache content that users will request, but you need to configure how that works. With an Azure content delivery network, we can see on the left, we would have a user that would request content via a URL. That would then connect to the nearest geographical content delivery network point of presence server. Now the point of presence caching server would have data caching configured. We can also configure the HTTP header TTL for any value sent in the request from the user in the HTTP header, there is a seven day default time to live for cached content. That means after seven days, any content that's been cached on the CDN server will be refreshed from the origin server. So depending on the nature of the data and how often it might change, will determine what you might set the default TTL to be for your CDN. There are a number of other features you can also configure with Azure Content Delivery Networks, one of which is geofiltering. You might want to determine in which parts of the world CDN is available. You can also enable compression for content to speed its delivery. You can configure caching rules to determine exactly what should be cached and for how long. You can also enable site acceleration which uses network and route optimization to deliver the content even more quickly to users that request it from a CDN host. And finally, you can also use custom HTTPS domain names instead of the default assigned DNS domain name for your content delivery network in Azure. A content delivery network, or a CDN, is used to copy or replicate content, such as from a storage account, geographically near users that will access it, so that when they request it, 
they get it quicker. It's reduced network latency. You can configure a custom CDN endpoint directly within an Azure storage account. That's what we're going to do here in the portal. So for starters, I'm going to open up an existing storage account. And what I'm interested in doing is scrolling down under the blob service section. Now under the blob service section, I'm going to click Azure CDN. We don't currently have a configuration. So over on the right, we're not going to see any CDN endpoints. However, I do want to add one. So I'm going to scroll down. I want to create a new CDN profile and I'm going to call it quick 24 X seven content. Make sure there's no spaces in it. Now for the pricing tier, I'm going to choose standard Microsoft. If I want the ability to have config options, such as the replication of dynamic content and so on, then I could specify different variations like standard Akamai, but I'm going to choose standard Microsoft and I'm going to set my CDN endpoint name to be quick 24 X seven content. Again, make sure there's no space in it. And what it's going to do is use the default DNS suffix of dot Azure edge dot net. I'm okay with that. And down below, of course, it's filled in the origin host name. That's the storage account I'm configuring this in, in the first place. So let's go ahead and let's click create to create the CDN endpoint within our storage account. So I'm going to click it listed here in the list. And when I do that, it takes me into the settings for that CDN for that content delivery network. So for example, if I were to go to geo filtering over on the left, I could specify geo filtering, such as allowing only specific country codes from accessing the content. I might do that. For instance, if I have content that is written with specific cultural significance or in a certain language, and I only want it available to certain regions. I can also go to custom domains and add a custom domain if I don't want to use the default Azure Edge type of DNS suffix, much like you might add a custom DNS name to a web application or an app service in Azure. I can also go to origin on the left. The origin in this context would be the storage account where the CDN content's coming from. And I might come in here, for example, if I want to put in a path that contains content that I want included to be cached in the CDN as opposed to all of the blobs. So we can make those kinds of changes there as well. So we can now see that we've got our custom CDN endpoint listed here with a status of running. What that means is we should be able to connect to resources within the storage account, within blob containers using that URL. So in this case, that URL is the custom CDN name I've added, quick 24 X seven content, and then it's going to use the dot Azure edge dot net default DNS suffix. So on the left, I'm going to go to my blob containers blade. I've got a container here called projects. I'm going to click to open it up where I can see I've got a file called project underscore a dot txt. I'm going to click to open that. Then we can see its properties, including the URL, which is using the original name of the object here in Azure. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that. We're going to test that access. Now, bear in mind, if I click change access level here for the container, I've set it to anonymous read access. So when I paste that URL into my browser, I can see here it's returning the contents of that sample text file, but let's change the URL to refer to the content delivery network or the CDN prefix. So we can see here in the address bar, I've got HTTPS colon slash slash quick 24 X seven content dot azure edge dot net. That is our custom CDN name after which I'm then specifying the projects container. And of course the file in this case, the blob is called project underscore a dot txt. And of course we can see it is showing us the contents of that file. So this way by enabling a CDN, we are making sure that we've got content nearest the user that makes the request for it. So in this course, we've examined creating and managing Azure storage accounts, access keys, shared access signatures, and various methods for configuring storage account security. We did this by exploring how to select the best storage configuration given a need. We looked at how to download and install the Azure Storage Explorer GUI tool. We looked at how to use the portal, Storage Explorer, PowerShell, and the CLI to manage storage accounts. We looked at how to manage storage account access keys and how to use them. 
how to refresh storage account access keys using the portal, CLI, and PowerShell. We looked at how to generate and use a shared access signature and configure a storage account. We looked at how to limit network access to a storage account and how to use Azure AD authentication with storage accounts. We looked at how content delivery networks or CDNs can reduce network latency. And finally, we looked at how to deploy a CDN in Azure. In our next course, we'll move on to explore how to upload and manage storage account blobs, configure blob lifecycle management, encrypt a storage account, and enable storage account failover. A blob is a binary large object. Essentially, it's a file that you can upload into an Azure storage account. And there are a variety of different blob types that we'll talk about in just a few moments. So let's get started here in the portal by opening up an existing storage account. Now within that storage account, I'm going to scroll down in the properties bar on the left until I get to the blob service. And then I'm going to click on containers. Containers are like folders to organize files on a hard disk. I've already got one container here called projects. I'm going to create another one by clicking the add container button. And I'm going to call it West. Now, when you build a container, the default public access level is private. So no anonymous access is allowed to any of the content within that container. However, we could choose blob anonymous read access for blobs only. So for individual files, or we could set container public access, anonymous read access for the container and its contents. Now you might do that, for instance, if you're using a container to host graphic images perhaps used by a web application, you might allow public access to them. In this case, I'll leave it as the default of private with no anonymous access and I'll click create. So now we've got a container or essentially a folder here in the storage account called West. I'm gonna go ahead and select it and notice that we can click change access level at any point in time if we change our mind about what we saw when we initially created the container. But I'm gonna leave it as it is, private, no anonymous access. Cancel out of that, and I'm going to click on the West container to open it up. Now, of course, it's empty. There's no content. We've not yet uploaded anything. So I'm going to click the Upload button to get some files in here. When I click Upload, it opens an Upload Blob Blade over on the right-hand side where I can click the icon to the right of the field for selecting a file or multiple files. So I've selected two files here from my on-premises system that I want to upload as blobs into this storage account container. I could choose to overwrite the files if they're already there. And if I drill down under the advanced section, I can determine, for example, if they should be block blobs. This is pretty standard. It's a standard type of file. These are text files, so they should be treated as block blobs. But the other options are page blobs. This is what you would use if you were storing things like virtual hard disk or VHD files that have a lot of random reads and writes to their contents, you would treat that as a page blob. And if you're dealing with log files that are continually written to at the end, you would select an append blob. So this is gonna be left as a block blob. And I'm not gonna change anything else about this. I could change things like the access tier. By default, it's set to hot, which is great for frequently accessed data. I can change that after the fact. So I'm gonna go ahead and click upload to get these blobs uploaded into the container. And we can see after a moment, indeed, that the two files or blobs have been uploaded here. Now I can select any one of them and choose from options above, such as deleting them or changing the tier. So for example, I might switch it from hot to archive or cool. And we can also acquire a lease on that file. Acquiring a lease is useful if you want to make sure that the file can't be modified or deleted. So when I acquire a lease, it will return in the pop-up window the lease status, so I can see the blob file name and the lease ID. And the lease ID here is a unique code that I would have to specify with any programmatic requests, for example, or command line requests to modify that blob. Otherwise, it's treated as read only. Now, once you're finished working with that blob, you can release it. In other words, you can break the lease. So I'm gonna select that file again, and I'm going to choose break lease and I'll click OK. If I click directly on a blob, then it will take me into a blade where I can get the overview, such as the URL, the overview properties of 
that blob so I could see the type, I could see the size of it, I can see the access tier, and I can also see any snapshots that might have been taken of the blob. Currently, I don't have any snapshots, but I could click the Create Snapshot button. Snapshots are great because they serve as a source for backup purposes. It represents a blob at a certain point in time. We could also click the Edit button, and depending on the file type, we'll be able to see the contents of the file. So here I can see it's a text file, and I've got some fictitious debit card numbers. We can also generate a shared access signature by clicking Generate SAS specific to this blob. So we can have time limited access to this individual blob as opposed to having a shared access signature, which might apply to all blobs or at a higher level, even having a storage account access key, which gives full access to the entire storage account. You can also download blobs once they're stored in the Azure cloud. So you can work with it, for example, in an on-premises environment. If we were to go back into the properties of a blob and create a snapshot, I'm just going to go to the snapshots link at the top. Any snapshots I might have created will be here, as we've mentioned. I've already created one. But to create a snapshot, all you have to do is click the Create Snapshot button, and it shows up in the list. And of course, it is date and time stamped. Now, if we scroll over to the right, we can see that these are block blobs. And if we select one of these, Snapshots, and then up at the top, we can choose to download that version of the file, that snapshot. We can also choose to promote it as being the main blob in this container. In other words, it says, are you sure you want to promote this blob? Because the existing one will be overwritten with the properties and content of this one. So perhaps, for example, you've made an overwrite change to a blob. You have a snapshot you'd like to revert to. So we can make that change here as well. So there's quite a bit then that we can do once we upload blobs into an Azure storage account. In this demonstration, I'm going to use PowerShell to upload files from my on-premises computer into an Azure storage account in the cloud. So here in the portal, I've already launched Cloud Shell. I'm gonna begin here in PowerShell by creating a variable that I'm going to call CTX, which stands for context. So dollar sign CTX, that's my variable reference, equals, after which I will use the get dash az storage account commandlet to retrieve information about a storage account. Now I'll have to specify that using the resource group. So dash r, the resource group is called rg1, and dash name. And the name in this example is store acctyhz45. So we're going to store that context for our storage blob uploads. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is refer to the CTX variable, so dollar sign CTX, and it will equal dollar sign CTX itself, but the dot context property. So that's what I'm really going to need for my PowerShell commandlets that follow to work correctly. Next thing I'm going to do is build a container. Now, a container essentially is a folder that we create in a storage account to organize files. So new dash AZ storage. This typo, there we go, new dash az storage container. And I'm going to specify dash name. Let's call this one headquarters. And that's in quotes, dash context. So it knows what storage account we're talking about. I'm simply going to use our dollar sign CTX variable. So that's going to create that storage account container. Now, the next thing I want to do is actually upload a blob item. In other words, a file. So I'm going to go ahead and do that by using. So because I'm running Cloud Shell, if I want to upload a file, I've got to get it here in the Cloud Shell storage account. So to do that, I'm going to use the Upload Download Files button, and I'll choose Upload. And I've specified a file called regional underscore spending underscore 2016.csv. If we actually do a DIR here, we'll be able to see that that file is actually stored here. So if I go into my home account and do a DIR, we'll see that the regional underscore spending underscore 2016.csv file is now stored here. Otherwise, we could just refer to it from wherever it was stored on premises. Either way, I want to upload that into a storage account. 
So to do that, I'm going to need to use the set dash a z storage blob content command line. I have to give it the file, so dash file. And it's called regional spending. I'm just going to use my tab completion here. I typed in R-E-G. And when you press tab, if that's unique, it'll expand the rest of it for you. Then I'm going to put in a space dash container. I want this stored in a container called headquarters. So headquarters, that's the one we created previously. And dash blob, I'll specify as a parameter. What do we want to call it? I want to call it the same thing. I want to call it regional spending underscore 2016.csv. And finally, I have to specify the context. So that would be our dollar sign CTX or context variable. So at this point in time, we should have uploaded that blob file. Let's take a look in the portal. I'm going to minimize Cloud Shell, and I'm going to go and take a look at that storage account, specifically at its containers. I already have it open here. I'm going to refresh. There's headquarters, and if we click on it, we should see that we've got our regional spending 2016 CSV file there. We can also verify this, of course, using PowerShell. So let's go ahead and do that. So here in PowerShell, once again, I'm going to run get dash az storage blob dash context. And we're going to refer to our dollar sign CTX variable once again. And I want to see what's in a container called headquarters. So dash container. And I'll specify the name of headquarters. And I'll press enter. And we'll see that we've got our regional spending file listed here. In this example, I'm going to use the Azure CLI to upload files into a storage account. So they're going to be stored as blobs or binary large objects. I've already launched Cloud Shell here in the portal, and I've made sure I've switched over to Bash only because I want to use some of the syntax that is specific to working with variables in a Bash Shell environment, as opposed to a more Windows-Z PowerShell environment. So to get started, I'm going to use the AZ storage account keys list command. And I'm going to specify dash dash account dash name and the name of my storage account where I want to upload blobs to. I'm going to use dash dash resource dash group, tell it it's in a resource group called RG1. And I've elected here to display it with a different output. I'm going to specify dash dash output table. The reason I want to do this is because I want to see the two storage account keys. Here they are here, key one and key two, because I'm going to use one of these keys along with my requests when I start doing things like creating storage account containers and uploading files into that storage account container. So I'm going to make a variable here called account. That's going to contain the name of the storage account, so I don't have to keep referring to it. So account equals, and in double quotes, I'm going to put in the name of my storage account. So store account YHZ45, and I'll close the double quotes. And if I just echo dollar sign account, then we'll see that that variable exists and it contains that string. Now I also want to store a key in a variable, and we retrieved the two storage account access keys up above one of our previous commands. I'm going to create a variable called key. So key equals, start a double quote, and I'm going to choose, let's say, key one. It doesn't matter if it's key one or key two. They'll both give access to the storage account. And I'm going to paste that and then close my double quote. So I now have a key variable, and I can just double check that by running echo dollar sign key. And there it is. So we have an account variable and we have a key variable. So the next thing I'm going to do is get to work. I'm going to create a storage account container. So I'm just going to clear the screen with clear because we're in bash here. And I'm going to run az storage container create. Just make sure I spell this correctly. We don't want typos dash dash name. So I want to create a container, let's say called east dash dash account dash name. And this is where I'm going to refer to my variable dollar sign account followed by dash dash account dash key. Make sure again, I don't have any typos here. And I'm going to use my variable dollar sign key. And I'm going to go ahead and press enter. So it says it was created, created true. 
Now, if I were to do a DIR here, I can see I've got a file called regional underscore spending underscore 2016.csv. That's here in the cloud shell in the storage account. I want to upload that into the container that I've just created called East. So to do that, I'm going to run az storage blob upload dash dash container dash name. We just created it and it's called East. So East dash dash name. So what is the file here? So I'm going to go ahead and specify that it's our regional spending file, regional underscore spending underscore 2016 dot csv then i'm going to specify dash dash account dash name and use our dollar sign account variable that's for our storage account and then dash dash account dash key and dollar sign key that's our storage access key so what we've done here is specified the name that we want this to be called as a blob stored in the account but we have to specify the file as well so dash dash file so the source in other words so in this case, it's going to be the exact same file because we're not changing the name when we upload it as a blob in Azure. So I'm going to go ahead and press enter to get that file uploaded. And it looks like it says it finished 100%. So for example, if we minimize Cloud Shell and if we go back and in the portal here, look at the containers within the storage account and refresh, there's East. If we take a look at East, we'll see indeed that our regional spending file has successfully been uploaded as a blob in that storage container. The Azure Storage Explorer tool is a free GUI tool that you can get from Microsoft. I've already downloaded and installed Storage Explorer on my on-premises system. Now in it, over on the left, I've gone to the Manage Accounts icon. It looks like the silhouette of a user where I've already added my Azure account. So therefore, if I go into the Explorer view, by clicking the Explorer button on the left, if I go down under my subscription and expand it, I'll see a number of storage accounts within my subscription. And I can drill down or expand any one of those to see things like blobs, files, queues, and tables. So file shares and blob containers. So I'm going to expand blob containers. And within that, I can see I've got a number of blob containers, and if I select any of them, I'll see the files or blobs stored within the containers. I'm going to go ahead here in the Azure Storage Explorer and start by building a new storage account container, a new blob container. I'm going to right click on blob container and I'm going to choose create blob container and I'm going to call this one central. So the central blob container now shows up. Over on the right, I want to upload some files into this blob container. So I want to upload them from my on-premises environment. So I'm going to click the upload button to do that. And I can choose to upload an entire folder or upload files. In this case, I'll choose upload folder. So here I've selected a projects folder that contains some sample text files on my on-premises machine. I want to upload them as block blobs. Page blobs would be more appropriate for large files with random reads and writes, like virtual hard disk files, where append blobs would be useful for things like log files, where they keep getting written to at the end of the file, hence append blob. So block blob makes sense here. I'll leave the destination directory as the current one, and I'm going to choose upload. So we could see down in the activities panel at the bottom, it transferred the contents of those items. So if I were to open up the projects folder here, we could see all of the files that were uploaded. Notice down in the activities panel here too, you can also copy the command, the AZ copy utility command to the clipboard that was used to make that happen. And if I paste that into a tool like WordPad, we can see the command. There's the actual root of the command here, azcopy.exe space copy. And this is the command that you might use, for example, if you wanted to automate this type of action using the AZ copy tool. Now, at this point, I can manage these blobs and blob containers. For example, on the left, if I right click on a blob container, I can choose to set the public access level. Of course, the default is no public access, but just like in the portal, we can set public read access for containers and blobs or read access for blobs only within the container. 
We can also right click on a file, for example, here, and we can change the access tier. So maybe from hot to cool, where we have less frequent access requirements for that file. And thus we can expect to have cost savings by using the cool access tier versus the hot access tier. And after a moment, you'll see under the access tier column that that change is now reflected. Of course, up at the top, when we look at the contents of a storage blob container, we can see that we have the options of downloading files or opening them. We can build a folder or a container within this container. We also have the option of deleting these blob files and so on. It's also important to note that you can drag and drop files from another window into a storage blob container to upload the content using the Storage Explorer tool. The focus of this demo is to talk about shared access signatures, but specifically for a single blob in a storage account. So here in the portal, let's start by opening up an existing storage account and what I want to do is first talk about a standard shared access signature. So if I scroll down in the navigation bar for the storage account, then we'll see under the settings section that we have shared access signature. And when we generate a shared access signature at this level, we can determine if it applies to blobs or Azure files, so file shares, or queues or tables. And we can determine the permissions and the start and ending date time and that type of item. Now, the next thing to think about is that we can also do that. We can set a shared access signature for an individual blob. That's interesting. So I'm going to scroll down in the navigation bar on the left here under blob service, and I'm going to choose containers. We're going to navigate to a specific storage blob that we want to generate the shared access signature for. So let's say I go into the East container where we've got a file called Regional Spending 2016 CSV. What I want to do is I want to make sure we generate the SAS shared access signature for this file. So I'm going to click on it, which opens up its properties blade over on the right. And one of the things I can do over there on the right is click generate SAS. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. So I have to determine the permissions that should be applied. The default set here is read, but we could choose create, write, delete. In this case, I'll just leave it on read if that's the only access required at this point for that blob. As we scroll down, we'll see that we've got the starting date and time and the expiry date as well. And the next thing about this is that we can choose the time zone for both the start and the end expiry date and time. I'm going to leave them as they are by default. So notice that the default here is that we've got 7.51 a.m. That's in the morning here. And on that same day at 3.51 p.m., so in the afternoon, so eight hours later, is when it expires. That's the default setting. We can specify IP addresses from which this shared access signature can be used. So I'm just going to leave that empty. I'm going to leave it on HTTPS, and the signing key will be key one within the storage account. So I'm going to click on Generate SAS Token and URL. And when I scroll down... We will see the blob SAS token and the blob SAS URL generated for this specific blob. So I'm going to go ahead and copy the blob SAS URL. And as an example, I'll put that into a new web browser window. Now, when I do that, it asks me if I want to open or save, essentially download that file. So this is telling us then that we have access to that individual blob, specifically read access for eight hours. When you create an Azure storage account, the soft delete option for blobs is not turned on automatically, but you can change it after the fact. So here in the portal, I'm going to open an existing storage account. And in the navigation bar, what I'm interested in doing is going down under the blob service section until I see data protection. Now, when I click data protection, this is where I'll have the option to enable blob soft delete. Notice it's disabled. So I'm going to go ahead and enable that setting. The default retention is seven days. So deleted blobs will be retained for seven days before they're permanently purged. and You can no longer recover them. I'm okay with that default setting. So I'm going to go ahead and click on save. 
The next thing I'm going to do here is go to some blob containers here within this storage account. Let's say East. And I'm going to go and click on East to open it up to see what's inside it. I've got a file here called Regional Spending 2016. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to delete that blob. I'm going to select it and I'm going to click Delete. And I'm going to choose to delete any blob snapshots that might also exist for it. And I'll choose OK. So it says no blobs found. So we've deleted that blob file. Now notice here on the right, when we're viewing the contents of a blob container, we've got a show deleted blobs option. It's currently off. I'm going to turn that on. I can now see the regional spending 2016 file that I deleted. Notice the status column, of course, shows deleted. And I can see the hot access tier, the blob type, and the modification date and timestamp. So what I want to do is I want to recover it. So I'm going to go ahead and select it by putting a check mark in the box. Notice when I select it, there's not an option to delete it because it's already deleted. Nor can I change the storage tier. However, I can acquire a lease. Now, if I click directly on that deleted storage blob, when I look at its properties, I'll see some interesting things, including the days until it's permanently deleted. I can see the deleted date and time. And of course, I have the button here to undelete that blob, which I'm going to click on. So now at this point, we're back to normal in the sense that it's as if we have had not deleted that blob. Let's go back into that storage container. And we can now see that our file is back without us turning on the show delete a blobs option. You can enable storage account replication in Azure so that you have an additional copy of synchronized data in an alternate region. So it increases the availability of that storage account data. To get started here in the portal, I'm going to open up an existing storage account and the first thing I'm going to do is scroll down in the navigation panel and under settings, I'm going to click geo replication. Now from here, I'm going to see that the current position or geographical location of my storage account is shown on the map. And if I scroll down a little bit, I can see that in my particular case, my primary location is Canada Central. However, there's not an option here to enable geo replication. Well, that's because I need to change the replication type as it tells me at the top here in the message under the configuration blade. No problem. So on the left, I'm going to click on configuration. Now, among other things, I'll be able to set the type of replication for the storage account. And this is something that's specified when the storage account is created. But naturally, we can change it after the fact. So I can see the replication here for this account is currently set to locally redundant storage LRS. Now, while that still gives me multiple synchronized copies locally within the region, it doesn't help me if I have a regional outage of some kind. So I'm going to go ahead and change that to read access geo-redundant storage, otherwise referred to as RA-GRS. Now, I'm selecting that instead of geo-redundant storage because with read access geo-redundant storage, if there is an outage in the primary region, then the storage account in the secondary region is automatically made available in read only mode. Whereas if I were to select geo redundant storage, either Microsoft or myself, we must initiate a failover to the secondary copy in the secondary region. Well, I don't want that. So I'm going to use read access geo redundant storage and I'm going to click save. Now, once that's taken effect, I'm going to go back to the geo replication blade and let's take a look at what's different here. On the map, we now see two points. Our secondary location here is listed as Canada East. So Azure has picked another region that's still within close proximity of the original region, although it is a separate region. So now we've got replication that will occur between those two locations from primary to secondary. Now, down at the bottom, notice the prepare for failover, the storage account failover option is unavailable because it says replication is still in progress. Data has not yet been synchronized. In the storage account, if I go to overview, then I can see on the right that the status is that the primary and secondary copies of the data are both listed as available. So what's happening is that when there's a change in the primary region in the storage account, that is committed locally 
and then it's replicated to the secondary region. So in other words, it's using asynchronous replication. Replication to the secondary region only occurs after the successful writing of the data in the primary region. PowerShell can be used to configure storage account replication for Microsoft Azure storage accounts. To get started here in the portal, I'm currently viewing the configuration of an existing storage account. Now, when I look at the configuration blade, one of the options on the right is replication. Currently, this storage account, store account YHZ 1978 is its name, its replication is currently set to locally redundant storage or LRS. LRS means that we've got three copies of replicated data in a physical location, but not across regions. So we're going to leave that as it is because we're going to make a change to that configuration using PowerShell. So I'm going to launch Cloud Shell here within the portal. Here in PowerShell, the first thing I'm going to do is run get-help because I'm going to be using the set-az storage account commandlet to modify settings for an existing storage account. I'm going to ask for detail and I'm going to pipe that to more. Now, one of the things I'm interested in taking a look at here is how we set the actual replication type. And to do that, I'm going to have to take a look at the SKU name parameter values. And I can see them down here. So here's the dash SKU name parameter. And we can set it for standard underscore ZRS for zone redundant storage, standard underscore GRS, let's say, for geo redundant storage, and so on. So this is how we determine what the syntax and the values of that parameter should exactly be. So I'm going to press Q for quit. Now to make this happen, I'm going to use the set-az storage account commandlet. So for that, I'm going to run set-az storage account dash resource group name. The storage account's in a resource group called RG1 dash account name. Here's the name of the storage account, store ACCT YHZ 1978 in my case. And finally, dash SKU name, I want to set it to standard underscore RAGRS for read access geo redundant storage. I'm going to go ahead and press enter to make that configuration change. And it looks like the change has taken place, but let's just verify this. Let's minimize Cloud Shell. Let's go back into the portal. Now I'm going to click on some other blade to pull up its settings before I go back to configuration for that storage account, because I want to see if it picked up our change in replication. So once it pops up, we'll see that it should have been changed. Now, if it doesn't kick in right away, you can close out of this screen and come back in. It may take a minute or two, but eventually you'll see that it will have changed the replication in our particular case, read access geo redundant storage. And if I go look at the geo replication tab, of course, we've got geo replication enabled. So we've got two points on the map that are being replicated. So now if I use get-az storage account, I can specify the resource group and the storage account name. I can pipe it to select and I can do some interesting things like ask for the secondary location property now that it's being geo-replicated. And here it's returning Canada Central. If we minimize the cloud shell and if we take a look at the geo-replication blade for the storage account, we'll see indeed that the secondary location is set to Canada Central. In this demonstration, I'm going to use the Azure CLI to enable storage account replication. Now, you would do this if you want to increase the availability of the contents of the storage account by having it replicated asynchronously to a secondary region. So to get started here in the portal, I've popped up the configuration blade for an existing storage account called Store Account YHZ. 4488. And in the configuration blade, one of the settings you'll see on the right is replication. And this is set when the storage account is created. In this particular storage account's case, when it was created, the replication was set to locally redundant storage LRS, which means that there are three copies of data locally that are replicated, but it's not replicated across geographical regions. So we're going to change that using the CLI. So here in the portal, I'm going to launch Cloud Shell by clicking the Cloud Shell button up at the top. Now, the first thing I'll do here in Cloud Shell is run az storage account 
dash H because I'm not sure what the syntax will be beyond AZ storage account. One of the things I'll see I can do is update the storage account, update the properties of it, such as changing the replication. So let's take that a step further. I'm going to run AZ storage account update this time dash H and we'll learn more about it from here. So what do we need to pass as parameters and values if we want to start making an update to the account? And as we go through that, we'll eventually come across the dash dash SKU parameter, where we can tell it that we want to use, for example, standard underscore GRS, or standard underscore GZRS, or LRS. LRS, of course, is locally redundant storage, and GRS is geo-redundant storage. I want to set this to standard underscore read access geo-redundant storage. So when I use the dash dash skew parameter here in the CLI, I'm going to have to give it a value of standard underscore RAGRS. Okay, because otherwise, how would I know what to type in? So let's clear the screen and let's make this happen. So I'm going to run AZ storage account update dash dash skew. In this case, it's going to be standard underscore RA, in my case, that's my selection, RAGRS, read ahead, geo-redundant storage. Remember that read ahead, geo-redundant storage means that if there is a failure, if there's some kind of a disruption and the storage account is not reachable in the primary region, then failover occurs automatically for the copy in the secondary region, but it's read-only access. Whereas if we didn't use read access geo-redundant storage, just geo-redundant storage, then we as the customer would have to initiate a failover to make that secondary copy of the storage account available. Or Microsoft could initiate the failover. So that's why I'm using this one. Now having done that, we're still not quite finished. We haven't even named the storage account. So dash dash name, it's called store count Y H Z 4488 and dash dash resource dash group is RG1. Okay, the syntax looks correct. Let's go ahead and press enter to reconfigure the replication strategy for that storage account. Looks like it did it. So let's just go ahead and minimize the cloud shell. And I'm going to click on some other storage account and then come back to the one we were just configuring, store account YHC 4488. So we can just check the work here. Let's check the configuration blade within that storage account. Now, if it's not up to date right away, it's not because we did anything wrong. The command worked. And, and look here, it still says replication, locally redundant storage. It's just not up to date in the GUI yet. So I'm just going to wait a moment and click on something else and come back here to it. In the meantime, if I click on geo replication, it looks like we've got geo replication happening now. And that's only possible if you're using something like geo-redundant storage or read access geo-redundant storage. We can see the primary and secondary locations. Let's just go back to configuration. Of course, we can now see it's showing the replication type here set to read access geo-redundant storage. Over time, you can end up with a lot of blobs stored in a storage account. And so it makes sense to enable lifecycle management to automatically migrate some of those blobs to a different type of storage, maybe to a cool access tier to save on costs if they're not accessed often or even to archive them. So let's take a look at how that's done. Here in the portal, I'm looking at the overview blade of an existing storage account. What I want to do is scroll down in the navigation bar and under the blob service section, I'm going to click lifecycle management. Now, to work with lifecycle management, you need to create a rule. So I'm going to click the Add Rule button up at the top. And I need to name this rule. I'm just going to call this Rule 1. And I have to determine if I want to move blobs to cool storage as part of this rule action, or move blobs to archive storage, or even delete blobs after so many days since the last modification, or if I'm using blob snapshots, whether or not I want to delete those snapshots. Now, if I were to say, let's say, move blob to cool storage, I have to specify the days after last modification of that blob item when I want this to occur. Let's say I'm going to determine that after 30 days since a file was modified, I want it moved to cool storage to save on costs. But we're not finished. I have to click the next 
filter set button in the bottom right because I have to determine the scope to which this should apply. Do I want this lifecycle management rule to apply to everything in the storage account? Or do I want to specify a subset of items such as a folder or a container within the blob storage account? So for example, if I have a folder called projects, I can specify the projects folder here. So I only want this rule to look for blobs in the projects folder that haven't been modified in a certain number of days, such as 30 days. So I'm going to click next review and add. It's running the validation and it's passed. So I'm going to click add to create this lifecycle management rule. We can now see our rule, rule one is enabled. Now, for some reason you want to suspend that activity from that rule, you can select the rule and disable it. You can also click on the rule to open it up and edit its settings. So if you decide down the road, well, I also want to delete blobs, perhaps after a longer period of time, maybe after 120 days since the last modification, since it's deemed as not being useful here in the storage account. Maybe you've configured backup to an alternate location. So I'm going to go ahead and click review and save. The validation is passed. I'll save it. And there you have it. We now have a way to work with storage blobs in an automated fashion by moving them to cool or archive storage or ultimately deleting them in their snapshots when they're no longer needed. One of the great things about the cloud is that things are centralized. And so what we can do when it comes to the storage of secrets like certificates or encryption keys or database connection strings, that type of thing, we can centrally store that in an Azure key vault. And then of course, you could have your software, whether you're writing custom code or using commercial off the shelf software, you can have it refer to that key vault to retrieve those secrets as needed. So to get started here in the portal, I'm going to build a key vault by clicking create a resource. And I'm going to specify that I want to create a key vault. So I'm going to search for key vault and I'm going to select that. And then I'm going to click create. So I'm going to deploy this key vault into an existing resource group. I could create a new resource group if I wanted to. I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to call this KV1, key vault one. Now, if that name is not unique, I'm going to get a message that says it's already in use. So I'm going to go ahead and put in enough characters to make that a unique name while still adhering to organizational naming standards. I'm going to specify a region. So in this case, I want this, let's say, to be in the Canada Central region. If you were to select the premium pricing tier, you would include support for HSM backed keys. That means that any keys that you store in the vault would actually be protected by a hardware security module or HSM device. However, I don't need that. I'm going to leave it on standard. I'm going to leave soft delete enabled and a retention period of 90 days. And I'm going to click next for the access policy. So which entities should have access to the key vault? Maybe Azure Virtual Machines for deployment or Azure Resource Manager for template deployment. If We need to access secrets in here when using an ARM template or as your disk encryption for volume encryption. Let's say I know that I'm going to be creating a key in this key vault that I'm going to use to encrypt virtual machine disks. Well, then I can turn on this option to make sure that VMs are allowed to access the keys in this vault for that purpose. So I'm going to turn that on and I'm going to click next for networking. I'm going to leave it on public endpoint for all networks so that this is available for connections from anywhere. I'm not going to add any tags, so I'm going to keep clicking the next button until it runs the validation and it passes, at which point I'm going to click create to create the key vault. After a moment, the key vault will be deployed, so I'll click the go to resource button. Now in the key vault, we'll see on the left if we go down in the navigation bar that we can work with keys. So if I were to click on keys, I could either generate or import keys to be stored in this vault. So we can generate keys and specify details, such as whether it's an RSA or an EC key, the number of bits in the key. We can even set an activation date and an expiration date for when the key can be used, whether it's valid or not. And then we can also import or restore from backup. So we can import keys. That's the key side of things. But we also have the option of working with 
secrets. Secrets you can think of as basically connection strings or passwords that we might need to specify to access something like a backend database. So we could enter a name and a value such as a passphrase. And again, we could set the activation date and the expiration date. Now, currently, the upload option is manual. We could also upload this information from a certificate. So if I just get out of here for a moment using the breadcrumb trail in the upper left, we can also go to certificates to either generate PKI security certificates here in the key vault, or we can import them if we already have them. We would just be storing them centrally in the key vault. So we could choose to generate or import PKI certificates. So this is the purpose of working with a key vault. So for example, let me go ahead and create a key. So I'm going to go back into my key vault and I'm going to go to the keys blade. And if I wanted to create a key, maybe this key would be used, let's say, for encryption of virtual machine disks. I could click the generate import button. I don't already have a key for this purpose, so I want to generate it. I'm going to call this VM disk key one. It's going to be an RSA key. I'll leave it at 2048 bits for the key size. I'm not going to set an activation or expiration date, so it's always going to be valid. And you can see that it's enabled by default, which is good. I want it to be usable. I'm going to go ahead and click Create. And after a moment, we can see in our key vault, we now have a key called VM Disk Key 1, and its status is listed as Enabled. You can use the Azure CLI to create and manage Azure Key Vaults. I've launched the Cloud Shell here within the portal. So to begin creating a key vault, I'm going to use the AZ Key Vault Create Syntax. Then I'll use dash dash name and in quotes, I'm going to call this KV and I'm going to put in a unique name for this key vault. After which I'll specify dash dash resource dash group. I want this deployed in an existing resource group that I have called RG1. And then I'm going to specify dash dash location. Here I want it to be in the Canada East location. So I'll put Canada East in quotes, the space between Canada and East, and I'll press enter. So that's going to deploy that key vault. But what I'm going to want to do is create something in it, such as a key or certificate or some kind of a secret. In our case, maybe what we'll do is we'll create a key that we might use for encryption purposes. Okay, looks like the provisioning of the key vault has succeeded. So now let's build a key in it. To do that, I'm going to run az key vault key create. And I'm going to use dash dash vault dash name. And I'm going to specify the name of the vault that we just created. And I'm going to use dash dash name to give a name to the key. Here, I'm going to call it key one. So I'll put that in quotes. And I'm going to use dash dash protection. And I'm going to specify a value of software. So either I have HSM hardware security module type of hardware level protection for keys, or in this case, just software based, which is what I'm going with. So I'm going to go ahead and press enter to build that key, key one, within that key vault. Looks like it's good. Let's clear the screen. And why don't we run az key vault key list dash dash vault dash name. And here again, I'll put in the name of our vault. Let's see if it shows us the key that we just created. And it looks like it's returning our key key one. Now our key vault that we've just created is called KV345678. Let's just check that in the portal. So I'm going to minimize Cloud Shell here. I'm going to go to all resources. And maybe what I'll do is just filter this out by clicking type and unchecking everything and then just choosing key vault, click outside of it. And there's our key vault, KV345678. If I click on it and open it up, we can also check to see if our key's there. So I'm going to click on keys, and indeed, we should see that key one is there and it's enabled. In this demonstration, I'm going to use PowerShell to create a key vault, and I'm also going to create a key within that key vault. So to get started here, I've launched Cloud Shell within the portal, and I'm in PowerShell mode. So what I'm going to do is start by building the vault with the new dash az key vault commandlet 
dash resource group name. I'm going to deploy this into a resource group called RG1 that I've created previously. Dash name, I'm going to call this key vault KV East 1. So I'm going to put that in quotes. Dash location, I'm going to specify in quotations Canada East, all one word together. And I'm going to press enter. So I'm going to create a key vault called KV East 1 in the Canada East region. Now, when I do that, I get a warning listed down below that states that an access policy is not set. Every key vault has an access policy that determines which security principles have which specific permissions to manage items in the vault. So let's go ahead and deal with that now. I'm going to minimize Cloud Shell, and I'm going to go to the All Resources view here in the portal. We're going to filter the list of resources so all we're seeing are key vaults. So I'm going to click on Type up at the top. I'm going to remove the check mark for Select All, and I'm going to click on Key Vault. And I'll just click outside of it, and there's KV East 1, Key Vault East 1. I'm going to click to open it up, because within it, we can then configure the access policy. So I'm going to scroll down, and I'm going to choose Access Policies in the navigation bar. I want to create a policy here that will allow the creation of a key. Actually, let's see what would happen if we don't add the policy first. Let's go back to the Cloud Shell. Let's have a little bit of fun here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is essentially I want to create a key within that key vault now. Now to do that, I have to determine when the key can be used and then when it expires. So I'm going to set up some variables here in PowerShell to make that happen. I'm going to start by creating a variable called dollar sign expires. It's going to store the result of running get date, which is in parentheses, get dash date. And then outside of the parentheses, I'll call upon the dot add years method. And in parentheses, I'll add one year. And then I'll go further and add the dot to universal time, open and close parentheses method. So basically, it's going to expire a year from now. So if I were to type in expires, it's one year from the current date and time. Now, I also have to determine when I'm building a key, when it can begin to be used. When is it valid? To do that, I'm going to create a variable here called dollar sign not before, which will store the result of running in parentheses, get dash date, and I'll call upon the dot to universal time. So that'll basically be now. Now I want to add that specific key to the vault. So I'm going to run add dash a z key vault key. I'm adding a key to an existing key vault. The vault name I'm going to specify here is going to be in quotes. Let's see, KV East 1. That's what we had called it. And I'm going to name the key. Let's call it key 1. So dash name and the value is key1. And then dash destination, I'm going to specify here as software, as opposed to having it as an HSM stored key, hardware security module. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that as software. Dash expires, I'm going to specify our dollar sign expires variable. I'll just make sure I spell that correctly. And then I'll specify the dash not before parameter. So when can the key be used? And I'll specify as a value for that parameter, the dollar sign not before variable. Now, the only thing is when I press enter on that, I get an operation returned, an invalid status code of forbidden. The reason is because the access policy doesn't allow this to happen. So let's go back to what we were looking at in the access policy. I'm going to click add access policy in that key vault. Now, what I could do is build it from scratch, or I can choose from a template. So in this case, I'm going to choose key management. And that's just got a bunch of the permissions pre-selected here for creating, listing, updating, importing, deleting, backing up and recovering keys, all of that good stuff. Uh, I'm not interested in secret or certificate permissions, only keys. And then I have to select a, a security principal. So from Azure AD. So I'm going to go ahead and select my own account there. That's who I'm signed in as here. And I'm going to go ahead and select that, and I'll click Add. So I've added an access policy where I have key management capabilities. I'll click Save to write that access policy to the key vault. And then let's go back and try to run that last PowerShell statement again when we were trying to add a key to the vault. I'm going to press Enter. And this time it just loves it. It took it because the access policy allows that to occur. Let's go back into the portal. 
And just for fun, let's go to keys to see if the key has been created here. We might have to click refresh them. There it is anyways. Key one has successfully been created. Even though Azure storage accounts are encrypted by default, they are encrypted with a key that's managed by Microsoft. And in some cases, maybe due to regulatory compliance, keys used for encrypting data at rest might need to be under your control. And so that's what we're going to take a look at how to do here. In the portal, I've already navigated to the keys within an existing key vault. I have a key called key one. This is a key I've created. It's under my control. And I'm going to use it to encrypt the contents of a storage account. So let me go back to home by clicking the home link in the upper left. And I'm going to go view storage accounts. So I can open up the navigator on the left. And I can go down and select storage accounts. I want to go into an existing storage account and number one, check out that it's currently using standard default Microsoft managed encryption and I'm going to change it. So let me go into a storage account in question and I'm going to scroll down under the settings section and I'm going to select encryption. We can see on the right that the encryption type here, as is the default, is now set to Microsoft managed keys. Now what I want to do is change that. I want the keys under my control. So I'm going to choose customer managed keys. Down below, I can either enter the key URI or select from a key vault. Well, I'm going to choose select from a key vault and I'm going to click the link that says select a key vault and key. That opens up a new window where I can do just that. So I'm going to select my key vault here, KV East 1. And from the key drop down list, I'm going to choose the key that we were looking at previously. It's called key one and I'll choose select. Then I'm going to click save to put that into effect. Now there's a message at the top here that says that encryption and decryption is automatic. And it says the data is encrypted using Microsoft managed keys. Well, we're using our own. Now it says if you start enabling encryption in a different manner, like using your own keys, only new data will be encrypted using that and any existing files will be retroactively encrypted by a background encryption process. So what that's telling us is that depending on how much data we have in the storage account will determine if it takes just a few minutes or a few hours for that encryption to take place. If you've enabled geo-replication for an Azure storage account, that means that you are synchronizing the contents of the storage account to a secondary region. And when you do that, depending on what you've selected as the replication type will determine whether you need to initiate a failover if the primary region is unavailable. Let's explore that further. So to get started, I'm going to open up an existing storage account. And we're going to start by taking a look at its configuration from the replication standpoint. So I'm going to scroll down in the navigation bar and I'm going to click under the settings section. I'm going to click on configuration. We can see on the right that the replication is currently set as geo-redundant storage, GRS. This means that we do have a secondary region, but that we must initiate failover if the primary region becomes unavailable. Now that can be automated if we were to select read access geo-redundant storage. However, it only allows read access, but the failover is taken care of automatically. So if I go to the geo-replication blade here, we'll get a sense of what the primary and secondary regions are. We can see them plotted on the map, but if I scroll down below, we can see the primary region is Canada Central and secondary region is Canada East. Notice that we have the option to prepare for failover down at the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that button. So it tells me up at the top here that it's basically going to swap the DNS endpoints. It says the secondary endpoint will become the primary. And then after that, Locally redundant storage will be the configuration. You can change that if you want to. And it can take time if you configure it for geo-replication after the failover. It can take time, once again, to get everything in sync. So I'm going to go ahead and type yes to confirm that I want the failover. And I'm going to click the failover button. In the notification area in the upper right, we can see the failover is currently in progress. So currently, Canada Central is the primary, but that's going to change after failover occurs. And remember, you would do this because there is some kind of a disruption or you're unable to connect to the primary region. Now I'm going to click refresh here 
until such time that I see that things have changed. For example, now I see that Canada East is the primary. We no longer have geo-replication because we failed over to the secondary copy, which was in Canada East. Now, if I scroll up, I can see the replication is currently set to locally redundant storage. I would see that also if I clicked on configuration to pop up the configuration blade. And this is where if we wanted to, we could now convert it back to geo-redundant type of replication and have it stored in a secondary region. But at this point, at least we've got people that are able to be redirected to the secondary copy of the data since the primary region was unavailable. There are times where you might want to configure a blob storage account container with an immutable blob storage policy, where immutable means the data can't be modified or deleted. You might have to do this even for legal reasons. It might be indefinite for an indefinite period of time, or you might know for exactly how long you want to keep that data essentially in a read-only state. So to get started here in the portal, I'm going to open up an existing storage account where I've already got a container and a few blobs uploaded into it. So I'm just going to scroll down and I'm going to go to containers. I've got a container here called projects. So I'll click to open that up. And I've got a sample file here called project underscore a dot txt. Well, immutable policies are set at the container level. So we're already in the projects container. So in the left-hand navigator, I'm going to click on access policy. Now, within Access Policy over on the right, I'm interested in Immutable Blob Storage. Currently, there are no policies under that category, so I'll click the Add Policy link to add one. Now, I can add a legal hold policy, and I can specify at least one tag for organizing and viewing related items. But legal hold is interesting in that it will set things as read-only. They can't be modified or deleted, but I can turn it off at any point in time. But if I know that I have a specific time frame where I want this done, instead of a legal hold policy, I could configure a time-based retention policy, which I'll do here. And I'm going to set the retention period, let's say, for 30 days. We can also make an allowance here for append type of blobs. You can have page blobs, such as for virtual hard disk files stored here. You can have block blobs for pretty much any other type of file, like spreadsheets. And you can also have append blobs, which are normally used for logs, where they keep getting written to at the end, or they keep getting appended to. So we could allow that to continue happening for existing blobs, such as for logging purposes, by turning on that check mark. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So we've now got a time-based retention policy here, but notice the state is such that it is unlocked. Well, for legal reasons, you might have to make sure that that can't be changed. And so we have the option of locking the policy. Now, when you lock the policy, it means that the 30 days is basically engraved in stone and you have to wait for that to expire. So I'm going to go ahead and lock the policy. And I'm going to type in yes for confirmation and I'll click OK. We can now see the state of the policy is such that it is locked. So if I go back to overview, and let's say we attempt to make a change to that existing blob file, such as trying to delete it. I'm going to select it, click Delete, and I'll click OK. Well, if I open up the notification area in the upper right, it says it failed to delete the blob because we've got an immutable blob policy that is currently in effect. So in the same way, if I were to try to make a change to that blob, so that was trying to delete it, let me just click to open it up and maybe we'll just try to add a tag value or something to it, something simple. So let's go ahead and just add a tag here, project test. So we've just added some tagging information. So I'll just kind of click save up at the top. And again, it says the update failed. And if we look at our notification here in the upper right, it's pretty much the same reason. It's not permitted as the blob is immutable due to a policy. When you create a container in a storage account to organize blobs, the default access level is set to private. Let's take a look at that. Here in the portal, I've already navigated to a storage account and a container I've created called East and we've got a couple of sample files that I've uploaded. So we've got a couple of blobs in the container. 
Now, when you're viewing the contents of the container, you can click the change access level button up at the top. And we can see here that the public access level is set to private, no anonymous access. So what that means, for instance, is if I were to click on one of these blob files, they're just TXT or text files to pull up some details, we can see if we were to click edit that it's just sample text. However, if we go back to overview and if we copy the URL to that blob, to the clipboard, and if we pop that into a new web browser window, we get this message returned that says resource not found, the resource doesn't exist, and that's because anonymous access isn't allowed. Let's go back into the portal, and what I'm going to do is change the access level for the container. So I can set it to either blob, so anonymous read access for individual blobs, such as the URL I just copied, or for the container, anonymous read access for the container and its contents, the blobs within it. I'm going to choose blob. So that would be anonymous read access for blobs only, and I'll click OK. Now, after a moment, we can see it's been put in place here by looking up in our notification area. It successfully changed the access level for the container. Let's go back to our web browser window where we had pasted the blob URL reference, and I'm going to click Refresh. And because we've changed the access level, we'll now be able to read the contents of that file. And the same thing is also true if we refer to any file, I've switched over the file in the URL here, that is within, in this case, the East Blob container. So, in this course, we've examined storage account blob management, as well as enabling security and high availability through the use of storage account encryption and failover. We did this by exploring how to use the portal, PowerShell, and the CLI to upload blobs, how to manage blobs using Azure Storage Explorer, how to generate a blob shared access signature and manage the blob soft delete feature. We looked at how to configure storage account replication using the portal, PowerShell, and the CLI. We looked at how to control the migration of storage account data over time through lifecycle policies, how to create a key vault using the portal, PowerShell, and the CLI. How to encrypt a storage account using custom encryption keys. We looked at how to enable failover for a storage account. We looked at how to configure immutable blob policies to prevent blob modification and deletion. And finally, we looked at how to configure storage account container access levels. In our next course, We'll move on to explore the use and management of Azure file shares, including how to connect to an Azure file share from both a Windows and a Linux host. Azure Files provides shared folders in the Azure Cloud that client devices can connect to. So really, it's a fully managed service, which means that you don't have to set up file servers to make this happen. And because it's in Azure, it's highly available. So what we're seeing here is that we can configure Azure file shares, shared folders in the cloud, within an Azure storage account. So you need a storage account first. And it provides shared folder access from either on-premises hosts or from in the cloud. Now, if you're going to be trying to access Azure file shares, let's say from an on-premises network, you need to make sure that port 445 is open in an outbound direction when you're trying to connect to Azure. And that's because we're talking about SMB file shares, server message block version three, which uses port 445. And many internet service providers do not allow that outbound connectivity by default for security reasons. So your operating system then that you're connecting to the Azure file share from needs to support SMB version three, whether you're running that on Windows or Linux or the Mac OS platform. You can also enable on-premises file caching using Azure Files using the Azure File Sync agent. You would install the Azure File Sync agent on an on-premises server, whether it's physical or virtual, to provide access to Azure files in the cloud. But they're available on-premises, so they're locally available. So it's quick, and it also provides the ability when users create new content to store that in the cloud as a backup mechanism. The CLI can be used to create an Azure file share. 
In our first line, we have the command AZ storage account keys list. Every Azure storage account has two keys for programmatic or command line access. This command will return those two keys. Of course, we have to specify dash dash account dash name and give the name of the storage account dash G and specify the resource group the storage account was deployed into. That'll return two keys. You could store the key in a variable, you could copy it to the clipboard, whatever it is you needed to do, but it would be required in the second command, which runs AZ storage share create. Again, dash dash account dash name, we specify the name of the storage account that we want to create the Azure file share in, dash dash account dash key, and in this case, presumably we've got a variable called dollar sign storage account key in which storage access key is stored, dash dash name. In this case, we want to call our Azure file share projects. And finally, dash dash quota here with a value of 1024. The quota determines the maximum size that the Azure file share could grow to. And the unit of measurement is in gigabytes. You can also use PowerShell to define an Azure file share. In this example, in our first line, we're creating a variable called dollar sign store key. It will store the result of running get dash az storage account key with the dash resource group name parameter, specifying the resource group, the dash name parameter, I'm referring to a storage account called store account one, and that statement is within an open and close parentheses, so it executes as one expression. Outside of the closing parentheses, we're calling upon dot value open square bracket zero close square bracket. Now the dot value property returns the value of the storage account keys, plural. There are two of them, it's an array. So we refer to the first key by using the array subscript zero. If we wanted to refer to the second key, we would refer to value one. So we're storing the first storage account access key in our variable dollar sign store key. In the second example here, we are creating a variable called dollar sign storage context. And that will store the result of running new dash az storage context dash storage account name, I'm telling it to point to a storage account called store account one, dash storage account key parameter, I'm passing it the value of my variable from above, dollar sign store key. So that's essentially a pointer to our storage account with the key to give access to the storage account contents. Next, I'm creating a variable called dollar sign share name, and I want to create a share called east dash logs. So that's in quotation marks after dollar sign share name equals, and finally, to put it all together, build the share, I'm using new dash az storage share dash name. I'm going to refer to my dollar sign share name variable and dash context. I'll just refer to the dollar sign storage context variable. Azure file shares are SMB shared folders in the cloud, and they are created within an Azure storage account. So here in the portal, I'm going to begin in my list of storage accounts by clicking on an existing storage account. Now within it, I'm going to scroll down in the navigation bar until on the left, I get down to file service, where I will see any file shares that might have been previously defined. So I'm going to click on file shares. So on the right, I'm then going to click the add file share button. I want to create a file share named budgets and I can set the quota here measured in gig, let's say to 500. And then I'm going to go ahead and click create. So we've now got a centralized cloud-based file share storage location called budgets. If I click on it, we can even populate it from here. For example, I'm going to click the upload button. And then on the right, I'm going to select a few files from my on-premises system to upload to the budgets share. And I'll click the upload button. So we can now see that we've got some spreadsheet files that were uploaded into this centralized shared folder. Notice that when you're working with Azure file shares, you can also add directories. So for example, I could put in a subdirectory called future in which I could then organize files. So it's much like organizing a shared folder in its hierarchy on a traditional file server. Notice at the top, you've also got an edit quota button if you ever want to change the maximum totalable allowable size for the contents of that Azure file share. You also have a connect button up at the top that will provide instructions, whether you're connecting from a Windows 
Linux or a Mac OS platform. So you could choose, for example, on the Windows side, the drive letter, and then you can see it's generated the commands that would be required to map that drive or in Linux and the Mac OS to remotely mount the Azure file share so that it shows up and is mounted in a local directory in Linux or the Mac OS environments. You could also go to the snapshots view and take periodic snapshots by clicking the add snapshot button, which is essentially is a point in time picture of the current state of that specific Azure file share. Once the snapshot is created, you could click on it to view the contents of it at that point in time. And you could even click on connect if you wanted to make a connection to this particular snapshot. Azure file shares can be defined not only in the portal GUI, but also through the CLI. Here I've launched Cloud Shell within the portal. So to get started, I'm going to run the AZ storage account keys list command because I want to list the account keys to access the contents of a storage account. So I'll have to specify the storage account name with dash dash account dash name. In this case, I'm referring to a storage account called store account YHZ45 and then dash G for resource group of RG1. And I'm going to press enter. Every storage account has two access keys. They're listed here, key one and key two. So let's say I'm interested in the first key. So I'm going to copy, let's say, that first key to my Windows clipboard. Now what I want to do is now create an Azure storage share. And to do that, I'm going to, first of all, clear the screen here, and I'm going to use the AZ storage share create command. I'm going to specify dash dash account dash name and give it the name of the storage account in which I want to create this Azure file share. Dash dash account dash key and I'll provide the value for one of the keys that I copied from the previous command where we listed the two storage account access keys. Then I'll use dash dash name because I want to name this Azure file share projects and I'll use dash dash quota and I'll specify that I don't want this to grow beyond a maximum value of 1024 gig. So I'm going to go ahead and press enter to build that file share. And it says created true. That's our returned JSON. So what I'm going to do now is run AZ storage share list dash dash account dash name. And our storage account is called store account YHZ 45. Just to make sure we can see what's listed here in terms of the storage share or file shares. One is already there that was pre-existing called budgets. But here's the one that we just created called projects. And we can also verify this in the portal GUI. Let's minimize the cloud shell window. And if I navigate to my storage account and pop up the file shares blade, I'll just click refresh. I can now see that the projects share now exists. You can use PowerShell to create an Azure file share. I've launched Cloud Shell here within the Azure portal. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a variable to store a storage account key. So my statement here is going to be dollar sign store key. That's the name of my variable. That's going to store the result of running get dash az storage account key. I'll specify the resource group and the name of the storage account. And that entire statement is within an open and close parentheses to treat it as a separate expression. Then I'm calling upon dot value. Now the value property will contain the two keys. So it's an array, it's two items, plural. The first one we can reference as dot value open square bracket zero, low square bracket. The second key we would refer to as value one. It doesn't make a difference which key we use to gain access to the storage account. So I'm gonna go ahead and press enter to create that variable. And if we just check out that variable by typing dollar sign store key, we can see it stores the value of the first key. Perfect, that's what we wanted to do. Now the next thing I wanna do is create a context variable that stores the name of my storage account. That way it makes it easier to work with further with other commands. So to do that, I'm gonna create a variable called dollar sign CTX context, which will store the result of running get dash az storage account, dash r for resource group rg1 and dash name. The name of my storage account is store account yhz. 45. Now, the next thing I want to do 
is really get the context property of my variable stored in this variable. What that means is I'm going to run dollar sign CTX equals dollar sign CTX itself. But the difference here is I'm going to go further and add dot context. Context is a property of the variable after you retrieve the storage account with get dash AZ storage account. And so we need the context property. Perfect. So now that we've done that, we can actually create a new shared folder in the Azure cloud. So new dash AZ storage, make sure we don't have any typos here, AZ storage share dash name. Now, what do you want to call this new share? Well, let's say I want to call it East dash logs. I'll put that in quotes. Space dash context. And this is where I'm going to refer to my dollar sign CTX variable from above. Now, it has the information about the storage account and the access key that gives me access to it here from PowerShell. And it looks like we are good to go. Now, we can verify this by running get well, let's just clear the screen for a CLS, get dash AZ storage share dash context. I'll just use my context variable again, dollar sign CTX. And we can see that we have a number of shares available within that storage account, one of which is called East dash logs. And we can verify our work in the GUI if we just minimize cloud shell. Back here in the background, I was already looking at the file shares for that storage account. So I'll click refresh. And indeed, we now see the presence of the East dash logs as your file share. Once you've created an Azure file share, you can then map a drive letter to it from a Windows environment, whether that Windows machine is on premises or whether it's a virtual machine running in the cloud. Bear in mind, if you're running on premises Windows machines that are going to map to Azure file shares, Port 45 needs to be open in an outbound direction on firewalls. So to get started here in the portal, I'm already looking at a list of file shares within an Azure storage account. One of those file shares is called budgets. So I'm going to click on it to open it up. It's already got some files within it. So in order to map a drive letter to it from a Windows virtual machine, or could be a physical server, I need to know the command. So I'm going to click the connect button at the top so that command is revealed. So for the Windows platform, I'm going to start by selecting the drive letter that I want to use for the mapping. Let's say here it's Q. And down below, I can see the actual code that I could use on a Windows machine in PowerShell to map the drive letter. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that to the clipboard. So here in my Windows environment, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Start menu and start the PowerShell ISC, the Integrated Scripting Environment. I'm going to right-click on it and run it as administrator because I'm going to paste in what we've copied here. So I'm just going to create a new script file and paste in what we copied. So what's happening here, if we take a quick peek, is that the code, let's just press control plus here to zoom in. The code is making sure that we can have a valid connection to the storage account on port 445. Now that's happening using the test dash net connection PowerShell commandlet. And if that connection succeeds, then what's happening is we're building a new drive mapping in PowerShell using new dash PS drive, PS being PowerShell. We can see here it's using drive letter Q. We can see the provider is file system and the root that we're mapping to is pointing to our storage account and specifically in this case to the budgets file share. And we want this drive letter to persist on this host, so dash persist is being used. So I'm going to go ahead and run the script using the run script button up at the top. And we can see it's attempting a connection and waiting for the response through port 445. And after a moment, it looks like it's been done. Now, we can verify this in a number of ways, one of which is down at the bottom in PowerShell. We should have access to switch over to drive Q, and I could type DIR and see the contents. So here we have our network location for budgets, our file share, and we can see it's listed here with the contents of it. You can connect an Azure file share to a Linux host by creating a remote mount point, basically creating a local folder in Linux that you will mount the remote file system in. So it appears local as is normally the case in a Linux environment. 
In the Windows world, it's a little bit different. In Windows, we would map a drive letter. So to get started here in the portal, I'm already looking at the file shares for an existing storage account. One of those file shares is called budgets. I'm gonna click on budgets to open it up where I can see there are some existing files in that shared folder. I'm gonna click the connect button up at the top and I'll choose Linux. And I'm gonna specify the local mount point I want created in my Linux environment when I run this in Linux. I'll specify budgets and it's adjusting the syntax down below to essentially configure that mount point. I'm gonna click the copy button copy that command to my Windows clipboard. And I'm just temporarily going to paste that here in WordPad so we can go through it briefly. The first thing that's happening in the script here is it's running sudo to run elevated Linux commands to create a directory locally in Linux under slash MNT, and that directory is called budgets. Then it's checking for a credentials file. Then as we go further down towards the bottom, we can see what it's trying to do is run the mount command. Again, with elevated privileges, it's prefixed with su do. The file system type dash t is cifs, and then it's referring to my storage account and more specifically to the budgets shared folder. And it's mounting that locally in Linux under slash mnt slash budgets. So we need to execute this in Linux. So here on my Linux host, I'm going to go ahead and paste in that script. And we'll give it a moment to run. So I'm going to press enter. Now once it's run, we should be able to change directory here in Linux to slash mnt slash budgets. I'll just clear the screen with the clear command and I'll type ls. And we can actually see the contents of that remote shared folder that's being hosted within the Azure cloud. So in this course, we've examined how to work with Azure files to manage file shares and how to connect to a file share using Windows and Linux. We did this by exploring Azure files and how an Azure file share enables shared folders in the cloud. We looked at how to use the portal, CLI and PowerShell to manage an Azure file share. We looked at how to map a drive to an Azure file share using a Microsoft Windows system. We also looked at how to map a mount point to an Azure file share using a Linux system. In our next course, we'll move on to explore Azure database solutions, including the use of Azure table storage, Azure Cosmos DB, and Azure SQL. If you need basic key value type of storage within an Azure storage account, you can do it by adding a storage account table. To get started here in the portal, I'm going to open up an existing storage account. And in the navigation bar, I'm going to scroll down until I come across table service, and then I'll click on tables. I'll just scroll over to the right as well. Currently, we see there are no tables currently defined in this storage account. These are essentially very basic NoSQL key value type of storage entities. So to add a table, I'm going to go ahead and click the add table button up at the top. And I'm going to call this one, let's say, customers1 and I'll click OK. I'll click the Load More link down below to refresh the user interface, and there's the Customers 1 table, and we can see the URL associated with that, which references the storage account that it was created in. But over on the far right, if I open the context menu for Customers 1, I can choose to either delete it, I don't want to do that, I just created it, but I can also set a server-side access policy. Now, there are no policies here by default, so I'm going to go ahead and click the Add Policy so I can limit which permissions are available to access this table, customers one. So for the identifier, I'm gonna put in a string name here, policy one, and I'm gonna select all the permissions here in the list, read, add, update, delete. And I'm also gonna set a start date and time of when I want that applicable. This is somewhat reminiscent of a shared access signature, but the real difference here is that this is completely server side. So if I change the server side, it's in effect right away. Now, having done that, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and click OK and then Save to save that policy. Now, let's take a look at this table from the perspective of the free Azure Storage Explorer GUI tool because there's really not much more you can do here other than define the table structure because really this is used for storage at the development level. Developers would write code, maybe using tools like Visual Studio. They could even make a connection to that and have access 
as per the access policy. And so I've downloaded and installed the Storage Explorer tool. I've connected it to my Azure subscription. So down below that, I'm going to drill down under Storage Accounts. I'm going to drill down under the Storage Account where we just created that table. And of course, I'm going to look at the tables within the Storage Account. What you're going to notice in this tool is a number of built-in tables that are prefixed in their name with a dollar sign. And that's normal. But what I do also see is our Customers 1 table. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Now, currently, there's no data. There are no key value pairs stored here. But I can do it here in the interface. Of course, I could also do it programmatically. But here in the Storage Explorer, I'm going to click the Add button. The first thing I'm going to do is add a partition key. Now, by using different partition key values, as you add more and more items, you are essentially spreading them out, the data, the items, in multiple partitions. So, for example, if I put all of my items, and I've got hundreds of thousands of them, in a partition key with a value of one, then they're all in the same partition. So it kind of constrains or limits what I can do in terms of scalability. But if I start using different partition key values for different subsets of data, I'm spreading it out in different partitions. Now, the row key is like a primary key in a standard type of SQL compliant database table. So let's say for customers here, the row key will be 001. I can also add additional properties. Let's say cust address. I can choose the data type here, whether it's string, boolean, date time, double, 32 or 64 bit in integer. I get to choose whatever I want based on what I need to store. So here I'm just going to use string. Maybe I'll put in something fictitious like 123 Maple Ave. And I could keep adding properties here, but this is good enough for this key value stored item. So I'm going to go ahead and click insert, and we can see the partition key showing up here, the row key, the date and timestamp of creation for this item in the table, and in our case, the custom, customer address. So that's been added here as well. Now, aside from using this interface, what you'll probably find would be more common from a developer's perspective is connecting from a developer tool. And so what I could do is right-click on that table, and I could choose Get Shared Access Signature. Now, from the list, I can choose the policy one access policy we created previously. Of course, I could specify something else here. And I can see the items that are made available based on what's in that policy, such as the permissions of querying, adding, updating, and deleting, and so on. I'm going to go ahead and click Create, at which point we get both a URI and a query string that can be used. We can copy them that can be used to allow access to that specific table. So I'm just going to go ahead and choose close. So from this point, it would be more of a developer's type of situation where you'd want to access the table stored in the Azure Storage account programmatically. A NoSQL database uses a less rigid schema or blueprint that defines the definition of what kind of data will be stored than a traditional relational or SQL compliant database does. One of the benefits of a NoSQL type of database is that it is designed for high scalability. Essentially, it's designed to ingest and process through analytics tools, big data. Now, Cosmos DB in Microsoft Azure is generally considered to be a NoSQL type of data store because there's really no blueprint or schema that gets enforced when adding items to Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB is actually used by a lot of Microsoft services like Skype, MSN, Active Directory, Xbox, and so on. The other great thing about using a NoSQL type of database solution like Cosmos DB in Azure is that it supports global replication and horizontal scaling. So scaling out or in to accommodate storage requirements. Now, you can also import data into Cosmos DB. The first thing you need to do in Azure before you can even think about that, though, is you need to create a Cosmos DB account. When you're doing that, you can also specify the API, the application programming interface type, for that Cosmos DB account. So you can import data into Cosmos DB from SQL databases, from CSV files, from MongoDB, MongoDB is classified as a NoSQL type of database solution that stores documents in JSON syntax format. JSON files are also supported as the raw input form for ingesting data 
into Cosmos DB. Now, if you want to be able to conduct standard SQL types of queries against Cosmos DB, even though the data might not be stored in a SQL type format, then you could use the SQL API to do that because there are a number of software development kits or SDKs available, including for MongoDB, if you're familiar with MongoDB already. There's also a Gremlin Graph API. And graph database storage is used when you have interrelationships between all of the data without specifically creating table relationships as you would with a relational database system. So dealing with social media gathered data, for example. Azure Cosmos DB security begins with inbound IP addresses or ranges to control access to Cosmos DB from a specific network. Also, there are two types of keys available in Cosmos DB, one of which is called a master key, the other of which is called a resource token. Master keys are used for administering Cosmos DB, whereas resource tokens are used to access resources that are stored within Cosmos DB. Things like containers, which are stored within databases, or documents, which are stored within containers, and so on. Cosmos DB also automatically has backup enabled by default, where backups are taken and retained for 30 days. There are also a number of built-in RBAC rules in Azure that you can assign to other technicians to limit their access to Cosmos DB. For example, the Cosmos DB account reader role provides read access to Cosmos DB data. Cosmos DB operator allows for the management of Cosmos DB, but not the data within it. Then there's Cosmos backup operator, the document DB account contributor, and so on. You can use the Azure portal to deploy an Azure Cosmos DB account, which is what I'm going to do here. So to do that, I'm going to start by clicking create a resource and I'm going to search for Cosmos. And I'm going to choose Azure Cosmos DB and I'll choose create. So to get started, I will deploy this into a resource group and I'm going to give this a unique name. The name has to be all lowercase letters. So if I were to try to call this, let's say, Cosmos and then put in some characters to make it unique while adhering to organizational naming standards. Even though I did that, I've got uppercase letter C at the beginning of the name of that Cosmos DB account, and so it doesn't like it. So therefore, if I just change that to a lowercase C, as long as the name is unique, you can see that with the green check mark to the right of the field, then we're good to go. I can then select the API for my Cosmos DB account, which defaults to core SQL. However, if I want to treat it as a graph database so that I can analyze interrelationships between gathered data, I might choose Gremlin Graph. Or if I want it to be treated as an Azure table, I could also do that for basic type of storage of key value pairs. However, I'm going to leave it on Core SQL for this example. Down below, I'm going to specify the location of the region where I want this deployed. So I'll choose East US. I'm going to make sure that apply for free tier discount is turned on so I can test this out. I'm going to enable it for production, which allows for options like geo redundancy and multi region write capability on all of those copies. And within a region, I could even enable availability zone replication, which I'll turn on. I'll click on enable. So I'm going to click next for networking. For connectivity method, how do I want this? Cosmos DB storage account to be visible. The default is to have a public endpoint for selected networks. We could also choose all networks. Then of course, I don't have to select a specific VNet down below, or we could have a private endpoint. I'm gonna go back to the default of public endpoint for selected networks. I'm gonna allow access to Cosmos DB from the portal and from my on-premises IP address, which is automatically gathered here as I'm creating the account. And I'm going to go down and choose a specific virtual network. In this case, I'll choose an existing VNet called VNet1, and I'll choose a subnet, let's say, called Subnet1. Notice some of these subnets have a, a message in parentheses after the name of the subnet and the address range that says Microsoft Azure Cosmos DB endpoint is missing. Well, that's okay, because if you were to select one of those subnets, it would create the Cosmos DB endpoint to allow access. It would do that for you. So here, I'm just going to choose subnet one. I'll click next for tags. I don't want to add any tags. Next for review and create. After the validation is successful, I will create my Cosmos DB account by clicking the create button. 
And this might take a few minutes, just keep your eye on it, and then you can conf configure it. This might take a few minutes, just keep your eye on it, and then you'll be able to configure it further once it's been deployed. Now that the deployment is complete, I'm going to click the Go to Resource button so we can check out our Cosmos DB account. That puts us automatically in the Quick Start Blade, where on the right, we've got a couple of items here. We've got step A and B, where step A is to add a container and work with data using Notebook. So essentially, you're going to get a sample container, which is used to store items, and a .NET app. Now, down below, when you add a container, there's a sample here called the items container that has 10 gig of storage capacity and 400 RUs. That's request units per second. And then finally, you'll be able to download and run your first .NET app. Now, that's what you want to do if you are new to Cosmos DB. Up at the top, you can choose the platform. The default selection is .NET, but you might choose, for example, Node.js or Python to go through those steps to set up some sample data and a sample app. Now we can also scroll down here to keys and notice that we'll have a couple of sets of keys, read, write, and read only keys. So under read, write keys, we've got a primary and a secondary key, as well as a primary and a secondary connection string. For read only, we've also got a primary and secondary key, as well as connection string for read only. Now these would be used when you have the type of connectivity whether it be read write or read only that you want, for example, at the command line or using programmatic calls of a variety of different types of languages. And if I go to firewalls and virtual networks, it's similar to a storage account in that you can determine whether access is allowed to this Cosmos DB account from all networks or selected networks, which we specified upon creation VNet1 and ultimately subnet1. Under firewall, we can also see our client on-premises IP address has also been added. Again, that was done when we created our Cosmos DB account. If you go down under containers, once you've actually got some data in here, whether it's your own data or whether it's from one of the samples under the quick start blade, you'll be able to start browsing some of the items stored in the container. So at this point, we have created a Cosmos DB account. Either during the deployment of a Cosmos DB account or after the fact, you can enable replication across regions, so globally. So to get started here in the portal, I'm already in the properties of an existing Cosmos DB account. So I'm going to scroll down in the navigation bar, and under settings, I'm going to click on replicate data globally. So we can see we currently have it disabled. Down below, we can see our current location of our data. That would be East US. This would be the current location for the Cosmos DB storage account. So to replicate data globally, I can specify an alternate region by clicking on it. So if I want it on the West Coast, then for example, I could click on the West Coast. We can see over on the right, it's now added West US 2. You also want multiple copies of the data to be replicated within an availability zone in that region. You can also turn on the check mark for availability zone if it's enabled. So we can go ahead and turn enable on to make sure that we have this done and then save our changes. Azure SQL Database is a database as a service or DBaaS type of solution. It's also in a more broader sense Platform as a Service, or PaaS. So it's a managed service, which means that you as the customer don't have to worry about deploying your virtual machine and installing the software to support your SQL database solution. That's taken care of by Microsoft Azure, hence managed service. It also supports BWOL. That would be BYOL, bring your own license. So if you've already got, for example, Microsoft SQL Server licensing that you've acquired, then you can reuse that again in the cloud. You can also migrate on-premises databases to Azure SQL. SQL objects include the server instances, databases, tables, fields or columns, records or rows, stored procedures, views, queries, and so on. These are items that you'll find within a SQL type of environment, and they are supported in the Azure cloud.
Azure SQL Database also has a number of scaling options. Horizontal scaling means adding additional database replicas to handle an increase in transaction traffic or the amount of data or some combination of both. Also, database sharding is available. This is a horizontal type of solution that partitions data into smaller chunks for easier management. Vertical scaling is also available. So scaling up or scaling down, respectively adding or decreasing the underlying horsepower. That's essentially VM instance sizing for those VMs supporting your database solution. Management of Azure SQL database can be done via the Azure portal, using the Azure CLI, such as, for example, creating a database with AZ SQL DB create, or in PowerShell using the new dash AZ SQL database commandlet. You could also use an ARM template to deploy and manage an Azure SQL database environment by referencing the Microsoft.SQL slash servers provider, if that's the type of SQL database environment that you're looking for. On the security side, with Azure SQL Database, connectivity is done through the standard SQL listening port, port 1433. You can configure the SQL Server firewall in Azure to allow connectivity, for example, to port 1433, perhaps from your on-premises IP address. That way, you could use tools like Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio to make a connection to your database and manage it, as if it were on-premises. Transparent Data Encryption, or TDE, protects data at rest. That would include SQL databases, backups, and transaction logs. It's on by default. And you also have the option to further configure TDE by using customer-managed encryption keys. There are other security options available as well, like data masking. Data masking might be used, for example, to hide all digits in a credit card number but the last four. So that might be useful for support staff that are handling customer support calls in a data center. And also, SQL database logins can be used, as well as Azure Active Directory user login credentials. Because Azure SQL solutions come in the form of a managed service, it means that we don't have to worry about deploying the underlying virtual machines or installing the database software. That's handled for us. So to get started here in the portal, I'm going to click Create a Resource, and I'm going to search for SQL. And from the list, I'll choose Azure SQL, and then I'll click on Create. From here, you can choose to deploy using the SQL database model. So you could have a single database or an elastic pool, where a pool is really a collection of resources that can be used by multiple databases added to the pool. Or you could deploy a database server. Now, if you're looking at migrations where essentially you still have a managed service in terms of SQL managed instances, but you want 100% compatibility with on-premises SQL type of feature sets, then you would look at deploying a SQL managed instance. If you want to do pretty much everything yourself where you have full control of the underlying operating system, meaning you can configure it, then you would deploy as a SQL virtual machine. So in this case, I want SQL database, single database. I'm going to go ahead and click on create to do that. So I'll deploy this into a resource group. And down below, I have to give a name to both the database and the server. So I could select an existing SQL server deployment. If we have one in Azure, I do not. So in this case, I'll have to create a new one. First, let's deal with the database name. I'm going to call it DB and then put in some characters to make sure it's a unique name and that it adheres to company naming standards. Now for the server, I'm gonna click Create New, and I'm gonna give it a name. Again, I'll make sure the name is unique and that it adheres to company naming standards. Now once we've done that, I could specify the server admin credentials, so the username, the admin login, and the password, which I'll confirm, and then the region. Okay, and so once I've specified that, I'll click the OK button. So we've taken care of the SQL database name and we've defined a new SQL server instance in the cloud. I don't want to use an elastic pool, so I'll leave that on no. And down below, we can see the compute and storage underlying horsepower for our deployment. So I'm going to leave it on its current setting, although I could click configure database to change it if I needed more horsepower to accommodate my database workload or perhaps even less. So I'm going to click next networking. 
I don't want any public access. Well, that's the default, at least it's set to no access. We could set up a public endpoint. If we do that, we have to make sure that we allow either Azure resources access to the database or our current client IP address, which I'm going to choose yes for, because I'm going to be in the end using SQL Server Management Studio on premises to connect to and manage my SQL deployment in the Azure cloud. I can always change this after the fact too. I'm going to click next for additional settings. Now here I'm going to use some sample data. So I'm going to choose use existing data sample. It's going to install the AdventureWorks LT sample database, which is fine just so we have something to look at. And down below, there's nothing else I'm going to change. So I'll click next for tags. I'm going to add tags. So I'll click next for review and create. And on the summary screen, I'm going to click create to deploy both the SQL Server and the database in Azure. And after a moment, we can see that the deployment is complete. It doesn't take very long. And if you've been in this field for a while, you might recall back in the early to mid 90s, setting up servers by installing them from floppy disk like Novell servers and installing database solutions like Sybase all from floppy. This is a piece of cake compared to what it used to be like way back in the day. So I'm going to click go to resource. Couldn't be easier than that. That'll take me into the properties of our database, our SQL database deployments. We're in the database here. And we could see in the overview section for the status that the database is currently online and some other settings that reflect how we set this up initially, such as the SQL server name it's associated with, that the database is associated with. That's a link, so we could jump to the SQL server. We'll do that after in a moment. We can also see there's no elastic pool configuration. There are also database connection strings we can choose to show here that we might use for authentication from a coding perspective. So we've got a number of options available there. Now down over on the left, if I were to click under settings, for example, and click on configure, this is where we'll see things like the sizing, the underlying hardware that supports our current workload. And that's fine, I'm gonna leave that as it is. And as I scroll down in the navigation bar on the left, I'll come across some security options such as dynamic data masking. If I decide I want to mask things like credit card numbers or email addresses or any type of sensitive information, such as when perhaps client or customer representatives pull up customer records on the screen. So we have those options available as well. Let's go back up to the overview blade for the database. And I'm just going to go ahead and click on the link for the SQL Server that we deployed. So I'll click on that to open it up. So you can see now in the upper left, we're looking at the properties, the navigation bar for this SQL Server. And if I look over to the right here, I can click on firewalls and virtual network settings. I can click show firewall settings to see what's being configured. And down below, these are some of the options we had upon the creation of this in the wizard where we can allow Azure services to access the server. We left that on no, but notice our client IP address. This is our public internet address as seen by Azure. So if you're behind a NAT router, that's the public interface of the NAT router. That will be allowed access into the server for remote management and configuration types of purposes. And while we're here in the server, if I click over on the left under settings, I can select SQL databases to see which databases are associated with this particular server. And there's the database that we deployed. It's currently online. Back in the overview blade on the right, here's the DNS name of our SQL server. That's going to be important if you did want to make a remote connection for management purposes, such as using tools like Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. Once you've completed your Azure SQL database deployment, there are plenty of things that you can do after the fact, such as querying any data, if there are any databases currently populated with information, and you can also change configuration settings. Let's get started here in the portal by going to the All Resources view, where I'm going to filter for both Azure SQL databases as well as Azure SQL servers. So type equals all is what we've currently got for a filter. I don't want to see everything. I'm going to uncheck select all, and I'm going to scroll all the way down to the S's and put a check mark next to SQL database and SQL server. And I'll click outside of that to filter the list. Now, if you don't see those items in the list, it's because you don't have any of those deployed yet. So here we can see we've got a SQL database and a SQL server. I'm going to click on the link 
for the SQL Server to open it up first. And I'm just going to scroll a little bit over to the right. So in the overview blade for the SQL Server, we can see the server admin name. We can see the server name, the DNS name that we would use to connect to it. For example, for remote management types of purposes. And we can also click on show firewall settings, perhaps to make changes such as whether we want to allow or not allow access from certain IPs. I've already got my public IP address as it's known on the internet for my on-premises network added here as a valid client IP address that's allowed to make connections. I can also choose to allow Azure services and resources to access this server. So I could choose yes for that option. Once I've made changes to this type of configuration, I can go ahead and click on save to put it into effect. And I'll just click OK on the success message. I can also go manage backups if I want to make changes to backup and retention settings for this SQL Server. We could see each database will be listed here. We've only got one database, so I could put a check mark to select it. And I could choose configure retention at the top to configure backup retention settings for point in time restore or PITR backup. So we could specify the retention period and also determine how long we want to keep our weekly, monthly, and yearly backups. However, I'm just going to cancel out of there. If I go to the SQL databases blade, then again, I'll see all the databases available under this server. I'm going to click directly on the database that's listed there, which takes me into the database settings. Now here in the database settings, I can scroll down and choose configure to configure some details related to this specific database instance. So what I could do, for example, is change the underlying compute power that is available for this database instance. So I could click on the change configuration link. And if I need more virtual cores and memory, I could select a different option or I could choose less if, for example, I wanted to save on monthly compute costs related to this. You just need to make sure, of course, that your underlying horsepower matches your workload requirements. And so for that, you might have to kind of monitor utilization over time. If I scroll over to the right here, I can see the database utilization in terms of the CPU percentage and also the data space consumed in terms of a percentage. That's a unit of measurement. So we've got those options available here as well. We can also see any connection strings by, by clicking connection strings on the left that can be used for authentication from a variety of different coding languages. So right now we're looking at ADO.net. I could choose JDBC and see the connection string, ODBC, PHP, and Go. So depending on the language that developers would use to talk to the database will determine exactly how they use the connection string to connect to the database. Just going to go ahead and close out of this. So we're back in our SQL Server settings because the other thing we should probably mention here if we scroll down under security is Transparent Data Encryption or TDE. Now this is enabled by default. Service Managed Key means the keys are managed by Microsoft. But for some regulation compliance, you might have to use your own managed keys to manage the encryption of data at rest with your Azure SQL Database deployment. So I'm going to choose Customer Managed Key at which point I could choose a key vault by clicking the link. So I'll select an existing key vault. Then I can go down and click the change key link to select a key from within that key vault that will be used for encryption for TDE. So there are a number of settings that we can make here to configure the behavior of our SQL database environment. Now let's go back into the database. So I'm going to go back to the SQL databases view. I don't want to save my settings, so I'll just click OK. And I'm going to click on the database link again to open it up because the other thing you might find useful is the query editor. If I pull up the query editor, it will give me the ability, as the name implies, to run a query against data that's stored in the database. So I can learn a bit about that after I authenticate. I'm going to specify my SQL credentials here that were specified upon creation to authenticate. And now I can, for example, on the left, drill down under tables available within this SQL database. For example, here I've got one called salesLT.customer, and I can see all of the field or column definitions. This is a sample database. And so over on the right, I can start to piece together SQL queries. Here I'm saying I want to select the last name, comma, and the first name columns from the salesLT.customer table. And if I run the query, then we'll get the results listed down below. We can see all the last names and all the first names. 
coming from that table. So there you have it. That's how we can quickly go in and take a peek at existing SQL Server and database properties and how to begin accessing the data in a limited way using the query editor. In this demonstration, I'm going to use SQL Server Management Studio on-premises basically to reach into the Azure cloud and make a connection to my Azure SQL environment. This way I can use familiar on-premises SQL management tools to manage my Azure SQL database deployments. So the first thing I want to do here in the portal is get the fully qualified domain name with the FQDN of the SQL Server in Azure. So I'm in the All Resources view. I've already filtered the types here for only SQL Database and SQL Server. It's all I'm looking at. So I'm gonna open up my SQL Server by clicking on the link for it. And in the Overview blade, the first thing I need to know is the server name. I've gotta know what to connect to. And I can see it listed here over on the right. I have a copy icon to copy to clipboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that name. The other thing I should do is click Show Firewall Settings over here on the right. I'm still on the overview blade because I want to make sure that I'm able to connect to that SQL Server in Azure from my current location. My current location is my on-premises network here where I've already added my client IP address. So if you're currently sitting at the network location where you want to have access to your SQL Server in the Azure Cloud, you can click the Add Client IP button up at the top. But I've already done that, so we're good to go. So here I've launched the Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio tool that I have installed on my on-premises system. And I've pasted in the SQL Server name that I copied from Azure. And I'm using SQL Server Authentication here. So I'll specify the SQL username and password that I specify when I deployed that Azure SQL environment in Azure. And I'm going to go ahead and click on Connect. After a moment, it'll make the connection into the cloud to my SQL Server. We can see here in the Object Explorer on the left, indeed, that we have that connection. And I'm connected as user C. Blackwell. So from here, I'm going to drill down under Databases. And I see the actual database name that is hosted by my SQL Server in Azure. So of course, as per normal, as if this were on-premises, I can drill down under the database. I can drill down under Tables. And I can begin starting to work with everything in that SQL environment as I would if I had deployed all of this and were managing it on-premises. You can achieve high availability for your Azure SQL deployment by configuring a database with geo-replication. To get started here in the portal, I filtered out my All Resources view for only SQL databases and SQL Server type of objects. And I've got one of each. Let's start by clicking on the SQL Server to open up its properties. Now in the navigation bar, as I scroll down through and take a look, I don't notice a geo-replication option. And that's as it should be, because geo-replication isn't enabled at the SQL Server level, but rather at the database level. So I'm going to click on my SQL Server database here over on the left to open up its properties. And when I scroll down in the navigation bar on the left, if I look under the settings area, I'll see geo-replication. That's going to give me a map where I can see I've got a blue indicator with a white check mark in it that implies the current primary location of that database replica. And if my geography isn't so great by looking at a map, I can just scroll down and see what it says. Here it says Canada Central is where we've got the primary replica of that SQL database. And then underneath that, it says Secondaries Geo-Replication is not configured. So I can go down under the target regions down below and select a secondary region I want to replicate to. So in this case, I'm going to choose East US. That's going to pop up a Create Secondary Blade. So the database name can't be changed. The secondary replica type is readable. But I do have to specify a target SQL Server. And if I don't already have one, I'm going to have to create one. So when I click on Target Server, it says no servers found in that region. So I'm going to have to create one. So over on the right, I'm going to give it a name and fill in the required details to make that happen. So I'm going to put in a name that's unique while adhering to organizational naming standards. And I'll specify the server admin login, so the SQL admin login and password. And then I'll go ahead and click the select button down at the bottom. So that gives us a server available in the target region that can accommodate 
our replica of our database in that region. So there's no elastic pool. I'm going to leave the pricing tier as it was, and I'm going to click the OK button. And after a moment, we can now see that under secondaries, it's grayed out because it's in the midst of initializing, as we can see under the status column. But from Canada Central to East US is the direction of replication, where Canada Central is the primary and East US is a secondary. And if I kind of scroll up in the map, I also have kind of a representation of that geographically. So at this point, we can see that replication is enabled across geographical regions for our Azure SQL database. And if we go back and look at our all resources view here, I filtered it for items that contain SQL in the name. Notice now that we have two SQL servers. We have the original one from the Canada Central region. But when we enable geo-replication, we configured a second SQL server instance in East US. And the same is true of the database. We have the same SQL database listed twice, one for the original Canada Central region, that's the primary copy, and the second is for East US, the secondary copy. Now, if I click and open, let's say the primary or original SQL server database instance, and if we go to the geo-replication blade, once again, this is where we'll see the map. We can see the original location in blue and the secondary in green. And down below, we can see exactly where they are, Canada Central and East US. Now, what I could do here is click on my secondary database, and I could either stop replication to it from the primary, or if there's been some kind of a failure in the primary region, I could force a failover, which makes the secondary the primary. And there would be a minimal amount of downtime, normally measured in seconds, very rarely measured in minutes, while this failover would be occurring. You can use the Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio GUI tool to migrate an existing on-premises SQL database into the Azure cloud. So as an example here, I'm already in the Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio connected to a SQL Server. So here I've got a database shown over here on the left in the Object Explorer, and I'm gonna right click on that database and choose Tasks. And notice you'll have the option here to deploy the database to Microsoft Azure SQL Database. Perfect, I'm gonna go ahead and click on that option to start the wizard, and I'm going to click Next. So I need to make sure I know the DNS name of the target SQL server in Azure I want to publish the database to. So in my SQL server here in the portal, in the overview blade, I'm just going to scroll over to the right here, and here I see the server name. So I'm going to go ahead and click the copy icon to copy it to my clipboard. At the same time, I might also want to click on show firewall settings to make sure that my client IP address has been added here. That would be my on-premises IP address from which I am essentially publishing the on-premises SQL database from. Now back here in the SQL Server Management Studio wizard for deploying to Azure, I'm gonna click on the connect button for the server connection and specify the DNS name I just copied and specify the SQL Server authentication information. And then I'll click connect. Now while that's fine, I'm also gonna click the sign in button to sign into my Microsoft Azure account. And after a moment, we'll see that we are connected as user C Blackwell to our Azure SQL Server instance. And it wants to call the new database that it's going to publish to Azure, the same as it's called currently on premises, which is fine. I'm not going to change any of the other settings here. I'm going to leave it on the basic edition of Azure SQL database with a maximum database size of two gigabytes. So I'm going to go ahead and click next. And finally, I'll click finish. So we can see it's in the midst of exporting and then processing all of the tables that are stored in that database and updating it in the cloud. So depending on the amount of data you've got to move into the Azure cloud will determine how long this takes before the operation is complete as it is here. You can even consider this one way of migrating on-premises data into the cloud. So I'm gonna choose close and let's take a look here at our Azure SQL Server Basically, I want to take a look at the SQL databases now present on it. So I'm going to click SQL databases, and we can now see that the database that we moved from on-premises here into the cloud is now listed. 
Okay, so in this course, we've examined database solutions in Azure, including Cosmos DB, NoSQL types of databases, and Azure SQL databases. We did this by exploring how to create a NoSQL table in an Azure storage account. We took a look at when to use Cosmos DB solutions. We also talked about how to use the portal to deploy Cosmos DB and create Cosmos DB replicas. And we discussed when to use Azure SQL solutions. Next, we learned how to deploy Azure SQL and manage Azure SQL configuration settings. We looked at how to connect to Azure SQL using Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. We looked at how to enable Azure SQL for high availability and how to use Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio to publish an on-premises database to Azure. In our next course, We'll move on to explore how to secure Azure networks using network security groups and firewall rules and how to protect Azure VMs with a Bastion host. In Microsoft Azure, network security groups or NSGs are a layer four firewall type of solution. Layer 4 applies to the OSI model, where Layer 4 is the transport layer. It means that the firewall can make decisions to allow or deny traffic based on things like the source and destination, IP address range, port numbers, and so on. So we've got allow rules to allow specific traffic through, or we've got deny rules to block traffic from going through. The Network Security Group, or NSG, also has a number of default rules such as the default allowance of traffic from inside Azure out to the internet, but at the same time, the default behavior of blocking inbound traffic initiated from the internet. Network security groups have a number of different components. For example, you can specify source and destination IP addresses. You could specify an application security group. Now, the purpose of an application security group is to group virtual machines or VMs based on their role they might play within supporting an application. You might have multiple VMs that support a single app. So this way, we can start making network security group rules to allow or deny traffic based on the app instead of just the affiliation of the network security group with the subnet or a network interface. We could specify source and destination port numbers where the port identifies a service. So RDP will listen, for example, on 3389, and SSH listens on port 22. So the rules can also look at TCP, UDP, or ICMP protocols. We can also have a rule reference, a service tag. A service tag is a way to group together IP address prefixes. And we can also assign a priority. The priority value is relative to other rules within the same set. So that if you've got two rules, one with a priority of 100 and a second with a priority of 105, rule 100 gets checked first. And if there's not a match within that rule, it continues down the list with rule processing. But once there is a match, rule processing stops. So you can associate network security groups with the virtual machine network interface or network adapter, or on a more broad sense, you could base it on a subnet. So you can associate the NSG with the subnet, given that all of the VMs deployed in that subnet have the same inbound and outbound network traffic requirements. To manage the network security group, you can use the Azure portal. You can use PowerShell commandlets such as new-az network security group, get dash az network security group to list them and remove dash az network security group at the cli level you could use syntax such as az network nsg create az network nsg list to list any network security groups and you can remove them using az network nsg delete in this demo i'm going to use the portal to create a network security group otherwise referred to as an NSG. As you know, a network security group consists of inbound and outbound rules to either allow or deny specific types of traffic to a subnet or to a network interface. So to get started here in the portal, I'm going to click Create Resource, and I'm going to search for Network, and I'm going to choose Network Security Group, and then ultimately I'll click on Create. 
Now, in this example, I've already planned out ahead of time that I want the network security group to be applicable to Windows machines deployed on a given subnet that have the same network traffic flow needs. So I'm going to deploy this into a resource group that I'll select from the list. I'm going to call this NSG Windows NSG East. And I'm going to deploy this in a region. Specifically, I'm going to put this in Canada Central, and I'm going to click Next Tags. I don't want to add any tagging information to the network security group, so I'll click Next, Review and Create. After passing the validation, I will click Create. All we've done at this point is created a skeletal infrastructure of the network security group within which we now need to go and configure inbound or outbound security rules. There are some default inbound and outbound rules that we'll examine, but we need to create other ones to suit our needs. After a moment, the deployment is complete, so I'm going to click the Go to Resource button. So we're looking at the navigation bar, the properties for our network security group. And if I click on inbound security rules on the right, I can see the default rules, which I can toggle on and off by clicking the default rules button up at the top. So we've got a couple of rules that have a very high priority number. For example, we've got one rule to allow inbound VNet traffic and low balancer traffic, but everything else is denied. So if I scroll over to the right, under action, we can see the two allows and the deny. If I go to outbound security rules, in the same way, we can toggle the default rule display between on and off by clicking the default rules button at the top. So for outbound rules, we've got some high priority valued rule numbers to allow VNet traffic outbound. Internet traffic outbound is allowed by default and everything else is denied. So what I want to do then is go to inbound security rules and add one. So I'm going to click the add button. I want to make sure that we have a rule that allows traffic to port 3389 for remote desktop protocol. In other words, to remotely manage Windows virtual machines. So for the source, I could leave it on any or specify IP addresses. I could use a service tag, which is used to organize multiple IP ranges together, or an application security group, which groups VMs together. So if I were to choose IP addresses, I could specify the source IP address or CIDR range, whether it's IPv4 or IPv6 based. In this case, I'm going to leave the source on any, and the source port range will be an asterisk, which means any port number. The destination can be any or specific IP addresses or CIDR ranges, or it could be a virtual network, or it could be an application security group. So in any case, what I'm going to do here is leave it on any, and the destination port range here will be 3389. I want to allow traffic from any managing station to any host on the subnet that is listening on port 3389. So I'll just leave protocol on any, the action is allow, and the priority value here, I'll leave it 100, and finally, the name, I'm going to call this allow inbound RDP, and I'm going to click add. So we're adding this rule to our network security group. Because it's got a priority value of 100, that means when rules are checked for incoming traffic, the one with priority 100 will be checked before the rules in the 65,000 series. And if there's a match with rule 100, then no further rule processing occurs. So now that we've done that, we can see that the rule is listed for inbound. We can also do the same type of thing for outbound security rules. But the network security group is useless unless it's associated with something, such as a subnet or a network interface. So I could go to network interfaces, I could click associate, and I could select one or more network interfaces to associate the network security group with. But I don't want to do that. Instead, I'm going to do it at the subnet level where I've got multiple Windows VMs deployed. So I'm going to go and click on subnets. And then on the right, I'm going to click the associate button. And from here, I start by selecting a virtual network, which I will do, within which I can then choose a subnet, which I will also do. And I'll click OK. So I'm selecting VNet1, subnet1. That's now been set as the association. So if I were, for example, to navigate to my virtual networks view, I'll do that in the left-hand navigator, and look at it from that perspective. So let's open up VNet1. Within VNet1, I'm interested in looking at its subnets. 
And then within the subnets, I'm interested in subnet one. If I click on that to open it up from this perspective, we'll see that the network security group, Windows NSG East, has been associated with it. It shows up from here. So you can view it or set it from here or from the network security group level. The CLI can be used to create and manage network security groups. To get started here in the CLI, which I'm going to run within Cloud Shell on the portal, I'm going to create a network security group using the AZ Network NSG Create syntax. I'm going to need to specify dash G and give it the name of a resource group I want this network security group deployed into, and I have to give a name to it with dash N. I'm going to call this one app3 underscore firewall underscore rules. So I'm going to press enter to build the network security group. Now, all I'm doing is building the network security group. We still have to add rules to it to control traffic flow, to allow or deny in or outbound traffic. So I'm going to clear the screen with CLS, and now I'm going to run AZ network NSG list, and I'll press enter just to list network security groups. And what we could actually do, let's just clear the screen again and use the up arrow key to bring up that command, but I'm going to run dash dash query space open and close square bracket dot name. So we only show the name property for the collection of network security groups. That's easier to look at. And we can see here app three underscore firewall underscore rules. So we know it exists. The next thing we want to do is create a rule within that network security group. Now think about a rule within a network security group. You have to define a name. It's got to have a priority value, perhaps source and destination IP addresses or port numbers. There's a lot of detail. So to accomplish that, I'm going to use the AZ network NSG rule create syntax. So I have to first point to the network security group. So dash G, I'll give it the resource group affiliation, dash dash NSG dot name. Well, it's what we just created. App three underscore firewall underscore rules. And then I have to give a name to the rule I'm creating, dash N. I'm going to call it rule one. Dash dash priority is going to be 500. Remember that rules are executed based on the priority. So a rule with 400 would get checked before a rule with the priority of 500. So make sure you keep that in mind when you're building these rule sets. Then I'm going to use dash dash source dash address dash prefixes. And I'm going to specify a specific IP address prefix that I want to allow traffic from. And then a destination port. So dash dash Destination dash port ranges is going to be, in this case, both ports 80 as well as 443. So I just separate those with a space. Dash dash destination dash address dash prefixes. Could be any destination address. So in single quotes, I'll put in asterisk. Now remember that within a security rule, you can either allow traffic or you can deny it. I have to tell it that here. So dash dash access has a value of allow. In this case, the protocol dash dash protocol is going to be TCP for ports 80 and 443. And then a description with dash dash description. In this case, I'm adding a description in quotes that says allow inbound HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Let's press enter to create this rule within the security group. After a moment, it looks like we're good to go. I'm going to clear the screen. I'm going to run AZ network NSG rule list, make sure I have no typos in here. And I'm going to specify dash G resource group one, RG one, dash dash NSG dash name. I want to look at the rules within my network security group called app three underscore firewall underscore rules. And when I press enter, we'll see that we've got our rule that was created here. We can see the source IP address prefix that we had specified the source port range, the direction, which is inbound, the port numbers up above here, 80 and 443. And if I scroll up just a little bit more, we can also see some of the other details like the description to allow inbound HTTP and HTTPS traffic. And let's check this in the portal too. Let's minimize the cloud shell. And why don't we go, let's say I'm going to follow the home link up at the top here in the portal and click on all resources. And I'm going to filter the resource type here. So I only look at network security groups. I will deselect select all. And down in the ends, I'm going to choose network security group. I'll click outside of it. 
and now it's filtered for network security groups. There's app three underscore firewall underscore rules in the list. I'm going to select it and I want to check the inbound security rules. So I'll click inbound security rules and there's rule one. Let's just click on it so we can kind of open it up and see some details. So rule one here with our source IP address and everything's filled out in accordance with what we specified on the command line in the CLI. In this demonstration, I'm going to use PowerShell to build a network security group. And within that, I'm going to define a rule so that we can control traffic flow. Specifically, I'm going to build a rule that will allow RDP traffic to Windows host remote desktop protocol. So I've launched Cloud Shell here in the portal. The first thing I'm going to do, I don't have to do it this way, but sometimes when you're working with longer commands and, and parameters and values in PowerShell, it's easier to store things in variables. So the first thing I'm going to do here is build a variable called $RDP underscore allow underscore rule. That's the name of my variable. And what I want to store in that variable, so after the equal sign, I've got new dash AZ network security rule config dash name. I want to call my rule allow dash inbound dash RDP dash source port range. It's an asterisk. So any port dash protocol will be TCP dash source address prefix. I'm going to use the reserved keyword of internet. I want to allow inbound RDP traffic to VMs running in Azure sourced from the internet dash access is either allow or deny here. I want to allow the traffic dash priority. I'm going to give this rule a priority value of 110. Bearing in mind that the priority values used to determine the order in which rules within the NSG are processed. So rule 110 is checked before rule 111. The direction here with dash direction, I will specify as inbound. I don't want an outbound rule in this case, just inbound RDP traffic. Dash destination port range. Because we're talking about remote desktop protocol RDP, the port number there will be 3389. And the dash destination address prefix, I'm going to use a wildcard symbol in the form of an asterisk. So any destination address. So I'm going to press enter to create that variable. And that's all we've done is created a variable. Nothing's been done with the network security group or anything like that. So in order to build a network security group, we have to use the new dash AZ network security group PowerShell commandlet. I'm going to use dash name and I'm going to call this windows dash common dash NSG. Then I can add one or more security rules. We've only got one variable. So dash security rules, the value of that parameter will be our variable up above dollar sign RDP underscore allow underscore rule. Now I have to build this network security group and deploy it into a resource group. So dash resource group name is RG one have to specify a location. So dash location in this example will be Canada East. Let's go ahead and press enter to create that network security group along with the rule within it. Next thing I'll do is run get dash AZ network security group and maybe we'll pipe that to select and tell it we only want to see the names of the security groups. Here's the one we've just created windows underscore or rather windows dash common dash NSG. I'm going to minimize cloud shell and I'm just going to refresh my all resources view in the background, which is filtered currently for only network security groups. And just give it a moment to update. And after a moment of waiting and clicking refresh, I now see our windows dash common dash NSG network security group. Let's click on it and go to the inbound rules just to check out our work. There's rule 110 to allow inbound RDP that we specified on the PowerShell command line. A network security group or NSG is a collection of security rules that allow or deny network traffic. And you can associate a network security group with a subnet or with a network interface or both. So let's take a look at what we can do to troubleshoot security rules that may or may not be in effect within a given network security group. So what we're going to do here in the portal is click on an existing virtual machine that's currently up and running. Now, one of the things you can do in a virtual machine is scroll down under settings and click networking. When you open the networking blade, you'll be able to see at the top any network interfaces associated 
with that virtual machine. In this case, it's only one. And we'll also be able to see the VNet and subnet association for the virtual machine. That's important because we're talking about network security groups. And as we know, we could have a network security group associated with the network interface as well as with the subnet. Now, interestingly, if we look down below, we can see inbound and outbound rules. Where's this coming from? We wouldn't see anything here if there were no security groups, network security groups associated with the subnet or the network interface for this VM. So there must be something coming from somewhere. Well, we can see it right down below here. We can see there's a network security group called Windows NSG East that's attached to subnet one. And down below, we can see the inbound port rules. Of course, we could view the outbound port rules as well. If I scroll down further though on this screen, I can also see that we have another network security group attached to the network interface for this VM. And we can see its rules listed down below. So notice, for example, that we've got rule 100, priority value of 100, in both network security groups at the subnet level at the top here, and also at the network interface level down below. Well, the way that it works is that the priority value, of course, determines which rules get read before others. So a rule with a priority of 100 gets read before a rule with a priority of 65,000. But what about in this case where we've got two rule 100s? Well, Azure is going to process all of the rules in the subnet associated network security group first, then it's going to process all of the rules in the network interface associated network security group. So what's interesting here is that we would end up with allowing inbound RDP being checked first. If that's the type of traffic coming in, then rule processing stops. Otherwise, if that's not the type of traffic, it will take a look to see if inbound HTTP traffic destined for port 443 is what type of traffic is coming in. And if so, we would have a rule match and that would be the one that would be used. Now, when you scroll up to the top here, you can also click on effective security rules. In order for this to give us a display, we need to make sure the virtual machine is up and running. Otherwise, you'll get a message that tells you it needs to be started. So we can see the associated NSGs here, and we already know this, at the network interface level and at the subnet level, notice that they are both links, so we can click on them if we need to go into them specifically. And down below, of course, we can see the inbound rules for our security groups, both at the interface and at the subnet level. It's just presented in a bit of a different manner. But this is going to be important when you're troubleshooting why you can or perhaps cannot make certain types of network connections to services in Azure. The security rule troubleshooting can be accomplished by understanding how network security groups work, what they can be associated with, and how to get to this screen where we can view the effective security rules. Azure Firewall is a managed service in the Azure environment. This means that we don't have to set up any underlying virtual machines or network equipment. We basically fill in the blanks, whether we configure it using the portal, PowerShell, or the CLI, to protect our resources from certain types of network traffic. So it is a firewall. It's considered a stateful firewall. A stateful firewall means that instead of looking at each individual packet transmission as being separate, it has the ability to track sessions. So that if we've got an inbound session that requires access to a certain port number, the outbound traffic will automatically be allowed. So it's a stateful firewall solution. Azure Firewall has a static public IP address and it controls traffic flow just like a network security group does, but it has additional capabilities. It can also be configured to use threat intelligence to alert on and then deny suspicious traffic. Now, there are a couple of different kinds of rules that you can configure within Azure Firewall, one of which are network rules. So rules based on protocols such as TCP, UDP, ICMP, or you could specify any. You can specify source and destination IP addresses, port numbers that identify a service. So this would be useful, for example, to allow communication between subnets. And you can specify whether the traffic that matches the condition is either allowed or denied. So this is similar to a network security group or an NSG, but it's different in that 
Azure Firewall has more than just network rules. It's got application rule support as well. This means we might configure outbound connectivity rules and specify fully qualified domain names or FQDNs. So imagine, for example, we would use wildcards. So we could specify that we want to allow or deny, depending on how we configure the application rule, access to a certain domain, such as asterisk.domain.com. And we can even specify a protocol that would be used like HTTP or HTTPS on port 443. So you can allow or deny this. So this is going deeper when it comes to packet inspection. This is going deeper than just looking at the packet headers, like a layer four firewall would do, like network security groups, looking at IP addresses and port numbers. That goes up to layer four in the OSI model. This goes up to layer seven, where we can actually look at the payload inside the transmission. We're looking at specific FQDNs. Azure Firewall also lets you work with Source Network Address Translation, or SNAT. This means that outgoing traffic that goes out of the network will assume the public IP address of the Azure Firewall. You can also enable Destination Network Address Translation, or DNAT, which means that you can translate public IP address and port numbers to private IP address and port numbers internally to allow access to internal services while really protecting and hiding their identity. So we can do that. When you deploy Azure Firewall, you deploy it into a VNet that has a subnet named Azure Firewall subnet. So if you don't have that subnet created, you need to first create that subnet with that name. Azure Firewall subnet is all one string, no spaces between any of the words. So Azure Firewall NAT rules then would look something like this screenshot, where we can see we've got a name here, incoming HTTP is what I've specified. The protocol in this case is TCP, and I've got a destination address. Well, what would that be? That's the public IP address of the Azure Firewall. Then we've got a destination port number here of 80 and a translated address in this case, 10.1.1.1. So what we've got here is a firewall NAT rule that is mapping an external or public facing IP address to an internal IP address and port number because we have a translated port as well. So this is DNAT, Destination Network Address Translation. The last consideration is that the subnet traffic needs to be routed to Azure Firewall. Think of Azure Firewall as being a firewall appliance that you want to route traffic through for inspection. So Azure Firewall then can have up to 100 public IP addresses if you want to make numerous internal resources visible to the outside world. We know that we can have app rules that control outbound subnet access to fully qualified domain names. We know we can have network rules based on IP addresses and port numbers. The key is to make sure that subnet traffic is routed by creating a route table rule. Azure Firewall is a managed service, which means you don't have to manually deploy virtual machines or deploy firewall appliances. And it's considered a layer seven type of firewall appliance because it can look at the payload in the packet. So beyond just the packet headers to make a decision as to whether traffic should be allowed or not. So to get started with deploying Azure Firewall, the first thing I have to think about is the virtual network or the VNet that I'm going to deploy it into. So here in the portal, let's go to the virtual networks view. Now, the reason we're doing this, and I'm gonna click on VNet one, is because we need to create a subnet with a specific name in the VNet first. So I'm gonna to go to my list of subnets here. So in VNet one, I've got two subnets. Subnet 1 and Subnet 2. I'm going to click the Add Subnet button up here. So I need to create a new subnet here that's called Azure Firewall Subnet. Essentially, it needs to be deployed on its own subnet. So I'm going to go ahead and give it an appropriate IP address range here. In this case, it's going to be 10.0.3.0 slash 24. So I can see what the current subnet address ranges are here in the background for the existing ones. And that's all I'm going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And after a moment, it will have created our Azure Firewall subnet. Now that that's done, we can deploy the actual Azure Firewall. 
So to do that, I'm just going to go home and I'll choose create a resource, go to search for firewall, and I'm going to click firewall and then I'll click create. I'm going to deploy this into a resource group called RG1 and I'm going to call this FW East 1. And down below, I'm going to select the appropriate Azure location or region. In this case, I'm going to choose Canada Central. Now I can create a new virtual network. Well, I don't want to do that. I want to use an existing one. So from the drop down list, I'm going to choose VNet1. Now, if we didn't have our Azure Firewall subnet, then we would get a message here stating that fact. So we've already done it, so we don't get the message. That's good. Then we can either choose an existing public IP address resource that we want to assign to the Azure Firewall. It needs a static public IP, or we can add a new one. So I'm going to click Add New. And I'm going to call it FW East One Pub IP. Notice here it's going to be a static assignment and we can't change it otherwise. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And that's all I'm going to do in terms of configuring this Azure firewall. There's a preview option down below for forced tunneling if you want to have the firewall management traffic on a different subnet for isolation purposes. I'm not going to do that, so I'll leave that disabled. I'll just click Next Tags. I'm not going to add any tag items here. I'll click Next, Review and Create. Once it passes the validation, I will click Create. And after a moment, our firewall will be in the midst of being deployed. It says your deployment is underway. So now we can see the deployment is complete. So I'm going to click Go to Resource. That's going to take us into the properties of our firewall. And in the overview blade, I can see that we've got an association with a public IP address resource. We specified that when we created it, but it's also got a private IP, which I'm going to copy to the clipboard for now, because we're going to add a route for any subnets that we want this firewall to manage traffic for. So I've copied that private IP address. Now within a firewall, an Azure firewall deployment, you can build a number of different types of rules. So I'm going to click on rules over here on the left. You can add NAT rules, such as to map a public IP address and port to an internal IP address and port to make an internal service visible to the outside while protecting its true identity. You can also create network rules, which is very similar to working with a network security group, dealing with things like source and destination IP addresses and port numbers. And you can also work with application level rules, which look at things like fully qualified domain names. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to home by clicking the home link in the upper left, and I'm going to navigate to my virtual networks view here in the portal. I'm going to open up VNet1, and I'm going to click on the subnets blade for VNet1, where I've got a subnet called subnet1. I've got a number of virtual machines deployed in subnet1, and I want any traffic that is destined, for example, to the internet to first go through our Azure Firewall. So I'm going to click on Subnet 1. And what I'm interested in looking at with Subnet 1 is whether or not it's associated with the route table. Currently, it says none. Okay, well, I want to change that. So what I'm going to do then is go home. I'm going to create a resource. Of course, what I want to create here is a route table object. So I'm going to choose route table. I'm going to choose create. I'm going to call it RT1. I'm going to put it in a resource group called RG1. And let's say the location here will be in Canada Central. And I'm going to choose Create. We need to make sure it's associated with our subnet. And we need to make sure it's got a route table entry. So I'm going to go to the All Resources view. And I'm going to filter, let's say here, for RT. I'll click Refresh. And there's our route table, RT1. I'm going to click on it. And what I want to do is make sure that it's associated with subnet one. So I'm going to click on subnets within the route table. I'm going to click the associate button. And I'm going to choose VNet one from the virtual network dropdown. And from the subnet dropdown, I will choose subnet one. Okay, that part's good. We've associated our routing table with subnet one, but we don't have any routes in it yet to route traffic through the firewall appliance, the Azure firewall. So to do that, I'll click routes. And I'm going to click the Add button. The road name here I'm going to add is going to be for Firewall East 1, FW East 1. And for the address prefix, I'm going to put in 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0. In IPv4, that's the default 
route. And the next hop type I'm going to set here as a virtual appliance. And remember earlier, I copied the private IP address of the Azure firewall. Well, that's what I'm going to paste here in the next hop address. And now I'm going to click OK. So after a moment, the route will show up in our list. We can just click on something else and go back to routes and we'll see that it's listed there. So there it is. FW East 1 is the name of it. And we can see the address prefix, the default route. And ultimately, we can see the next hop is our Azure Firewall private IP. So now it's ready to go. The only thing we would now do is configure application rules or network rules or NAT rules within Azure Firewall to control traffic flow. In this demonstration, I'm going to use the portal to configure application rules within an Azure Firewall deployment. So here in the portal, I'm already in the All Resources view, and I've already filtered it here for type of objects of firewall only. So we can see we've got an Azure Firewall object deployed. It's called FW East 1. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it to open it up. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is click on Rules, because this is where we can create either NAT rules, network rules, or application rules. Application rules are what make Azure Firewall a layer seven type of firewall, meaning it's referencing layer seven of the OSI model, the application layer. That means it can look at more than just packet headers, which would include things like IP addresses or port numbers and so on. It can look at the payload, the detail in the packet to make a decision to allow or not allow the traffic. So I'm going to go to application rule collection and I'm going to click add application rule collection. What I'm going to call this is social media blocking. And I can put in a priority value here. I'll put in a value, let's say of 105. Now these priority values are used relative to other rule collections to determine which one gets checked first. So 105 would get checked before 106. I can determine if I want to allow or deny. In this case, I'm going to choose deny. And down at the very bottom, I'm going to put in a target FQDN, fully qualified domain name. So here, maybe I'll put in block Facebook, just as an example. For the source type, I can specify IP addresses. So I could specify an asterisk here for any IP address. For the port, I'll put in HTTPS colon 443. And for the target FQDN, I'll put in asterisk.facebook.com. So I want to deny any outbound access to any fully qualified domain names that have a suffix of .facebook.com on HTTPS port 443 from any source. So I'm going to go ahead and click add to add that application rule. So we can see our application rule collection called social media blocking. Now, if you happen to have any network rules, when outbound traffic goes through the firewall, these rules are applied in priority order first, and then the application rule collection is checked and they're applied in priority order. Again, priority 105 would get checked before 106. And if there's a match, rule processing stops. Now, when you work with Azure Firewall, it's important if you look at the overview blade that you take note of the private IP address, in this case, 10.0.3.4. That's going to be important because if we take a look at the virtual networks in our Azure environment, we'll see that we've already got an association configured between a subnet and Azure Firewall. So I'm going to go to the subnets here and I'm going to open up a subnet called subnet1. The association is indirect. We've got a route table called RT1 associated with subnet1. Okay, so what exactly is the association? Let's go back to all resources. Let's make sure we add a type here of route table so we can see those. Let's open up RT1. RT1, if we look at the subnet association blade, so subnets, we can see subnet1 is associated. And if we look at the routes within RT1, we can see that the default route for IPv4, that would be 0.0.0.0 slash .0, 0, is being forwarded through the private IP address of our Azure Firewall.
In this demonstration, I'm going to use the portal to configure network rules within Azure Firewall. Here in the portal, I've got a filtered list with a couple of different types of resources here. We can see Firewall is selected, Route Table is selected, and Virtual Network is selected. Well, we see that we've got a Firewall object here called FW East 1. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it to open it up. Then I'm going to click on Rules over on the left. We're talking about building a network rule to allow or deny certain types of network traffic inbound or outbound. So I'm going to go to Network Rule Collection, and underneath that, I'll click the link named Add Network Rule Collection. So the rule collection here, I'm going to call Allowed Outbound Traffic. I'm going to give it a priority value, let's say of 110. And I'm going to leave it on Allow as opposed to Deny. And for this, I'm going to call this one public DNS. I'm going to specify the protocol or I can select any. And for the source IP address, I'm going to specify, let's say, one of my subnets here in Azure. So VMs on a subnet, let's say 10.0.1.0 slash 24. The destination type, let's say, is going to be a public DNS server out on the internet. And the port that that would use, of course, is port 53 for DNS queries. So with this rule, I am allowing outbound traffic to query a public DNS server. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and click Add. And after a moment, if we click Refresh, we'll see that our network rule collection has been added here. Now, when you do have a network rule collection and an application rule collection, the network rule collection is checked first to see if there's a match with the traffic. Now I'm going to go back to the All Resources view because I'm going to go into my route table called RT1 to verify that it's associated with the subnet that has a route to Azure Firewall. So if I look at the subnet association for my route table RT1, it's associated with a subnet called subnet1. And there is a route here for the default route 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0. And the next hop is the private IP address of our Azure Firewall appliance, in this case, 10.0.3.4. Let's go back to our firewall and take a look at that. That is the private IP. So that means that any virtual machines in that subnet, subnet one, will be sending their outbound traffic first through Azure Firewall for inspection. Azure Firewall allows you to configure network address translation or NAT rules. Here in the portal, I'm in the All Resources view, and I've filtered out for a number of types of resources in this view, including firewalls. So we can see that we've got one firewall called FW East 1. So I'm going to click on that Azure Firewall. Now within that, I'm going to click on Rules to open up the Rules Blade, and we see that we have three types of rules. NAT Rule Collection, which we're going to focus on here, Network Rule Collections, so in this case, looking at IP addresses and port numbers and application rule collections, which can look a little bit deeper than that at things like DNS names in a request. So I'm going to go to NAT rule collection and I'm going to click add NAT rule collection. Let's say I've got an internal web server that only has a private IP address, but I want it to be visible to the internet, but I don't want to expose its true address. So I can configure a NAT rule to do that. So I'm going to create an at rule here called expose private service to public. And the priority for this rule collection, let's say, will be 100. Now, if we've got multiple rule collections, then the priority is used to determine which one is checked first. So the not rule collection with a priority of 100 would be checked before a NAT rule collection in this firewall with the priority of 101. So 100 gets checked first. Okay, let's build this rule. So I'm going to call this web app one. For the protocol, I'm going to select TCP. Now the source IP address, I'm going to leave as any. So coming from the internet anywhere. But the destination IP address, this is the public IP address of my Azure firewall. Now, I can have multiple public IP addresses associated with an Azure Firewall, so I can publish multiple services. 
Now, I've opened up another tab at the top here so we could leave our NAT rule as it was in the midst of being created and take a look at our firewall overview blade where we can see the public IP address object. I can click on that. It's a link. And from there, I can actually see the public IP address of the Azure firewall. So I'm going to go back to my NAT rule collection, and that's what I'm going to put in destination address port 80. So basically what I'm setting up here is I want Azure Firewall to be listening on port 80 on its public IP address, and I want to translate that to an internal IP address and port number. So let's say I've got an internal web server at 10.0.1.10, and it's listening on port 80. AD, it could be 443, depending on whether it's got an HTTPS binding. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and click Add to add that NAT rule collection. I'll just click Refresh, and it should show up after a moment. Now, there's an interesting note down below here. It says that when a DNAT or a dynamic NAT rule is matched, which is what we've created, an implicit or it's automatically implied that it's done, corresponding network rule to allow the translated traffic is added. So I don't have to add a network rule to allow traffic to port 80 on that internal host. It's implied by me creating this NAT rule. Azure Bastion, you can think of as being a platform as a service or a PaaS solution in Azure that provides the service of a jump box. A jump box means that you've got a host with a network connection to a public network and a network connection to a private network. By allowing incoming management sessions to the public network interface, after that's been allowed, you can use the Bastion host as a launching pad to, from there, connect to and remotely manage internal hosts using their private network address. So this allows SSH management of Linux hosts, RDP management of Linux hosts without publishing the public IP addresses of network interfaces for those hosts. They're protected. They're only on the private network. The Bastion host is what has the public network address. So this is a platform as a service solution and it limits virtual machine visibility on a public network while still allowing remote management from the public network. So pictured on the screen, we can see the flow would go like this. We've got a user on the left that would be authenticated to the Azure portal. Within the portal, the user can elect to make a connection to a specific virtual machine, and they can select to use Azure Bastion. When they do that, they in turn will have a connection to manage the internal hosts, whether it be Linux or Windows, via the private IP address of those VMs. So this way, we are not exposing those virtual machines to a public network. And there are a lot of security problems with exposing Linux hosts directly to a wide open network like the internet on port 22 for SSH management, and certainly for Windows hosts on port 3389 for RDP management. When you deploy Azure VMs, you're probably going to have a need to remotely manage them, such as using RDP to manage Windows or using SSH to remotely manage Linux. But what you probably don't want to do is have a public IP address for each and every virtual machine. Not only is that a lot of public IP addresses that you're using or consuming and paying for in Azure, but it also gives a public endpoint that potentially could be used by malicious users get into those VMs. So instead, we need an intermediary, like a jump box that has a connection to both the public internet to allow remote management coming in and the private network where the VMs are deployed. And we can do that in Azure using Azure Bastion. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into my virtual networks view. And I'm going to go into a virtual network where I'm going to deploy the Azure Bastion configuration called VNet1. And I'm going to go look at the subnets. Now, I've got a number of subnets already created here in this VNet, but what I need to create before I can deploy Azure Bastion is I need a subnet called Azure Bastion subnet, all one word, all together. So it would look kind of like this. I'm going to type in the name Azure Bastion subnet, and it needs to have a slash 27 CIDR block for 27 bits in the subnet mask. So I'm going to go ahead and specify 10.0.4.0 slash 
27, and then I'm going to click OK. So after a moment, if I click Refresh, uh, there it is. I can see the Azure Bastion subnet. We're ready to go. So to build the Azure Bastion deployment, I'm going to go to the Home link in the upper left. I'll click Create a Resource. I'll search for Bastion, and I'll choose Bastion, and I'll click Create. First thing I need to do, as usual, is deploy it in a resource group. So I'm going to select an existing resource group. I'm going to call this Bastion 1. I'm going to deploy it, let's say in this case, because my VMs and my physical location is near Canada Central. I'll choose that region. And then from the virtual network list, I'll choose VNet 1. And it picked up our Azure Bastion subnet. Otherwise, we'd get an error here. We'd have to correct that problem before proceeding, but we're good to go here. I'm going to let it create a new public IP address, but I'm going to change the name of it. I'm going to call it Bastion 1 Pub IP 1. And I'll click Next for tagging. I'm not going to add any tags. And I'll click Next, Review and Create. It's going to check that my selections make sense. So the validation has passed. And so to create this, I will click the Create button. And we can see the deployment is currently underway. So the deployment is now complete, so I'm going to click the Go to Resource button. So we can now see that it was provisioned successfully. It's got a public IP address resource and a public DNS name. So how is this actually used? Here's what happens. Let's go back to the home link in the upper left and let's go to the virtual machines view. So let's say I want to manage a virtual machine. Here I've got a Windows Server virtual machine that's up and running. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it to open up its navigation bar, its properties. And I'm going to go down to Connect. Now we would normally go here so we could make an RDP or SSH if it were Linux type of connection. But in this case, I can choose Bastion. And it says requesting Bastion data and we can connect with the Bastion host. So at this point, I would specify the credentials for the virtual machine. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And at this point, I'll click the Connect button. So what it's doing is opening up another web browser window where I will have remote management capabilities for that virtual machine. The great thing about this is that this Windows VM that I'm hosting in Azure, it wouldn't need a public IP address because the Bastion host is what handles that. So let's go back into the portal for a second. Uh, let's go back to home. Let's go to all resources. Because what I want to do is go into our Bastion configuration. And if we take a look at sessions, we can see that we've got a session identifier listed here. We can see the start time of the session. We can see the target host name here, the resource group, the username, and the target IP address, which in this case is the private IP address of that Windows VM. It shouldn't have a public IP address if we're using Bastion, at least not for management purposes. And we can see the protocol that was used to make that connection is RDP. So in this course, we've examined how to secure Azure networks through the use of network security groups, Azure Firewall, and Azure Bastion. We did this by exploring how network security groups, or NSGs, and application security groups are used to control traffic flow. We looked at how to manage network security groups using the portal, CLI, and PowerShell. We looked at how to troubleshoot security rules and how security problems can be addressed by using Azure Firewall. We looked at how to deploy an Azure Firewall resource and how to configure Azure Firewall application, network, and NAT rules. We looked at the security problems that are addressed by Azure Bastion. And then finally, we looked at how to deploy and manage Azure Bastion. In our next course, We'll move on to explore how to deploy and manage Azure virtual machines using Windows and Linux, including SSH public key authentication, VM resizing, and disk encryption. Before deploying virtual machines or VMs in an Azure environment, you have to plan how they will be used. Not only do you want to make sure you have the correct sizing or horsepower so you optimize the performance of your workloads, but you also want to make sure you don't have too much horsepower so that you can save on costs. So virtual machines or VMs then provide the underlying compute horsepower 
for most Azure services. Now, if it's a managed service in Azure, that means Microsoft takes care of the underlying config, such as for VMs. But you can also deploy your own infrastructure as a service, or IaaS VMs, where you're responsible for the configuration of that VM, including applying updates to it. You also have an option when you're deploying VMs in Azure of dedicated hosting. What this means is that you are asking that Microsoft put aside a physical hypervisor server that you can deploy your VMs on. So there wouldn't be VMs on that physical host from any other Azure customers, only for you. And so you can deploy new VMs or you can even have existing VMs moved to that dedicated host, as long as it's in the same region as the dedicated host. So it's in a physical data center and it, you can also group dedicated hosts, if you have more than one of them, into what are called host groups. Now you might need to do this for regulatory compliance to ensure you're not sharing a physical hypervisor with other cloud tenants. When you deploy Azure VMs, you have to think about the operating system image, whether it's gonna be Windows or Linux based, and you might even have a custom image that's configured in a way that you need for your workloads, you might even have additional software installed. You must specify the resource group into which you will deploy the VM, now, resource groups are used to group Azure resources together that are related. They can be managed as a single entity. You can specify the location the VM will be deployed into. So whether it's parts of the US or Canada or Europe and so on. You can also configure the VM size, which determines the horsepower, the number of vCPUs, the amount of RAM, the number of data disks that you can attach to the VM, the disk IOPS, the input output operations per second. So more IOPS means better disk throughput. You can also determine whether you want high availability set for your virtual machine, perhaps by replicating it to an alternate or secondary region. You can also specify the user credentials, whether it's for Linux or for Windows. In the case of Windows, you would specify a username and a password, and then you can remotely manage that Windows VM instance in Azure over RDP where you're ultimately connecting to it over port 3389. In a Linux case, you would be using either password-based authentication or the default SSH public key-based, where you need a key pair, and the public key is stored in Azure, and the private key, which is related, is stored by you, the user. So, for example, on an on-premises system that you might use to SSH with public key authentication to your Linux VM running in Azure. Ultimately, you're connecting to port 22 for Secure Shell or SSH to administer that Linux VM remotely. With SSH public key authentication, it's considered to be more secure than just username and password. The reason is because username and password, both of those items constitute something you know. So they could be guessed or somehow figured out or derived. However, when we've got a key that's involved, a key file, we have to have that unique key and possess the private key file to try to authenticate to the server. So SSH public key authentication is automatically enabled when you deploy a new Linux VM in Azure, although you can change it as you're deploying the VM or any point thereafter to username and password-based authentication if that's what you want to use. So the related key pair then, remember the public key is stored in Azure, the private is stored by you, the Linux user or administrator. The other consideration to think about when you're planning the use of VMs in Azure are the disks. Now certainly you're gonna have an operating system disk, but also you might have one or more data disks, depending on whether the VM sizing allows multiple data disks. So you can select from a number of performance options like standard HDD, that's hard disk drive. You would use that only for infrequently accessed data because hard disk drive technology or HDD is slower than solid state drives or SSDs. Standard SSD would be good for testing or non-critical usage. Premium SSD is for production and peak performance usage. So you get to pay more for premium SSD disks than standard SSD and certainly more than you would for standard HDD. And finally, you can also select from Ultra SSD for the highest based performance for intensive database workloads. But again, you're going to be paying more for it because it provides the most amount of disk IOPS or disk throughput. 
On the networking side, with a virtual machine, you can associate a network security group with either the subnet that the virtual machine is deployed into, or the network security group can be associated with the network interface attached to the VM. Either way, the network security group controls in and outbound traffic flow. It's a collection of security rules. You have to deploy your VM into a VNet subnet. You can have one or more interfaces depending on the sizing of the VM and how it will be used. For example, a firewall or router-based VM would have two or more network interfaces attached to it. You can optionally have a public IP address resource associated with your VM. Now, the idea with this is that it's publicly reachable, but for security reasons, you might not want your virtual machines to be reachable, certainly not for ports like RDP, port 3389 for remote management. Instead, you would use something like Azure Bastion through which access is allowed to remotely manage hosts. Finally, you can also enable load balancing for virtual machine workloads. So that client requests hit the load balancer and the load balancer can distribute those requests evenly to backend servers. The benefit is that you have better overall application performance and higher availability if you have a backend VM failure supporting that app. Virtual machines provide the underlying compute power for cloud services, and we have the option of using the portal to manually deploy an infrastructure as a service or IaaS VM, meaning that we are manually deploying it and we are responsible for configuring it and applying updates to the OS and so on. So let's deploy a Windows VM here in the portal. So to get started in the portal, I'm going to click create a resource. I could search for what I want to create. So for example, if I want to create a virtual machine, I could search for virtual machine and I could choose from a couple of options. But you can also browse through the compute category. If I click on compute, to the right of that, I see a number of variations of compute options, like virtual machine, which is what we're interested in. But then I see other options like SQL Server and reserved VM instances, where I pay up front for compute capacity at a discount, Kubernetes service for clustering containers, and so on. I'm going to click on virtual machine. The first thing I'll do is specify the resource group that I want to deploy this into. I could select an existing one, of course, I could also create a new one, which is normally the case when we're deploying Azure resources. I have to come up with a name which needs to adhere to organizational naming standards. I'm going to call this WinServe 2019-1. I'm going to deploy this in a region geographically near where I'm going to be working. So maybe in this case, I'll choose Canada Central. Then I'm going to specify the image I want to use, the operating system virtual machine image. It's selected here for Ubuntu Server 18, but I don't want to use Linux. In this case, I'm going to go down and select Windows Server 2019 Data Center. But I'm not limited just to that list. I could browse all public and private images. So if I click that, I can see a lot of images listed here, and I can even filter them out. So for example, if I just want to look for Windows, then I could type in Windows and filter out the images for VMs based on the Windows platform. And there are plenty of variations here available. However, I'm going to close out of that and I'm just going to leave it at Windows Server 2019 Data Center Edition. I don't want to deploy an Azure Spot instance where an Azure Spot instance allows me to use extra compute capacity that's available in the Azure Cloud at a discount, but it's not guaranteed. I don't want to do that, but that would be applicable if I have, for example, periodic bursts in requirements, such as for batch workloads. That could be an idea to use that. Down below, I've got the sizing. So I've got one vCPU, 3.5 gig of memory available, but I could click change size depending on what my compute requirements are. If I suspect that the workload in the VM will require less or more horsepower, then I can select accordingly by choosing a VM size. So for example, I could go down and select four vCPUs and 14 gig of RAM by using one of the DS3 V2 variants. We can also see that the maximum disk IOPS value can also be increased as you go down the list for sizing. An increase in the disk IOPS value means you have an increase in disk throughput. And of course, you pay a premium as you ask for more underlying 
horsepower. But again, I'm just going to click the X. I'm okay with the default selection. For Windows here, I'm going to have to specify a Windows operating system username and password. So I'm going to go ahead and fill that in. And then I'm going to scroll down. It's going to allow port 3389 inbound. Now, I don't have to have any public inbound ports enabled because maybe I'm using some kind of a jump box configuration through which administrators can access the private IP of this Windows host. Or I could also use Azure Bastion to do that since that's what it's designed to do, to act as a jump box. But in this case, because it's just a test VM, I'm going to leave allow selected ports enabled for RDP port 3389. I don't already have a Windows Server license, although it does ask me for that at the bottom. This is BYOL, bring your own license, which can result in cost savings if you already have that type of OS licensing purchased. But I don't, so I'm going to click Next Disks. Now, I have to select the disk subsystem for this VM. So we've got the OS or the operating system disk type. It's set to premium SSD for solid state drive. Now, unless I don't need much disk IO performance at all, I could select something like standard HDD for hard disk drive, which is much slower using traditional moving parts types of hard disks, but I'm going to leave it on the default of premium SSD to optimize the performance. I can also specify if I want to enable encryption, but I can also enable that after the fact. As I scroll down, I can also create and attach a new data disk volume to this VM. If I've already got a managed disk out there created, then I can just attach it here. When you attach a disk, it's like plugging in a disk device into a physical server. It shows up in the OS. You must initialize it, partition it, and format it to use it as you see fit. But here I'm going to stick with just the OS. I'm going to click Next Networking down at the bottom. Now we have to determine which virtual network and subnet we want this virtual machine deployed into. So it's already suggested an existing VNet and subnet I have, VNet1, subnet1. It wants to create a new public IP address. That's fine. I'm going to let it do that. And I have options for the network security group at the network interface or the NIC level. I'm going to leave it just on basic. Now, if I were to choose none, it tells me that if you don't have a network security group associated with this network interface, then make sure you do for the subnet, in this case, subnet one, where the VM is deployed. Network security groups are essentially collections of firewall rules to control traffic flow into and out of either an interface or a subnet. I could choose advanced where I can go into the details of the network security group. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave that on basic for now. And down below, we could see that it wants to allow selected ports such as RDP 3389. Again, if you don't want to do it at the network interface level, but rather at the subnet level, select none. So I'm going to leave it at the basic level here. And I can change this after the fact. As we go further down, I get options that will depend on the VM sizing, such as whether accelerated networking is available. So that's not an option here. Whether I want to use load balancing, which I'm not going to do. So I'm going to click Next for management. Here we have a number of configuration settings. Notice that boot diagnostics is on by default for logging purposes. We can also turn on OS guest diagnostics if we want more detail. And then we can see the related storage account to store diagnostic information. As I scroll down, I can also enable or turn on system assigned managed identity. A managed identity is used when you've got resources like a VM that might have code running in them that need access to other Azure resources. So instead of building those credentials into your code, you can use system managed identities. I'm going to leave that off for now. I could always change that later. I can also schedule the shutdown of VMs. Maybe if I know I'm going to be using them during work hours, but not after, I can schedule their shutdown so they're not left running and thus not incurring costs. I can also enable backup. Again, all of these things can be configured after the fact. So I'm going to leave the default settings. I'll click Next, Advanced. I can also install virtual machine extensions, which really are software agents in the guest operating system of the VM to add enhanced capabilities, such as for logging purposes or running PowerShell desired state configuration and so on. So I'm not going to change anything else here about these options. I'm just going to go ahead and click Next. For tagging, I can add tag information. I'm not going to. And I can click Next for review and create. So it's going to run the final validation based on all of my selections. Looks good. The validation has passed. So I'm going to deploy this VM by clicking the Create button in the bottom left. 
We can see the deployment is currently underway and it's creating the virtual machine. It's creating the network interface and the network security group and the public IP address resource. All of these resources are being created automatically. And now we can see the deployment is complete. So I'm going to click go to resource so we can explore some of the properties of the VM. So in the overview blade, we can see that the virtual machine is running. We can see the resource group it's been deployed into. Other information provided in the overview blade includes the location. We can see the operating system and the size. We can also see the public and private IP addresses and also the network affiliation in terms of the VNet and subnet for this VM. As I scroll down, under settings, if I were to click on networking, this is where I would see the network interface or interfaces, in this case, there's only one, for this VM. Again, I can see the network, the public and private IP addresses, and also any applicable inbound and outbound port rules from my network security groups. Also, if I were to click on disks in the left-hand navigator to open up the disks blade, I'll see how many disks are associated with this virtual machine. We've only got one for the operating system. It shows me the size and I can see that encryption is not enabled. However, I do have a button here to add data disks. We can also click on size in the left hand navigator to both view the current size of the VM and also change it if we need more or less underlying horsepower, which of course affects the cost of running the VM as well. So we've got a lot of things available here in our VM, but at this point, we've got a running virtual machine. If I were to go, let's say, into my virtual machines view, so I'm going to click on the left-hand navigator, and I'm going to go down and click on virtual machines. Of course, we'll see the VM listed here, and we can see the status of it is that it's running. When we no longer need that virtual machine to be running, then we can select it and choose stop. It's important to stop resources or remove them when you no longer need them to save on charges in Azure. In this demonstration, I'm going to use PowerShell to create a new Windows virtual machine in the Azure cloud. There are a bunch of different ways this can be done in terms of the specific commandlets that get used. In this case, I'm running the PowerShell ISC, the integrated scripting environment, on my on-premises system, and I've already got a script open. Now, down below in the PowerShell command window, I've already run connect-az account to authenticate to Azure. So let's start on line one, where I'm establishing a variable called dollar sign creds. The creds variable is going to store the result of running get-credential. So that's going to prompt whoever runs this script for a username and password, which will be used for the virtual machine operating system. The virtual machine is created in PowerShell starting on line three using the new dash AZVM PowerShell commandlet. Now, because there are so many parameters and values, a space and backtick symbol have been used to continue this visually across multiple lines. So the resource group name parameter has a value for the resource group we're deploying the VM into. The dash name parameter has a name for this VM. Dash location, we specify the region, in this case, Canada Central. Dash virtual network name, as well as dash subnet name for the VNet and subnet respectively that the VM will be deployed into. The security group name. So here we can have it build a new security group. The network security group, of course, controls in and outbound traffic. Next, dash public IP address name, and I'm specifying the name of the public IP address resource. You might not use that if you don't want this VM visible publicly. Dash image, where I'm specifying the specific OS image I want to use. So this is a standard public image based on Windows Server 2016 Data Center Edition. I want to make sure port 3389 is open for management. Now remember, you're opening port 3389 here with a public IP address. So you might consider not doing that in favor of using something like Azure Bastion as a jump box through which these virtual machines would be manageable from the internet. So if I didn't want to use those options, I could actually remove the public IP address and also the open ports. Well, technically we want port 3389 still open, just not from the internet. So by removing the public IP, this won't be directly accessible from the internet. Finally, I'm using dash credential 
as a parameter, and I'm passing it my dollar sign creds variable from above, where it will have prompted for a username and password. So I'm just going to go ahead and save this script, and I'm going to run it by clicking the Run Script button in the toolbar at the top of the ISC. I could also press F5 to run the script. So I'm prompted for the username and password. This is going to be for the Windows operating system running in the VM. So I'm going to go ahead and specify that and click OK. We could also do the same thing from Cloud Shell, which we can launch from the Azure portal. The only difference is that we wouldn't have to run connect-az account first to authenticate to Azure because we're already authenticated to the portal. So we're going to right-click and paste in those same commands, asking for the credentials, which I will enter. And then I'll press enter to actually create the virtual machine with the new dash azvm command line. And after a few moments, we'll see that the virtual machine was deployed. We can see that the provisioning state is that it succeeded. And if we minimize this, and go back, let's say, to home, and then let's say to virtual machines here in the portal, we'll see that we now have our WinServe 2016-1, that's the name of it, that is now listed in a state of running. In this demo, I'm going to use the cloud shell through the Azure portal. Specifically, I'm going to use CLI syntax to deploy a new Windows virtual machine. So the first thing I'd want to do is try to determine what the command might be. I can do that with az, let's say vm-h. So I already know I'm going to start with az followed by vm for virtual machine. The dash h is for help. So the next thing I'm going to see is the next subgrouping of commands that would follow az vm. And in the c's, I will see create. So from here, I might run az vm create and then a dash H to get further help on what the syntax might look like when I actually create the virtual machine. And we'll see a number of different examples. So I'm going to clear the screen, and I'm going to actually use the AZVM create to create a Windows-based VM. So I'll use the dash dash resource dash group parameter, specify the resource group this will be deployed into, dash dash name, and I'm going to give a name to this new VM, dash dash image. Here I want to use the Windows 2019 data center, so win 2019 data center image, dash dash admin dash username. I want to use the name of C Blackwell. And finally, dash dash admin dash password. I'll specify the password I want to use for that account. Now this is the username and the password for the Windows OS in the VM. I could specify other parameters, but this is enough for me to create basically a skeletal type of Windows Server 2019 VM in Azure. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead and press enter. After a moment, we'll see that the virtual machine was deployed. So it's called WinServe 2019-2. Why don't we go take a look at it in the portal? So I'm going to minimize this and I'm just going to refresh my virtual machines view. And indeed, we can see there it is, WinServe 2019-2 with the status of running. You can use the Azure portal to deploy a Linux virtual machine, which is what I'm going to do here. So in the portal, I'll start by clicking create a resource. Now I'm currently looking at the get started category on the left and on the right, I can see popular items like virtual machine images, including Windows Server 2016 data center, Ubuntu server, and then I see things like web apps, SQL databases, and so on. I could click on compute as a category, and on the right, I could then choose virtual machine. Now from here, we're focusing just on VM operating system images. Now when we select to create a VM, it's gonna start the wizard. And one of the things that we can do is select whether we wanna run Windows or Linux. The first thing is I'll apply this or deploy this VM to an existing resource group, and I'm going to give this a name. It's going to be called Ubuntu-Serve-SRV-1. Now, once I've done that, I'm going to scroll down and determine the region where I want this server deployed. And in my particular case, I want this one deployed in Central Canada. So I'm going to choose Canada Central. Um, for the image, it's got Ubuntu Server 18.04 selected. From the drop-down list, I could select other variations of Linux like Debian or Oracle Linux or CentOS or SUSE Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I'm going to leave it, though, in this case on Ubuntu. Now, if I don't see what I want from that list, I could click 
browse all public and private images. You might have a private customized image that you want to use to deploy this VM. Or if I just search up Ubuntu, I can also get a list of everything available here in the Azure Marketplace. So many variations on Ubuntu Linux, and it might even have additional software installed within these images. However, I'll click the X to close back out of that. I'm not going to use spot instances where we are using extra compute capacity available in Azure data centers at a cost discount. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave the default standard size here with two vCPUs and a gigabyte RAM, but I can also change the size if I feel that that's too much horsepower and I'm paying too much or it's not enough. So I could change that if I needed to based on the workload that will run in the VM. We can choose between SSH public key authentication or just username and password authentication. I don't already have a public key configuration, so I'm going to choose password and I'm going to specify a Linux username and password and I'll confirm that password. Then I'm going to scroll down and it's got allow selected ports enabled for SSH for remote management. I'll leave that there. I'll click next disks. Now we know we're going to have an operating system disk and I can change the disk type. However, I'm going to leave it on premium SSD for the best in disk performance. I'm not going to encrypt it. And down below, I do have the ability at this point in time while I'm creating the VM to add additional data disks. I could also do that after the fact later on. So I'm going to click next networking and I'm going to make sure I deploy this VM into a VNet and subnet of my choosing. I could also create a new public IP address so that this VM has a public IP and is publicly accessible. You want to be careful with that from a security perspective. If you're going to be running these VMs for a longer period of time, they should probably only have a private IP address. And the only way you would get to them perhaps is through Azure Bastion as a kind of jump box solution for remote management. I'm going to select none for NIC Network Security Group, which means that we're going to rely on a network security group essentially firewall rules, to be associated with, in this case, subnet one listed up above. And down below, I'm not going to put this behind a load balance solution. I could change that later. I'm going to click next for management. And I'm going to pretty much accept all of the defaults here for boot diagnostics, OS guest diagnostics. I'm not going to have a system managed identity created, which would be definitely important if you had, let's say, custom code running inside the VM and that code needed to talk to other Azure resources. It needs permissions to do that. And so system managed identities can handle that instead of you putting that credential set in the code itself. I'm not going to schedule auto shutdown. I'm not going to schedule backup. So I'm just going to go ahead and click next advanced. There are no extra virtual machine extensions that I'm going to add to this VM. There's really nothing else I'm going to change here. So I'll click next for tags. I'm not going to add any tags. I'll click next for review and create. It's going to check my selections, so it's running a validation. It's passed, so I'm going to deploy this VM by clicking Create. And we can see that the deployment is underway, and it's creating the various resources, such as the VM, the network interface, the public IP address resource, and so on. After a moment, the deployment is complete. I will click the Go to Resource button so that we can examine some of our newly deployed Linux VM's properties. So in the overview blade, we can see the resource group, the status is running, the location, the computer name, the operating system, the size. We can also see the public and private IP address information. Notice that it's added a tag called cost center with the value of YHZ. We didn't do that. So therefore, there must be a policy assignment in place here in Azure that's automatically appending default tags. If I scroll down in the navigation bar on the left, I can click on networking to look at the network config of this Linux VM. I can see we've got a network interface listed here. We can see the VNet and subnet it was deployed into. We also can see here the configuration or the value of the public IP address, the private IP address, and any inbound or outbound port rules. Now there are none now because we haven't associated a network security group with the VM yet or the subnet in which it was deployed. Network security groups control the traffic flow in and out of something like a network interface or a subnet, essentially a collection of firewall rules. I can also look at the disks blade by clicking disks on the left. 
Here we're going to see we've got an operating system disk applied to the VM, and we have the ability to click the Add Data Disk button to add additional data disks. We could click Size here to resize the VM, which means either reducing its underlying horsepower in terms of virtual CPUs, the amount of RAM, number of supported data disks, the disk IOPS input op operations per second. You can increase or decrease that depending on your workload requirements. So we've got a number of items available here in the properties of the VM. And if I click on my navigation bar on the left and go into my virtual machines view, we'll see that we now have our Ubuntu server that is listed here with the status of running. In this demo, I'll be using PowerShell to create a new Linux VM in Azure. So in this case, I've started the PowerShell ISE on my on-premises system and opened up an existing script. Down below in the PowerShell command window, you'll see that I've already run connect-az account to authenticate to Azure. In line one, what I'm doing is creating a variable called dollar sign VNet. And it's going to store the result of running get-az virtual network dash resource group name of RG1 dash name VNet1. So I want VNet1's information stored in a variable called dollar sign VNet. In line three, I'm creating a dollar sign NIC, network interface card variable, which will store the result of creating a new interface using the new dash AZ network interface commandlet. I have a name for the interface because it's its own separate resource in Azure. So I specify that with dash name. I deploy that into its own resource group with the dash resource group name parameter. I can also set the location, in this case dash location is Canada Central. And then I can also specify a subnet ID. Now to specify the subnet ID where this network interface will be created, I'm using the dash subnet ID parameter. And I'm using my dollar sign VNet variable dot subnets. There's a collection of subnets because there could be more of one in the VNet. And I'm referring to subnets two. That's the third subnet because it starts counting at zero. I know that's the subnet whose ID I want here because that's where I want to associate this subnet with this network interface. So that's how I get the ID for that. In line five, I'm creating a dollar sign PW variable for password which stores the result of running convert to dash secure string. And in single quotes, I've got the password I want to use. Then I'm using dash as plain text dash force. Okay, so I'm converting that to a secure string. So I do, don't have just the raw string stored in a memory variable. Then I'm creating a variable called dollar sign creds, which will be the result of running new dash object. The type here is system.management.automation.ps credential where PS stands for PowerShell. And in parentheses, I've got the username of C Blackwell in quotes, comma, and then my dollar sign PW variable. So the next thing we're going to do starting on line eight is we're going to create the configuration for our VM that we will ultimately store in a variable and pass on to the creation of the VM way down in line 13. Okay, so how's this happening? Well, in line eight, I'm creating a variable called dollar sign VM config. It'll be the result of running new dash azvm config where I'm going to specify dash vm name and supply a name for the new virtual machine I'm creating. Dash vm size and I'm going to specify the size I want to use in this case standard underscore b1 ls. Bear in mind that the sizing of the vm will depend on factors such as the region you're deploying it into or even a dedicated host that you might be deploying this onto. I'm piping the result of new dash azvm config with the vertical bar or pipe symbol to set dash azvm operating system. I'm going to use dash Linux and dash computer name, specify the computer name, dash credential, and this is where I'm going to use my dollar sign creds variable that we established up above in line six. I'm then going to pipe that using the vertical pipe symbol to set dash azvm source image dash publisher name, I'm going to use canonical, dash offer, I'm going to specify Ubuntu server, dash SKUs, I'm going to specify, in this case, the specific SKU for the version of Ubuntu that I want to run. In this particular case, it's going to be 14.04.2 dash LTS, dash version is latest. And I'm going to pipe that to add 
app.azvm network interface dash ID. We're going to use our variable up above from line three, dollar sign Nick. And we're going to call upon the dot ID property. We need the ID of the network interface. Now that's a lot of work, but the good news is that it's all in the end in a variable called dollar sign VM config. So finally in line 13, we can use new dash AZVM to build this Linux virtual machine by specifying dash resource group name, in this case RG1, dash location, in this case Canada Central, and finally dash VM will specify our dollar sign VM config variable. I could also run the same code here in Cloud Shell, which I've launched from the portal. The only difference, I don't need to run connect-az account because I'm already authenticated. So I'm going to go ahead and paste the code in here to run it. And I'll press enter to run my new dash azvm commandlet. And before too long, we'll see that the status code is okay. It has created the VM. We can check our work by going back into the portal in the VM's view. I'll refresh it. And there's our new Ubuntu-Serve2 virtual machine, which is listed now as running. The Azure CLI can be used to deploy Windows and Linux VMs. In this particular example, I'm going to be deploying a Linux VM. So I've launched Cloud Shell from within the Azure portal. And I'm going to start by running azvm-h for help. That'll give me help on the az VM command syntax. And one of the things I'm interested in in this case, if I look through the next level commands, is going to be to create a VM. So we can see create listed in the list. And we can ask for more help, such as AZ VM create dash H to start seeing some of the further syntax and ultimately some examples of how we might use the syntax to actually deploy a VM. And so now what I'm going to do is run az vm image list. I need to specify an image upon which I want the virtual machine based, whether it be Windows or Linux based, whether it's a standard public marketplace type of image, or perhaps even a customized image that I've tweaked. But either way, I'm gonna go ahead and run this command and press enter. We can see that we have a number of items that are listed here. So what we're always interested in is taking a look at the specific images that are available that we can select from to deploy our VM. So as I scroll back up through them, notice that we've got some that are Linux based, such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux, SUSE Linux, Debian, and so on. So I'm just going to clear the screen with CLS. So I'm going to right click and paste in the command where I run azvm create dash dash resource dash group rg1 dash dash name. I want to call this new VM Ubuntu dash two in Azure dash dash image. I'll specify Ubuntu LTS dash dash admin dash username. I'm going to specify C Blackwell and dash dash admin password. I'm going to put in the password I want to use in quotation marks. So in this example, I'm not sticking with the default of SSH public key authentication for Linux VMs. Instead, I'm using username and password. Finally, I'll specify dash dash location Canada East. There are other parameters you could specify depending on how you want this VM configured, but that's going to be enough for me to get my Ubuntu Linux VM up and running in the Azure cloud. So I'll press enter. And before you know it, the virtual machine is provisioned. It's called Ubuntu dash two. Let's check our work in the portal. I'll minimize this screen and we're going to refresh our virtual machines view and there's Ubuntu dash two it's currently listed as running. To use SSH public key authentication with a Linux virtual machine in Azure, you need a public and a private key pair. And there are many tools out there that will allow you to generate that unique key pair. One of those tools is the free PuTTY Gen tool, which I'm going to download and run on my Windows system. When you launch the PuTTY Gen or PuTTY Key Generator tool, this is the interface you'll get. So I'm going to start by clicking the Generate button next to Generate a Public-Private Key Pair. And it asks me to generate some randomness by moving my mouse over the blank area. So I'm going to go ahead and do that until the progress meter reaches the end. After which, it will have generated my public key. 
So down at, or up, rather up at the top, there's a note that says public key for pasting into OpenSSH authorized keys file. Excellent. That's actually what I need. But we need to save this in a file because while the public key portion will be stored in Azure for that virtual machine, that Linux VM, the private key needs to be stored by me on the station where I'm going to make the SSH connection to my Linux VM in Azure. Okay, so that being done, I'm gonna specify a key passphrase, essentially a passphrase that will be used to unlock the private key file. And then I'm gonna go down below and save both the public key and the private key files. Now, before I leave this screen, I'm gonna select and copy the public key up at the top of the PuTTY key generator tool. Okay, so I've now got my private key file and my public key file both saved on my on-premises system. So at this point, if we chose to, we could configure SSH public key authentication in our Linux VM by essentially uploading the public key portion and retaining the private key safely on our own machine. SSH public key authentication is the default setting for authenticating to a Linux VM in Azure. Now, what the purpose of this is that it enhances security beyond just the standard username and password, which constitutes single factor authentication. Even though it's two things, they're both something you know. You'd have to know the username and you'd have to know the password. But with SSH public key authentication, you have a public and private key pair where the public key is stored with the Linux VM. You must possess the private key, which is normally password protected. So not only do you have to have knowledge of the username, you have to possess the private key. Something you know and something you have, that's multi-factor authentication. So let's go ahead here in the portal and click on an existing Linux VM that's currently running. What I wanna do is make sure this VM is configured to use a public key of my choosing. So I'm gonna scroll down in the properties navigation bar for my Linux VM all the way down to the bottom, basically. I'm gonna go down under support and troubleshooting. And here you're gonna see reset password. So I'm gonna click on reset password, even though really we're not gonna reset the password. We're gonna reset the SSH public key. So the username I want to specify here is C Blackwell. And this is where I would paste an SSH public key that I've acquired. Now there are many tools out there that will let you acquire a public and private key pair. You need only the public key pasted here. You might use, for instance, OpenSSL to generate public and private key pairs at the command line, or you might use PuttyGen. There are many ways to do it. For example, here in the Putty Key Generator tool, I can generate some randomness by moving my mouse around the screen when I click the Generate button. And up at the top here, we can see we've got a public key. So I'm just gonna copy that. You can also put in a key passphrase and confirm it so that you can save the private key as a password protected file. You can also save the public key, which is we just copied up above as a separate file. So what I'm gonna do then is paste that SSH public key into that field. Now the purpose here is to make sure that we've got a public key that is valid that matches the private key that we possess. So when I click out of it, we see the little green check mark on the right, which indicates it likes the format of the SSH public key. So I'm gonna click the update button up at the top. Once our SSH public key has been updated or stored with the Linux VM, we can then connect, given that we know the username, which in this case is C Blackwell, and we possess the private key file, which we do. PuTTY is a free tool that you can download to make an SSH connection to an SSH host. You can do a lot more than that, but this is primarily what it's used for. So I'm gonna go ahead and download PuTTY and then fire it up. And just before we do that here in the portal, I'm gonna to go to the overview page for this Ubuntu Linux VM because I want the public IP address. And I can see the public IP listed here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy it to my clipboard. And here in the PuTTY client, I'm gonna paste the IP address at the top. By default, it wants to connect to port 22 for SSH connections. And I can save all of these settings, which I've done here. It's called Azure Linux VM, but we're not finished. That would be fine if all you wanted to do was connect with the username and password that you knew for that VM. But in this case, we've got public key authentication set up server side. We need the mathematically related private key. And here's how you specify that in the PuTTY tool. I'm gonna to scroll down and in the left hand navigator in PuTTY, 
I'm going to go down under Connection SSH Auth for authentication. And there's a field here where I can specify the path and file name for the private key file for authentication. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the Browse button to select that file. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, where did that file come from again? Well, we've said there are many ways you can generate public and private key pairs, but back here, I mentioned that you could use the PuTTY key generator tool, specify a passphrase and confirm it and save the private key, as well as saving the public one, which gets stored with Azure. So that's how I've generated that private key file that I'm going to use with PuTTY. Back here in PuTTY, we are now ready to make the connection, which means clicking the open button. The first time a connection is made to an SSH host, you are prompted as to whether or not you trust the unique fingerprint of that host. I'm going to choose yes. I'll just maximize this. So I'm going to log in as user C Blackwell, and it's authenticating with the public key. So it wants the passphrase for the related private key file. So I'm going to go ahead and specify that passphrase, and then I'll press enter. So given that we had knowledge of the username and we had the correct private key has to match the public one. You can't just use any private key. We are now successfully authenticated using SSH public key authentication to our Linux VM. After you've deployed a Windows virtual machine in Azure, you can remotely manage it using remote desktop protocol. The first thing I'm going to do here in the portal is verify in the virtual machines view that I've got a Windows virtual machine whose status is listed as running. After which I'm going to click on that virtual machine because one way to make the connection is to manually take a look at the public IP address if it has one. Now, if the VM does not have a public IP address, it only has a private IP address, then I'm gonna to have to connect through a jump box VM that might have been deployed or Azure Bastion, which is the same thing, from which I can use that as a launching pad to connect to the private IP of the VM. But luckily, this Windows VM has a public IP address. So I can copy that so I can make a connection to it using the remote desktop protocol or RDP client. At the same time, I could also click connect in the left hand navigator when I'm viewing the VM's properties which will give me some various options for making a connection to this VM, such as through RDP. So it automatically has the public IP address listed here, port 3389, and it gives me a button here to download RDP file, which would allow me to simply launch that RDP file. And it's already got a lot of this stuff filled in, such as the IP address. So I'm gonna go ahead and download the RDP file. And then I'm going to choose open. Now, being told that the publisher can't be identified, the publisher of that remote connection file, that's okay. I'm going to choose connect. And then I'm going to specify the username and the password for that VM. So I filled that in. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. I'm then prompted to trust the identity of the remote computer. So I'm going to choose don't ask me again for connections to this computer. And then I'll click the yes button. And we can now see that we've started a remote desktop session that's initializing for that Windows VM running within the Azure cloud. So it automatically started the Windows Server Manager tool. I can turn that behavior off by going to the Manage menu up at the top, choosing Server Manager Properties and selecting the option that says Do Not Start Server Manager Automatically at Logon. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to shut down the server manager. So we are in our Windows environment. Now, let's say we opened up the command prompt. So I'm going to go to the start menu and type CMD and open the command prompt. And I'm just going to click in the upper left here and choose properties of the command prompt so we can increase the font size. So it's more legible. So I'm going to go to font and I'll choose 24. The reason I'm here is I want to run IP config. And when I do that, notice that we will see our private IP address for this VM, but not the public. The public IP address is handled through a public IP address resource in Azure, and as such, does not show up within the virtual machine. After deploying Linux virtual machines in the Azure cloud, you need the ability to remotely manage them. So the first thing I'm going to do here in the Azure portal within the virtual machines view is click on an existing Linux virtual machine that I've already deployed that's currently running. So I'm going to click on it to open up its properties. The first thing I should point out is that 
if you want to make a connection to a virtual machine in Azure directly, it will have to have a public IP address. And so in the overview blade for this VM over on the far right, I can see indeed it is assigned a public IP address. It also has a private IP address. For VMs that only have a private IP address, you're going to have to go through a jump box or Azure Bastion configuration, which would have a public IP. And from there, use it as a launching pad to connect to the private IP of VMs in Azure to manage them remotely. But this Linux VM has a public IP address. Now I could click on the connect blade. So I'll click connect over on the left to open up the details to connect to this Linux VM. And it's got SSH selected automatically. RDP would be for Windows. Bastion would be if we've deployed and configured Azure Bastion, which I have not. Now from here, we can connect via SSH with a client. However, I can also simply copy the public IP address if I'm using some other tool such as PuTTY. PuTTY is a free tool you can download to make remote connections, including SSH connections to Linux hosts. So I'm going to copy the public IP address. Now, before we leave here and test that connection, if I scroll down in the properties navigation bar for this VM, all the way down at the bottom under support and troubleshooting, I'll see reset password. For Linux VMs, when I click on that, I'll be able to see whether username and password authentication is enabled or whether SSH public key configuration is enabled and we want to reset that. Currently, we're using password authentication. If for some reason I forget the username and password, we could change it here and click update. You can do the same type of thing for a Windows VM if the password is forgotten. But I do know the password or the credentials for this VM, so I don't need to change anything here. Here in my web browser, I've navigated to putty.org where we can download the putty client for free to make a connection to a host on a given port, such as SSH. So I've already downloaded that. So I'm going to go ahead and run the PuTTY tool on my on-premises system. Here in the PuTTY tool, I've specified the public IP address of our Linux VM. It's going to connect to port 22 SSH. So I'm going to go ahead and click Open. Now, the first time you connect, it's going to ask you if you trust the unique fingerprint of that host to establish trust. So I'm going to choose Yes. I won't be prompted for that again. Just going to maximize the PuTTY window here. It wants me to log in. So I'm going to specify the username that was specified when that VM was deployed. Of course, that can be changed if it's forgotten. And I'm also going to specify the password for that account. Once I've specified the credentials, it will log me in. And I now have, I'll just clear the screen with the clear command, I now have a remote SSH connection so I can manage this Linux VM. If I were to type the ifconfig command, I would see that I have a private IP address, but the public IP address doesn't show up here in the OS, just like it doesn't for Windows VMs. And that's because in Azure, public IP addresses are handled via a public IP address resource. Resizing a virtual machine in Azure means that you are changing the underlying horsepower for that virtual machine, whether you're increasing it or whether you're decreasing it to save on costs. So by monitoring a virtual machine's performance over time, you'll see whether the current sizing supports the workload running in the VM appropriately. So let's go ahead and resize an existing Windows virtual machine. Here in the portal, I'm looking at my virtual machines view and I've got a Windows one called WinServe 2019-1. Currently the status is that it's running. So I'm gonna click on the name of the virtual machine to open up its overview blade. Now in the overview blade, among other details, one of the things I will see is the size. And the size here reflects the underlying compute power. So here it's showing as standard DS1 V2 with one virtual CPU and 3.5 gig of memory. Now if I decide I need more horsepower than that to support the workload, what I could do is resize it by scrolling down in the navigation bar on the left, and you'll see that there is a size option. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. What this is also referred to is as vertical scaling. Scaling it up means increasing the underlying horsepower. Scaling down would mean decreasing the underlying horsepower. So over on the right here, let's say I want to use two vCPUs and eight gig of RAM. So I'm going to select 
the appropriate sizing for that from the list. Now, when I do that, I should always be aware that more compute power means more cost. So this is going to be important. And down below, we can see that it says prices that will be shown are presented in your local currency and our estimates. It really depends on how long you keep them running during the course of a month. Now, if I'm happy with this information, so I've got my sizing selected here, I can go ahead and click the resize button. Now we see a message at the top that states if the VM is running, then resizing it will cause it to be restarted. And that's fine. So once that's done, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the overview page or blade. And when I do, we can see it now reflects for the size that we're using standard B2MS, in my case, that was my selection, which uses two vCPUs and eight gig of memory. When an Azure Virtual Machine is deployed, at that time, it will have at least one operating system disk, but you can add additional data disks at that time or after the fact. And we're dealing with after the fact. Here I'm going to create a managed disk, and then I'm going to attach it to a VM. And that's kind of like plugging in a new disk device into a physical server where it gets recognized, and then to make it usable, you partition it and format it. And we're gonna have to do the same type of thing here. So to get started here in the portal, I'm going to click create a resource. And what I want to create is what's called a managed disk. So search for managed disk. I'll select it from the list. And then I'm going to choose create. So it's really just another type of Azure resource that you would deploy unto itself. So I'm going to deploy it into an existing resource group. And I'm going to call it data disk one. And I'm going to deploy this into a specific geographical region. So in this case, let's say Canada Central. And I can specify a source type. Now I'm going to leave it at none because what I want to do here is really create a blank, empty virtual disk that I attach to a VM. But you could choose its source as being a snapshot or a storage blob. So I'm going to leave it on none. We can see here the size is 1024 gig. It's premium SSD. I could click change size. Depending on what my needs are for this disk, I could select the appropriate item. However, I'm going to leave it as it is for what my purpose is. It will be just fine. So I'm going to go ahead and click next. I can also opt to encrypt or I can do that after. I'm not going to encrypt here. I'll click next for tags. I'm not going to add tagging information. So I'm going to click next, review and create. And it's going to run the validation, which passed. And now I'm going to create the managed disk by clicking the create button. It won't take very long before the deployment is complete. I'll click the go to resource button to go into the data disks properties. Now within here, I can see the disk state in the overview blade is showing as unattached. So there's no owner VM or operating system, but we do see the disk config in terms of its sizing. We could also click on the configuration item in the left hand navigator to open the config blade where we can select from the storage type. Now it's set to premium SSD solid state drive, which is great for performance. However, it costs more than using something like standard HDD, hard disk drive. So if you don't need frequent access to the data and you don't need a lot of disk throughput to save on costs, you might choose to select standard HDD, but I'm not going to do that here. And again, I can specify the size information. I can go to encryption to also check the encryption state. But notice what we don't have here is the ability to associate this with our virtual machines. So we do that from the VM level. So I'm going to go to my home link here in the portal. I'm going to go to the virtual machines view. And we're going to attach it to a VM. It's going to be attached to a Windows VM, which is currently stopped. So I'm going to put a check mark in the box and click start to fire up the VM. And then I'm going to click on the VM to open up its properties. So we can see that the status of the VM over on the right in the overview blade is that it is running. So I'm going to scroll down in the navigation bar and I'm going to click on disks. This is going to show me the current disk layout of this VM. What we're seeing if we scroll down a little bit on the right is that we have an OS disk, but under data disks, we see none, but luckily we do have an add data disk button. So I'm going to click on that button. Now what we need to do is select the disk. So from the drop down list for name, I have all the disks that are available, including data disk one, the one we just created. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. 
And then I'm going to click save up at the top to save that addition of a data disk to this VM. Now remember, it's just going to be like another disk device was plugged into a physical server. So the next thing I want to do, because it's Windows, is I'm going to RDP into this VM so we can take a look at that newly added disk at the OS level. So I'm going to go to the overview blade here. And here, because I want to get the public IP address so I can RDP into it. So here in my Windows VM that I've RDP'd into, I'm going to go to the start menu and I'm going to search for the word disk because I want to work with the disk partitioning tool. So I'm going to choose create and format hard disk partitions. Now here we're seeing a pop up because we have attached a managed disk to the Azure VM. And so within the OS, it's another disk device here showing up as disk two. And I'm going to use the partitioning style of MBR or master boot record. And I'm going to click OK. All right, so now we have our second disk added. Let's just maximize this window. We see it down below. So it's about 1,024 gigabytes unallocated. So I'm going to right click on it and build a simple volume so we can use the file system. I'll click next. I'll accept all of the defaults. I'll just keep going through the wizard until I get to finish. And after a moment, we'll see that disk two is now in the midst of formatting. And after just a few moments, we'll see that we've got a new volume drive E that is available to be used within this OS. You can choose to encrypt disks at the virtual machine level in Azure. So as opposed to using an encryption solution within the operating system. So to get started here in the portal, I've already pulled up the properties for a Windows virtual machine. So I'm just gonna scroll down in the navigation bar and select disks. This will show me the disk layout for this VM, including the operating system disk, which we can see listed here, as well as the one data disk it has attached. Up at the top, we've got a button called encryption. So I'm gonna click on that button. When we choose the encryption button, we can elect to encrypt just the OS disk or the OS and data disks, which is what I'm going to choose here. Now, when I do that down below, I have to click the link to select a key vault and a key to be used for the encryption. So I'm going to click that link and I'm going to select an existing key vault that I've created. Now, if you don't already have a key vault, don't sweat it. You can click the create new link to build a new key vault, which I'll do here. So I'm just going to scroll down and I'm going to give this key vault a name. I'm going to call KV2 and I'll specify some characters to make it a unique name while adhering to company naming conventions. And I'm not gonna change anything else here. I'll click next for access policy. I wanna make sure that Azure Disk Encryption for volume encryption is turned on so that my VMs can come in here to encrypt VM disks. And then I'll click the review and create button in the bottom left. After the validation has passed, I'll click the create button in the bottom left. So what I'm creating here is the key vault which is really just a centralized or cloud-based storage location for secrets like encryption keys. Now, all we've done is created the key vault. From the selection dropdown list for the key, we see nothing because we've just created the vault. Not a problem, we've got to create new link also to build a new key. We can elect to generate the key, which is what we're going to end up doing here ultimately. You can also import a key or restore a key from backup. I'm gonna leave it on generate and I'm gonna call it VM key one. It's going to be an RSA key, 2048 bits. I'm not going to set an activation or expiration date and it's enabled by default. Looks perfect. I'm going to click create to create VM key one and it's now selected in the list. We can also select a specific version of the key. So I'll select the only version that's there from the list and I'll choose select. Okay, so now we've got a reference that we want to encrypt the OS and data disks for this VM. We've created a key vault and a key so at this point, we're ready to save our configuration. So I'm gonna click the save button up at the top. It says enabling Azure Disk Encryption will cause the VM to reboot. Well, that's an important note because if it's running a mission critical workload, we may wanna to wait to do this after hours. So it says, do you wanna encrypt and restart the virtual machine? I will choose the yes button because I do. If we click our notification bell icon in the upper right, we can see it's updating disk encryption settings for that VM. And after a moment, if you're looking at the notification area in the upper right, it'll say that it successfully updated the disk encryption settings. So let's go back in the breadcrumb link trail here in the upper left to our virtual machines 
disk. Notice that for the OS disk and the data disk, so we have two disks for this VM, if you look into the encryption column, they now show enabled. Encrypting a virtual machine or a VM in Azure really means encrypting its disks. And so the first thing we're going to take a look at here in the portal is a key within a key vault. You need to have this to perform the VM disk encryption. So I've gone to the all resources view and I filtered it for items that begin with KV. And I can see I've got a key vault here called KV2Y8Z and it's in the Canada central region. So I'm going to go ahead and click to open up that key vault because I want to check out to see whether or not it has any keys. So I'm going to click on keys and on the right, I can see indeed, I do have an enabled key called VM key one. So I'm going to be using that key to encrypt my VM disks. I can click on it to open it up if I want further details. So I'm just going to click on the current version to open that up. And within it, we can see it's an RSA 2048 bit key. Well, that's fine. So let's go ahead and use it. So I'm going to go click home in the upper left here in the breadcrumb trail at the top of the portal. And I'm going to click on the virtual machines item so I can open up that view. And I've got a virtual machine here and it's up and running, which it must be in order to encrypt VM disks. It's called Windserve 2019-1 and it's in the same location or region as my key vault, Canada Central. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my local machine. On my local machine, I've launched the PowerShell ISE where I have a PowerShell script to encrypt VM disks. So in line one, I'm creating a variable called dollar sign key vault, and it's going to store the result of running get dash az key vault. I'm giving it the vault name, so dash vault name, dash resource group name for the resource group where it's been deployed. So then we'll have a variable dollar sign key vault that essentially gives us a handle on that key vault, not the key, but the key vault. Now, the next thing I'm doing in line two is creating a variable called disk encryption key vault URL, which will store the dollar sign key vault variables dot vault URI property. Then in line three, I'm creating a variable called dollar sign key vault resource ID, and it's going to store the dollar sign key vault variables dot resource ID property. Then I'm going to create a variable in line four called dollar sign key encryption key URL. It's going to store the result of running within the parentheses get dash az key vault key dash vault name and there's the name of our vault and dash name followed by the name of the key in that vault which as you'll recall is called vm key one now the entire statement here that we've just discussed is within open and closing parentheses because we want that treated as a single expression upon which we then want to call on the dot key dot KID properties. Now that we've set up the variables, and that's the hard work, to actually encrypt the VM disks, we use the set dash AZ VM disk encryption extension PowerShell commandlet. We're starting to see that here in line six in our script. Dash resource group name, I specify the name of the resource group. Dash VM name, I specify the name of the virtual machine in question, whose disks I want encrypted. It's called Winserve 2019-1. Then I'm going to specify the dash disk encryption key vault URL and refer to our variable of the same name, dash disk encryption key vault ID, and then I'll refer to the dash key vault resource ID variable we established above, dash key encryption key URL, and I'll refer to the dollar sign key encryption key URL variable, again, established above, and finally, the dash key encryption key vault ID parameter with the variable dollar sign key vault resource ID. So I'm going to go ahead and run this script. We could also run this actually within cloud shell through the portal. Let's actually do that. I'm going to copy this code. We could run it on premises, but we'd first have to authenticate to Azure using connect dash AZ account. Here in the Azure portal, I'm going to click on the cloud shell icon up at the top and let it establish a connection for me. It doesn't really matter where I run the commands in that script. The only difference again being here in the portal, because I'm already authenticated, I'm not gonna have to authenticate in PowerShell with the connect-az account PowerShell commandlet. So I'm gonna clear the screen with CLS and let's go ahead and right click and paste our code in here and let's let it run. So I'll just press enter after the last portion 
And it says this command prepares the VM and enables encryption, which may reboot. It might take 10 or 15 minutes. Save your work in the VM. Do you want to continue? I'm going to type in the letter Y for yes, and I'll press enter. After a moment, we'll see the is success status code output shows a value of true. And why don't we just minimize the cloud shell just for fun and let's go back in the portal into that virtual machine and let's check out the encryption status from the GUI perspective. Why not? Okay, so let's click on disks and we'll see the disk layout for the VM. So what do we have? We have an OS disk and we also have one data disk. And if we look at the encryption column, both of them are reflecting that encryption is enabled. In this demonstration, I'm going to configure a virtual machine scale set or a VMSS, and I'm going to do it using the Azure portal. The first thing we have to determine is why do I care? Why would I deploy a virtual machine scale set? Well, the name kind of implies the reason. You can configure scaling, so auto scaling, for example. So you have a collection of virtual machines, and when things get busy, such as average CPU percentage for utilization, we can scale out. We can add virtual machines, scaling horizontally, to accommodate the increased workload, or we can scale in, we can remove virtual machines when things quiet down to save on costs. So that's a good compelling reason to think about using virtual machine scale sets. Thing is, when you define the scale set, you're going to have to select a virtual machine OS image. And so you could use the standard marketplace images that are always available, but you can also define your own custom image, which you might want to do if you want it customized or tweaked and you want it to have additional software installed to support your workload and so on. Either way, let's go through the motions here in the portal. So I'm going to click create a resource and I'm going to search for virtual machine scale set. And there it is in the list. I'm going to go ahead and click on it and then I'm going to click on create. Down below, I'm going to deploy this into an existing resource group. And let's see, I'm going to scroll down and give this a name. I'll call it VMSS1, Virtual Machine Scale Set 1. And I want this to be deployed, let's say, into the Canada Central Region, because that's nearest where I'm located as an administrator. And it's also where I want the workload to be running, because that's where most of the people that will access it, or the components that will access it, reside. Now, having done that down below, I have to select the OS image. So in this example, let's say I'll use Windows Server 2019 Data Center, and this is where you could browse public and private images where you might have your own customized image to support your app workload. I can also opt to use Azure Spot Instances, which is interesting because we're talking about reacting to busier workloads and scaling out horizontally, adding VMs. Well, we wanna do that as cost efficiently as possible and so you could do that by saying, yes, I want to use Azure Spot Instances. Spot Instances are a special instance type that are based on extra compute capacity available in the Azure Cloud that's not currently being used. However, if it ends up being used, then your usage will be removed. In other words, your VM instances based on that extra capacity through Spot Instances, those VMs are going to be evicted. So you wouldn't want to do this for anything mission critical. However, we do have the option. I'm going to choose no for that. I'm going to leave this the VM sizing as it is. And I'm going to have to specify some Windows credentials here. So username and password. If I already have Windows Server's licenses, I can select yes to use them. That's B-Y-O-L, bring your own licenses. But I don't, so I'll leave it on no. I'll click next for disks. So I want the OS disk to use premium SSD, and I have the option for encrypting that disk. And I could also add data disks, depending on what's required by my app workload. But I'm not going to specify any data disks. I'll just leave it with only an OS disk, and I'll click Next for networking. So I have to determine the affiliation or the association with a VNet. So from the list, I'm going to choose an existing one. I could build a new VNet, but I'm going to use an existing one called VNet1. Now that's fine. Down below, I can specify network interfaces. Now these are for the VMs, each VM. So we've got one virtual network interface, although if we really wanted to, we could add more by clicking create new NIC. Again, it really depends on the nature of what you're running within your VMs. If you don't need a second NIC, then there's no point in adding it. We could also use this with load balancing. 
I'm going to leave the default of no for that. I'm going to click next for scaling. Now, this is an important part of scaling. We can leave it on manual. So we have initial instances, how many virtual machines, it's set to two. However, I'm going to choose a custom scaling policy. In other words, I want it to automatically scale out and in as required. So we're going to start with the minimum number of VMs, let's say, of one. So that's the initial instance count and my scaling policy, it's the minimum number of VMs. Let's say the max, I only want it to be three based on my testing. I think that's what I might need to accommodate the busiest peak times for the workload. Now, when will it start scaling out and adding VMs? Well, that's the scaling out CPU threshold option. It's set to 75% here. Maybe based on my performance monitoring, I'll change that to 85%. So if we've got 85% overall CPU busyness for more than 10 minutes. I want to start scaling out horizontally or increasing VMs one at a time. And I can also say, well, when the CPU bounces all the way back down, let's say to 15%, so things are very quiet, then I want to start scaling in, removing VM instances. Why keep things running when you're paying for them if you don't need them? Makes perfect sense, right? So number of VMs to decrease by is one. So now that we've got that done, I'm going to go ahead and click next for management. A lot of these settings are going to be reminiscent of when you deploy a VM in the GUI. So do we want boot diagnostics on or off? And of course, a storage account for that. And do we want a system managed identity for any code running in the VM workload that needs access to Azure resources, so you don't have to write the credentials into your code? Do we want to enable automatic OS upgrades and so on? I'm not going to change any of those settings. I'm going to click next for health. I'm going to leave the monitor application health option disabled. That's the default. I'll click next for advanced. Again, there's nothing I'm going to change here. I'll click next for tagging. Not going to add any tags. Next review and create. So it's going to check that my selections are valid. Validation has passed. Let's create the scale set by clicking the create button in the bottom left. And then we'll examine it once it's been deployed. And there it is. After a moment, your deployment is complete. Let's click go to resource to check it out. So we're going into the properties of the virtual machine scale set. The first thing I want to take a look at here are the instances. If I click on the instances view, we'll see how many active instances we have currently. Currently, we only have one because we said that was the initial amount of VMs we needed until things got very busy beyond 85% of overall CPU utilization for 10 minutes. Obviously that hasn't happened, otherwise we would see more instances. Now while we've got a VMSS1 underscore one name for this instance, it will not show up at the other regular virtual machines here in the portal. If I switch to the virtual machines view, I don't see scale set instances stored or listed here rather. So they are listed only in the properties of that virtual machine scale set. In Azure, when you deploy virtual machines, you can opt to use a dedicated host. And what you're really saying is you want your own physical server, your own physical hypervisor in an Azure data center that will not accommodate any other VMs from other cloud tenants. Now, you might do this for regulatory compliance reasons, or if you're a large enterprise customer, you just might want full control in that way. Only your VMs are running on the hypervisor. So to get started here in the portal, I'm going to click create a resource and I'm going to search for dedicated and then I'm going to choose dedicated hosts and then I'll click create. So it's pretty much as if you're renting an entire physical server in an Azure data center for the purposes of hosting your own VMs. So I've got to fill in a few details here, such as the resource group. I'm going to select that. I'm going to give this a name. DH1 for dedicated host one. And I've got a limited number of regions where I can deploy this. So maybe in my particular case, I'll choose Canada Central. You have to choose the appropriate sizing family that will be used by the VMs deployed on that host. In other words, while you might be able to use a wide range of sizing for underlying horsepower for VMs normally, when you run dedicated hosting, that list is limited. So be aware. And when you select one of the size families from here, you may or may not be able to do it in that particular region. So for example, I'm going to select a different region. Perhaps I'll use here East US. Then I can choose from a variety of different family types. And if there isn't enough 
capacity, hardware capacity to handle it, then I'll get the message. I won't be able to do it. So I have to be very careful when I select these options to make sure I choose the appropriate type of sizing family. Now down below, I can also select or create a host group. And as you might guess, a host group is used to group dedicated hosts together if you're going to deploy more than one. I'm going to go ahead and specify one because I have to, as indicated with the red asterisk. So I'm going to choose Create New Host Group. I'm going to call it HG1 for Host Group 1. And I can specify a fault domain count value of either 1, 2, or 3. Think of a fault domain as a physical rack in a data center. So if I want to spread virtual machines, for example, out across three physical racks in a data center for additional resiliency of hardware failure, then I would set this, for example, to three fault domains. I'm going to go ahead and click Add to add the host group. I'm going to click Next for tags. And I'm not going to add any tags, so I'm going to click Next, Review and Create. It's running the file validation, and the validation has passed. So I'm not going to actually deploy this for cost reasons, but if you were going to do it, naturally, you would click the Create button in the bottom left. Now, you can specify that newly created VMs as you're creating them are mapped to the dedicated host. So for example, let's go back to Home here, and I'm going to choose Create a Resource, and let's say I'll just select a popular virtual machine image. So here in the wizard across the top, I'm going to jump directly to advanced. I'll click on advanced. And when I scroll down, I've got the option of selecting a host group. Of course, the host group is used to group multiple dedicated hosts together. So this is how you could associate it with the fact that you want it running on your own, essentially your own rented physical server. You can also take existing virtual machines and map them to dedicated hosting. Just be aware, of course, of the sizing. So if I go to, let's say, the virtual machines view, and if I open up an existing virtual machine, so I'm going to click on one to open up its properties, I could then scroll down in the navigation bar for the VM and click on configuration. And what I'm looking for in here, of course, again, is a host group association. So I can scroll down and select a host group from the list. In this course, we've examined deploying and managing Windows and Linux VMs, as well as enabling SSH public key authentication, disk encryption, and deploying virtual machine scale sets. We did all of this by exploring how to plan for Azure VMs, including dedicated hosting. We looked at how to use the portal, PowerShell, and the CLI to create Windows VMs, and how to use the portal, PowerShell, and the CLI to create Linux VMs. We looked at how to use the PuttyGen tool to create keys for use with SSH. We then looked at how to use the portal to enable Linux VM public key authentication. We looked at how to change the sizing for existing VMs and to create a managed disk and attach it to a VM. We looked at how to use the portal in PowerShell to enable VM disk encryption. Finally, we looked at how to deploy a virtual machine scale set and how to use dedicated hosting to run your VMs. In our next course, we'll move on to explore how to deploy and manage a new Azure AD tenant and users, and also how to configure user sign-in security settings. Azure Active Directory, otherwise called Azure AD, is essentially running Active Directory domain services in the Azure cloud. It's managed meaning that the underlying virtual machines that support it are configured and handled by Microsoft. So the purpose is for us to create and manage things like users, groups, registering apps, and working with security principles within the Azure AD database. You can even link Azure AD to your on-premises AD. You would do that so you could reuse on-premises credentials. So for example, users could sign in and access Azure Cloud Apps based on their on-premises sign-in credentials. You can manage Azure Active Directory using GUI tools, such as the Azure Portal, and of course using command line management tools like the CLI and PowerShell, as well as through API calls. Azure AD security comes in many forms. There are plenty of options, one of which is roles. There are plenty of role-based access control or RBAC roles 
that determine what technicians can do related to Azure Active Directory. There is also the notion of conditional access. You can create conditional access policies that determine, for example, which type of user device, maybe iOS devices, are allowed to access specific apps and only when MFA or multi-factor authentication is used. That would be an example of a conditional access policy. There are also Azure AD access reviews. You can schedule or manually run these access reviews to do things like check on membership within Azure AD groups to see if that's still required or permissions that groups might have been granted to Azure AD registered apps. Maybe that permission set is no longer required because it's not being used. So it identifies those types of potential security issues related to access to resources in Azure AD. Then there's privileged identity management, which allows you to use just-in-time access to grant the requests that might be initiated by technicians to administer an aspect of Azure AD. The next thing is multi-factor authentication or MFA, where we can require multiple categories of authentication to be used before allowing access to resources in the Azure cloud. Identity and Access Management, otherwise called IAM, is related to Azure Active Directory in the sense that we can create and manage users and then add them to groups to facilitate permissions management. We can also register or join devices to Azure AD, such as Windows 10 stations or mobile devices, so that we have some centralized management control over those devices. And we can also work with managed identities. A managed identity for example, might be associated with an Azure virtual machine. Whether you're creating the VM or even after the fact, you can assign a managed identity for that VM. The purpose is that the managed identity can be given access to other Azure resources that the virtual machine might require. So you would be running presumably custom code in the VM that needs, let's say, access to a storage account. Well, instead of writing the code with the credentials in the code to access a storage account. Instead, you could use a managed identity. Identity and Access Management, or IAM, begins with authentication, followed by authorization. So, this means we've got proof of identity. That's what authentication really means. And it occurs before authorization, or the gaining access to resources. Single factor authentication means a single category of items such as something you know, such as a username and a password. Both of those are something you know, so they constitute single factor authentication even when used together. Multi factor authentication or MFA uses multiple categories such as something you know, like a username and password, in addition to something you have, like a smart card. Authorization controls access to resources, and as we know, it occurs after successful authentication. So we could have permissions or policies assigned to groups of users to determine what they can access. And we can even have apps registered in Azure AD that can provide authorization tokens to the app. So you could create a registration, for example, for a line of business app, and that registration is stored in Azure AD and leverages the authentication benefits of using Azure AD. Multi-factor authentication can use out-of-band authentication codes. This means if you sign in, for example, with a username and password, you have some other mechanism where you are provided some kind of a unique code that you must then enter to sign in. So it's out-of-band. It's not the same mechanism you're using to sign into in the first place. So it uses additional authentication factors. And it's considered more secure than only username and password because MFA uses multiple categories for authentication. So it combines two or more categories, such as something you know plus something you have, or something you know plus something you are. The something you are portion is really all about biometric authentication. It could also be something you have plus something you do. The something you do would be some kind of a unique gesture that is picked up by a system to determine that you are who you say you are to allow authentication. So with multi-factor authentication, all of the factors get validated at the same time. One way to work with this is using the Microsoft Authenticator app. 
This is an MFA software app, and you could install it, for example, on a smartphone. And what happens is that when you are using MFA, it will provide a six-digit PIN, a unique PIN that changes every 30 seconds. So when MFA is enabled for an Azure AD user, besides the username and password, they would have to enter this six-digit PIN to authenticate. In this demonstration, I'm going to use the Azure portal to deploy a new Azure AD tenant. An Azure AD tenant is an instance of Azure Active Directory. And in a large enterprise, you might have multiple Azure AD tenants, each one perhaps reflecting a geographical region or a business unit, or in the case of a parent company that owns many subsidiaries, perhaps each subsidiary would be its own Azure AD tenant. Either way, to get started here in the portal, I'm going to click Create a Resource. What I want to create here is an Azure AD tenant. So I'm going to search for Azure Active, and I'm going to choose Azure Active Directory, and then I'll click Create. So the first thing I have to do is specify the organization name. So here I'm going to make it for the fictitious company, Permacan. And I have to enter the initial domain name. This can be changed later. You can add custom DNS domain names that truly reflect your organization. However, here I'm going to put in Permacan, and what it's going to add is the default .onmicrosoft.com DNS suffix. Again, I can add additional custom domain names for DNS after the fact. For the country and the region, I'm just going to go ahead here, and from the list in the C's, I'm going to choose Canada. It says directory creation will take about one minute. Now, before I click create, notice up above, it doesn't like the name. In other words, it's not unique. So I'm going to go ahead and put in a name here that will make that unique while adhering to organizational naming standards. And when I click outside, it'll check for uniqueness. This time we have a green check mark to the right of the initial domain name, so it is unique. Once we've done that, I'm going to go ahead and click on the create button. And it says the directory is being created now. So we're going to wait a moment until that's completed, and then we'll poke around a little bit in our newly created Azure AD tenant. After a moment, we'll see that it's completed. We have a message at the bottom that states to click here, and the word here is a link, to manage your new directory. Well, that's one thing I can do, but before we do that, in the upper right where I can see my user login name and the current directory tenant, Azure AD, in this case, mine's called Quick24x7, I'm going to click on that in the upper right because we can switch between directories. I can click Switch Directory. Down below, I'm going to make sure I'm looking at all directories. And in the list here, we'll see any of the directories that we've created. Now, notice our new one is not yet shown in the list, Permacan. That's just a refresh issue. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on the X to close that selection screen. We're going to click the here link to manage our new directory. And that'll take us into our Permacan directory. We can see that it's now reflected up here in the upper right where our user account information is listed in the portal. Now that we've switched over to it, let's go back into our account information in the upper right. And once again, let's click on switch directory. And this time I'm going to go under all directories as I did previously, but this time I'm going to see, there it is, my Permacan Azure AD tenant. So now it's refreshed, it's up to date. So when we look here in the overview blade for the Permacan Azure AD tenant, we can see the friendly name of it, Permacan, but we can also see the DNS name of it, Permacan, in my case, Y8Z, and then the DNS suffix that's always there by default, dot on Microsoft.com. You could change that by adding a custom DNS domain. We see custom domain names in the navigation bar shown over here on the left. Now notice, even within the overview blade for my current Azure AD tenant, I have the option of switching to another directory. So same kind of thing we did in the upper right to switch between Azure AD tenants. We can delete this current directory or we can create a new one. So there are multiple ways that this can be done. If we take a look at the users view, I'll click users on the left. The only user that's listed in this tenant by default is the Microsoft account that was used to create the tenant in the first place. I'll just click on Permacan up in my breadcrumb trail, the links in the upper left, to go back one level. And if I just go and look at groups, we'll see that by default, there are no groups defined within this Azure AD tenant. 
The other thing to bear in mind is that some features may be available in some Azure AD tenants and not others. So what I mean by that, let's say for example, is if I scroll down in the Permacan navigation bar on the left, and let's say I go down and choose security. And then I'm gonna to go to, I don't know, MFA, let's say multi-factor authentication. Well, this hasn't been enabled. This feature hasn't been enabled for this tenant. So we have the option to get a free premium trial to use the feature. Of course, we could always purchase it. So we have a couple of ways to do that. Now, if I switch to another existing Azure AD tenant, and I'm going to do that, I'm gonna use the upper right here in the portal as we've discussed to switch back to my initial tenant, which is called Quick24x7. Now, when I switch to that Azure AD tenant, if I were to take a look at users and groups, I would be looking at it from the perspective of the currently selected Azure AD tenant. And if I were to look, let's say, all the way down under security in the navigation bar for this tenant, and just like we did a moment ago, I'm going to go into MFA for this tenant. Well, when you switch between tenants, depending on what's been configured or not, will determine what you see. In this case, I'm not prompted to get a free trial or anything. I'm given all of my menu options to configure multi-factor authentication further. So things might look different from one Azure AD tenant to another is really the point. And to take that a step further, let's say I go back to home here in the portal, and let's say I view virtual machines. Okay, so I can see here I've got two virtual machines. They're not running, but it doesn't make a difference. The point is that we see we've got two VMs. Let me switch back to our newly created Azure AD tenant, that's Permacan in our example. And I want to take a look at virtual machines once again, as we just did. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to click home in the upper left. Now at this point, it says, welcome to Azure. Well, that looks different. Why is it doing this? because we haven't done anything yet. We don't have anything configured. We don't have, well, as a matter of fact, if we take a look at subscriptions, let me just search for subscriptions. I'll search for the word sub in the top search bar. Go to click on subscriptions. And for Permacan, we don't even have any subscriptions. Oh, well, that's gonna limit what we can do. Yeah, it will. So if I were, for example, to try to open up in the left-hand navigator, my virtual machines view from that perspective, Let's go ahead and do that. Then once again, we just get this welcome to Azure because we don't have a subscription. Well, that's a little bit different. Right, so you have to have a subscription before you can start deploying any resources and doing anything meaningful in Azure. So yet again, let's flip back in the upper right of our portal. I'm gonna switch back to our quick 24X7 tenant. And I'm gonna search in the search bar in the center here like we did a moment ago for subscriptions. So I'll search for sub. And we can see for our Quick 24X7 Azure AD tenant, we do have a pay-as-you-go subscription. So it's important to understand the relationship between Azure AD tenants and subscriptions. So you can add one or more subscriptions for an Azure AD tenant that determine what you can do. And certainly you need at least one subscription to do anything. When you're planning on using multi-factor authentication or MFA, so that when users sign in, they require an additional factor beyond just the username and password, you have to consider the verification methods that you might want to use. In other words, when users try to sign in and MFA is enabled, how should they receive their additional factors? Should it be a phone call? Should it be an SMS text message? Should they get a six digit pin that changes every 30 seconds available in a, an app? So we get to control that within our Azure AD security settings. So here in the portal, I'm going to start by navigating to Azure Active Directory. So I'll open up the navigator on the left. I'll scroll down a little bit and I'll click Azure Active Directory. Now that's going to take me into my current tenant. In my case, it's called Quick24x7. Now I'm in the overview blade for that tenant and over on the right, I can switch directory. So if I'm not in the right Azure AD tenant, I can switch to it that way. Or of course, I can do it in the upper right by clicking on my user account name and choosing switch directory. I'm in the current Azure AD tenant I want to be in, so I'm not changing anything here. What I want to do though, is I wanna to get to the verification method. And it's kind of nestled in a few levels here. To get to it, you're gonna to need to scroll down in the navigation bar. You're gonna first need to go into security. The next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is go into conditional access Next thing I'm going to do is click Named Locations, and then I'm gonna click the button at the top that says Configure MFA Trusted IPs. Now that's gonna open up a new web browser window, and what I'm interested in is scrolling down below, 
in the verification options. So it says methods available to users and they're all turned on. The check mark is turned on for all four options. Call to phone. That means receiving in a phone call with a voice from Microsoft to verify your account. Basically, you would initiate a sign in to Azure or to some kind of an app through Azure, even for Office 365. You specify your username and password. You get a phone call then that prompts you to continue the authentication. Now, what that normally means is you press the pound symbol on the phone to verify that, yes, you expected this call and you want to continue authentication. You could also receive a text message to your phone or notification through a mobile app, such as the Microsoft Authenticator app, which you might even install on your iOS or Android mobile device. Or you might want to use a verification code from the mobile app or a hardware token if that's been issued to your users that they would have to have in their possession that shows them a code or some unique value to log in. So let's say what I want available here is either text messaging or notification through a mobile app. So I'm going to uncheck call to phone. I'm going to uncheck verification code from mobile app or hardware token, and I'm going to click save. It says the updates are successful. Excellent. I'll click the close button. And at this point, what we've done is we have enabled the verification options to be used in Azure AD along with multi-factor authentication if we were to enable that. You can use the Azure portal to create Azure AD users. Now, there are other ways that users will show up in Azure AD, perhaps because you synchronized your on-premises AD with Azure AD through Azure AD Connect. That might be one way. You might invite external guest users, or you might create accounts directly in Azure AD for your enterprise, which is what we're going to do in this case. So here in the portal, I've already navigated to my Azure AD tenant, and in the overview blade, that's where we are, I can see that the DNS name here for it happens to be, in my case, quick24x7test, dot on microsoft.com. I'm going to copy that because when you create Azure AD users, you need to specify as part of their sign in or email address, the DNS domain suffix. So that's why I copied that. So to get started here, I'm going to click on users on the left. What you can expect with the new Azure AD tenant. So if users haven't previously been created is you can expect to see the Microsoft account that was signed in when the Azure AD tenant was created. So that's what I'm looking at here. But I want to create a new user. So I'm going to click the new user button up at the top. And essentially, it's fill in the blank. Now I can choose to invite a user. That means I want to send an email invitation to someone externally. But in this case, I want to create a user that exists within my enterprise. So I'm going to leave it on create user. For the name, I'm going to put in C Blackwell. Now it's going to use the quick 24x7 test done on Microsoft.com suffix. So if I have multiple DNS names, I can select them from here, such as in the fact that if I added a custom DNS domain name, instead of using on Microsoft.com, use my own DNS suffix, then I could select that from the list. Then down below, I'll fill in the full name. So I'm going to spell out in this case, Cody Blackwell, a fictitious user. Just going to scroll down further. I can fill in other details like the first name, and the last name, I can determine if I want Azure to auto-generate the password or let me create it. I'm going to let it auto-generate, but I'm going to choose show password and I'm going to copy it. That's going to be required the first time that user signs in before they're prompted to reset it or change it to something else. I can add users to groups at the time that they are created or at any time thereafter. I can also assign specific roles for RBAC, role-based access control. So if I want this user to have specific permissions to manage Azure resources, I could go ahead and change the role affiliation. I don't want to block the user sign-in, so I'll leave that on no by default. I don't have a usage location. And for job info, I'm going to leave that stuff blank, although I could change it later. So I'm going to go ahead and click create to build user Cody Blackwell. And we can see Cody Blackwell is now shown here in the list of users for Azure AD. Notice under the source column, Cody Blackwell has a source value of Azure Active Directory. So that's an account that was created directly here in our Azure AD tenant. So the next thing I want to do is I want to test logging in as user Cody Blackwell. Now we're going to need that first initial auto generated password after which Cody is going to be prompted to change it. 
I'm going to test this by navigating in a web browser to myapps.microsoft.com. So when prompted, I'm going to enter the full email address or sign-in ID for C. Blackwell, so it includes my DNS suffix for my Azure AD tenant, and I'm going to click Next, and I'm going to specify the password, and then I'll click Sign In. So at this point, it says, well, you need to update your password. That was just an initial auto-generated password. So I'll put in the current password, and I'll specify a new password and confirm it. And then I'll click the Sign In button. And we can now see that user Cody is signed in through the Quick 24x7 Azure AD tenant. Now, the users don't have to sign in to myapps.microsoft.com. That's just one way of testing it. They might log in directly to the Azure portal if they're Azure administrators. But the point is that we've created an Azure AD user in our tenant, and they are able to successfully authenticate. In this demonstration, I'm going to use the Azure CLI to create a new Azure AD user. The first thing to consider is which Azure AD tenant you're working with. Well, currently I'm using Cloud Shell within the portal. I've launched Cloud Shell from the Cloud Shell button at the top. And I can see here in the portal in the upper right, my account name that I'm signed in with and the Azure AD tenant I'm connected to, which in this case is Quick 24 x 7 so that's fine. I want to create the user there. So to get started here in the CLI, I'm going to start by typing az ad user create dash h for help. So I get a sense of the parameters I need in addition to what I've typed in and their expected values. So I could read about those details and see things that are perhaps required, such as dash dash display dash name that's shown here as being a mandatory or required parameter, just like dash dash password is also shown here, it's being required, so is the user principal name, and so on. So we can learn quite a bit by asking for help from the Azure CLI. So let's put it all together and let's create a user. I'm going to create a user by running az ad user create dash dash display dash name. In this case, let's create user Jen Hill. So I'll put that in double quotes dash dash user dash principal dash name here i'm going to put in j hill at and then i'm going to put in my dns suffix for my azure ad tenant which in this case is quick 24x7 test dot on microsoft dot com okay so make sure you put in the correct value there if you've added custom dns domain names for your tenant then you might reference that here instead Another mandatory or required parameter is dash dash password. So I have to specify a password for this account. So I'm just going to put in a value here. And I'll close the quotes, which encompass that password. And I'm going to go ahead and press enter to create the user. The next thing I'm going to do is list my users in Azure AD to see if the newly created user Jen Hill shows up. So to do that, I'm going to run AZ AD user list. I'll start with that. Now that's going to return all of the properties. And what we're primarily interested in here is the user principal name property. Notice with user principal name, the P in principal is uppercase, the N in name is uppercase. That's important in the CLI. It's case sensitive when you start referring to things like property names. I'll show you what I mean. So I'm going to clear the screen and I'm going to use the up arrow key to bring up our AZ AD user list syntax. I'm going to add to that, I'm going to use dash dash query and space and then open and close square bracket because we have a collection or an array of users and we refer to that list of users with uh, open and close square bracket and what we want to do is call upon the dot user principal name property now i'm putting it all in lowercase so the name is correct except it doesn't match the case and when i press enter i get a whole lot of nothing so it's case sensitive. So let's bring the command back with the up arrow key again. Let's change the N in name to uppercase and the P in principle to uppercase. And let's press enter again. This time we get what we wanted. For example, we were trying to see that uh, Jen Hill was created. And in fact, it is reporting that she has. We can see her user principle name listed here. So the CLI works very well then with working with Azure AD user accounts. PowerShell can be used to both create and manage Azure AD users. 
to get started here in Cloud Shell, which I've launched from the portal, I'm going to run git dash command. And I'm interested in anything that involves the word new. I want to create a new user. So asterisk new, asterisk again. And I'm going to guess AZAD and put an asterisk after it. And here I can see the list of resultant PowerShell commandlets that match that criteria. There are a few of them, one of which is new dash AZAD user. Perfect. I can even use git dash help new dash AZ. AD user, not case sensitive here in PowerShell, just happens to be the, the way I'm typing it in. I'm going to ask for detail and I'm going to pipe it to more. This way I'll see a detailed breakdown of the syntax and all of the parameters that might be used, some of which might be mandatory here in PowerShell. And as I go further down through the list, I can see the parameters are each listed separately with a description. And I can see the type of data, whether it's a string value and so on. As I go further down in the output, I'll come across some examples of actually how to create a new Azure AD user using this command line, new dash AZ AD user. So let's put it all together. I'm going to create a new user, new dash. Well, actually, let's start with the password, because if we want to store a password in a variable in memory, we're going to need to store that in a secured manner. So it's acceptable to the new dash AZ AD user commandlet. To do that, I'm going to create a variable called dollar sign secure string password. It's going to store the result. So after which we have equals store the result of running convert to dash secure string. Then I have to tell it the string I want to convert to a secured value using the dash string parameter in quotes. I've got my password. Then I've got as plain text dash force. That's going to store my password in that variable. But if I pull up that variable, so dollar sign secure string password enter. I don't see the actual text string. That's the point. We converted it to a secure string. And so all we can see is that a secure string is stored within that variable. Perfect. That's what we want. So now let's proceed with building the user account. New dash AZ AD user dash display name. I'm going to create a user here called Sharon Bishop dash user principal name. Well, this one's important because this is the email or sign in name. Make sure I spell that correctly. So dash user principal name. And in quotes, I'm going to put S Bishop at quick 24 X seven test dot on Microsoft dot com. So that's the default DNS suffix for my Azure AD tenant where I want to create Sharon Bishop. And then I'm going to use dash password and I'm going to use my variable. So dollar sign secure string password. That's the variable that we looked at up above. And I'm going to press enter. Now, what it wants now is another required parameter, mail nickname. Notice here that if you don't specify mandatory parameters, in this case, mail nickname, it's going to prompt you for it. Now, that might be okay if you're just doing this interactively, but what if you wanted to schedule this to run in the background or have an automation script to create a bunch of users? You probably don't want this. So I'm going to press Control C to cancel out of that. And I'm going to use the up arrow key to bring up that previous command. And I'm going to add what is needed here to have this as a complete command. In other words, I want to add the mail nickname parameter. So I'm going to clear the screen, bring up that command with the up arrow key, and I'm going to add dash mail nickname, and I'm going to put in a value of S Bishop. I'm going to put that in quotes and close it up, and I'm going to press enter. This time, it didn't prompt me for anything. This means then that we have successfully created this new user. If we were to run, let's clear the screen. If we were to run git dash AZAD user and simply press enter, we're going to get a list of user accounts that were created, including user Sharon Bishop. Besides creating users directly in Azure AD, you can also invite external users, essentially by sending them an email notification to invite them to partake in accessing Azure AD and its resources. So to get started here, I'm already navigated into my Azure AD tenant into the users view. Now, when I look at all my users, I can see I already have an existing Azure Active Directory user account called Cody Blackwell. And I've got a standard Microsoft account. That's what was used initially to create this Azure AD tenant. So what I'm going to do is create a new 
guest user. So to do that, I can click the new guest user button up at the top. The first thing I have to do is specify the name. I'm going to call this person fake user. And I'm going to specify their email address, in this case, fakeuser173 at hotmail.com. So that's a fictitious user account. And I can specify further details, like I normally will with any user I add, in terms of the first name and the last name. And I can also add a personal message. I'll add a message here that says, hey there, please join our Azure AD environment. I could add whatever I wanted to there, maybe including help desk, phone numbers, and so on, if there are any problems doing this. Down below, I can also associate this user with a group, so being a member of a group, or specific roles to give them specific management permissions here in Azure. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to specify anything else. So the sign-in, usage location, job title, department, I'm just going to leave as they are. And I'm going to click Invite. So what's happening at this point is an invitation is being sent via email to the email address we specified for that user. And notice here in Azure AD, the presence of our new user, fake user. The icon is different. It looks like a globe because it's a guest or external invited user. The user type is shown here as guest. If we take a look at the inbox for that user, then we'll see that there's a Microsoft invitation email message. We can click on it. And it's inviting the user to partake in the quick 24x7 organization. And we can even see the personalized message. And the user can then click on get started, which will open up a new tab. And what it will do is take them in to the myapps.microsoft.com page because they are now partaking in quick 24x7. So the benefit of them partaking is that they don't need an account created directly in Azure AD. They're considered an external user and they would then have access to apps that they have been given permissions to. Now back here in Azure AD, if I click the refresh button, we can now see the username, email address has been filled out, and we can also see the source here is Microsoft account as opposed to Azure Active Directory. When you have numerous user accounts you need to create all at once in Azure AD, you might consider using an import file and using the bulk create option. So let's do that. Here in the portal, I've navigated to my Azure AD tenant and I'm looking at the all users view and there's a button across the top called bulk create. So I'm going to go ahead and choose bulk create. Now from here, I can download a CSV template and then populate it with the appropriate user information. I've already done that. So let's take a look at the file that we're going to be uploading here. So the template gives me a lot of the column headings here, and it's got a version string in row one. So the first thing I've done is, is specified a couple of usernames and full usernames, which is the email address, the sign in ID. You have to make sure, of course, that you're using the correct DNS domain suffix for your Azure AD tenant, where you want these users created. I'm also specifying an initial password and these ones are required. Now you can tell these are mandatory because they have an asterisk in the column heading at the end of the name of that item. Whereas if I look at some other optional items here, like block sign in or first name, last name, job title, department, all of that stuff is optionally available. I can fill it in, but it's not required. So therefore I haven't. So I'm going to go ahead and upload this Azure bulk user create users CSV file. So back here in the portal, that's step three, upload your CSV file. I'm going to click the little folder icon to the far right, and I'm going to select that on-premises file that I want uploaded here into Azure. Now it says file uploaded successfully. If there was something wrong with the file, maybe I deleted the header row or the formatting was incorrect in some way, then I would get a message here that would tell me something to that effect. So at this point, I'm going to click submit. So what it's doing right now is creating Azure AD user accounts for each entry in that CSV file. And after a moment, because I only had two users, it says succeeded, the file is ready, click here to download. Well, I don't want to download, but I can click to view the status of each of those operations for the bulk user creation. So it says here that it completed with no errors, success for two entries and failure of zero. Well, that's, that's a good thing. Let's go back to the all users view and let's just make sure that our users are showing up here. Back in our import file, we wanted to create Marcia Lynn 
and Lucas Brenner. So they should show up now as Azure AD users. And of course, I can see indeed Marcia Lin and Lucas Brenner were created and they are Azure Active Directory user accounts. PowerShell can be used so that you can bulk invite guest users to partake in Azure AD, as opposed to doing one at a time manually in the Azure portal. So here I've got a script opened up in the PowerShell ISC. In line one, because I'm doing this from on-premises, I would need to authenticate to my Azure AD tenant. So I could do that with the connect-Azure AD PowerShell command limit, and I can use the dash tenant domain parameter and specify the Azure AD tenant. Next thing I'm doing is creating a variable called dollar sign users, where I want to store all of the user information so that I have a listing of the users I want to invite. So to do that, I'm using the import dash CSV commandlet, and I'm referring to a bulk guest invite CSV file I've prepared. And I want to store the result of importing that in the dollar sign users variable. Let's take a second and let's take a look at that CSV file. So I've opened up that CSV file in Microsoft Excel on my on-premises system, and the only thing it has is one user's information. So we can see the name column and the value underneath it, fake user. We can see the invited user email address, and underneath that, the email address for that user. Now, realistically, if you're going to do bulk invite, you're going to have many names and email addresses limited for people you want to invite to partake in Azure AD. Here, it's only one. The next thing I'm doing in line five is creating a variable called dollar sign custom underscore MSG. That's for a custom message I want to include with the invitation. To build that, I'm going to use new dash object microsoft.open.msgraph.model.invited user message info. That's quite a mouthful, but that's what I would do to create that variable. And then I populate it by calling upon that variable and more specifically the dot customized message body property. I'll put an equal sign and then in quotes, I'll put in my custom message. The next thing we're going to do is create a for each loop because I want to process each user within that CSV file. We know there's only one, but whether there's one or 1000, this would work. So I'm using a for each loop and in parentheses, I have dollar sign email in dollar sign users. What does that mean? Well, first of all, dollar sign email is just a looping variable that I'm making up. So each time through the loop, dollar sign email will contain the current user's information, the current line in that CSV import file. Now, dollar sign users, of course, references the variable up above on line three, where we imported all of the users from the import file. So whether it's one or a thousand doesn't make a difference. So what are we gonna do for each user within that file? We're going to run the new dash Azure ADMS invitation command lib. We're going to specify the dash invited user email address parameter. And we're going to extract that from our looping variable here, which was defined up in the for each line, dollar sign email. And we're going to call upon the dot invited user email address property. We're going to do the same type of thing for the dash invited user display name. We're going to call upon the dot name property within that variable. And then we're going to specify the dash invited redirect URL. And when the user is invited, I want them, when they click on the link in the message, to be redirected to HTTPS colon slash slash myapps.microsoft.com. I want to use my custom message. So the way I do that is with dash invited user message info. And there's our variable underscore custom or dollar sign custom underscore message. Finally, I'm going to use dash send invitation message dollar sign true. So it's not as if we just want to generate it and send it later. We want to generate it and send it now. Now, everything in the for each loop must be enclosed within an open and closing curly brace, which was done here. After a moment, we can see that it looks like our code executed here from the ISC and an invitation has been sent to fakeuser173 at hotmail.com. And if we check the inbox for that invited user, they have a Microsoft invitation message and we can see the custom message that was added to that invitation. The user could then click get started to actually sign in, in this case, to our redirect URL. So it's asking us if we want to allow these permissions. I'm going to choose accept. That's for Azure AD. And it's going to redirect to myapps.microsoft.com for that user.
In Azure AD, you can assign licenses at the directory level that you can then use for users that need those licenses, such as to use a specific product feature. So here in the portal, I've navigated to my Azure AD tenant. And in the navigation bar on the left, I'm going to start by going down and looking at licenses at the Azure AD tenant level. So I'm going to click the manage your purchased licenses over on the far right. And I can see for Azure AD, I've got the Azure Active Directory Premium P2 license and the Enterprise Mobility Plus Security E5 license. I can see how many have been assigned. It's set to zero. So that's for users. And I can also see how many are available and if any are expiring soon. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to my Active Directory tenant and I'm going to go into my users view. So looking at all users, what I want to do is make sure I assign a license, one of those licenses to one of my users so they can benefit from the use of that product. So for example, I'm going to select user Sharon Bishop. Now, when you look at an individual user, like I am now in the navigation bar on the left, you will also see licenses. When I click licenses, I see that there are no license assignments found for this particular user. So I can click the assignments button up at the top to assign licenses for this particular user. For example, I'm going to turn on Enterprise Mobility plus Security E5. These are the two product licenses that were shown at the Azure AD level, you might recall. Now within Enterprise Mobility and Security E5, I can remove or add check marks for each individual item that I want this user to have license access to. So I want all of them checked. They're checked on. So I'm going to go ahead and click save to assign that license to the user. However, if I look at a notification area in the upper right, it says the license assignment failed for the member. And if I click on it, it's going to tell me that you can't do this unless you've specified a usage location within the user properties. Oh, okay. No problem. That's easy to solve. I'm going to close out of this message, go back into Azure Active Directory, go back into my users. And I'm going to go in and modify the usage location property for Sharon Bishop. So I'm going to click on Sharon Bishop to open up her account. And I'm currently looking at the profile blade, which I'm going to edit. So I'll click the edit button and I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to specify a usage location. So I can do that from the drop down list here under settings. So I can filter the list here. I'm going to select Canada as the usage location for that user. I'll click save. And we're going to assign a license once again to Sharon, but this time it's going to work. So I'm going to click licenses in the left hand navigator. I'm going to click the assignments button. Once again, I'll choose enterprise mobility plus security E5. They're all checked on. I'll click save. And this time we are good to go. The save button is no longer lit up. And if we look at our notification area, it says that the license assignment succeeded. In Azure AD, you can enable the self-service password reset option. This means that when users forget their password, instead of opening up a help desk ticket to solve that issue, they can simply reset it themselves. So let's take a look at where that's configured here in Azure AD. In the portal, I've already navigated to my Azure AD tenant, Quick 24 X seven. So what I want to do then is go down and click on users in the left hand navigator. And then I'm going to click on password reset on the left. The default configuration for self-service password reset is that it is not enabled. However, I could click selected and I could select one or more Azure AD groups whose members I want to benefit from the self-service password reset option. I'm going to close that out. I could also just choose all so that all of the users in my organization can partake in self-service password reset. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and I'm going to click save. If I click the authentication methods option for password reset, I can see that we can require one or two methods for requiring a password reset. Down below, we've got email and mobile phone selected. We could also turn on mobile app code. So users only have to have a mobile app installed, maybe a security question. So maybe the user only has to register three security questions and requires three of them to reset. And we could select these security questions from the list. So we could use predefined or select custom. I'll choose predefined questions. I'm just going to select a couple of them and then I'll click OK. 
And of course, those are the ones that I want to use. So I'm going to select all of them and choose OK. So what we're doing is determining when a user wants to reset their password, how do we really verify that it's them? So I'm going to click Save to save those authentication methods. Next thing I'm going to do is log in as an Azure AD user. Let's go back to the users view. How about in our case, it'll be user Sharon Bishop. We're going to log in normally as Sharon now that the self-service password reset option has been enabled. So to test this out, I'm going to log into myapps.microsoft.com as user Sharon Bishop. Okay, so I've specified Sharon's sign-in name, so I'm going to go ahead and click Next. Now, she hasn't forgotten her password yet, so when I say sign-in normally, that's what I mean. So I'm going to go ahead and specify Sharon's password, and we're going to click Sign In. Now, first thing it's going to say is, well, we need to update your password because it's the first time you signed in or could be because the password has expired. In this case, it's because it's the first time Sharon has signed in. All right, once I've specified and confirmed a new password for Sharon, I'll click sign in. Now, the next thing that happens is it says your administrator has required you to verify your contact info. You can use it to reset your password. Perfect. That's what we want. So I'm going to click verify now. Users need to expect this and they need to be instructed to go through, follow through with it in order for this to work properly. So we have a new screen. Don't lose access to your account. It says you'll need to set up at least one of the options below. So the authentication phone, authentication email or security questions. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, let's click on security questions. Let's click the set them up now link for that. So security question one, these are the questions that we had specified when we configured authentication methods. So I'm going to select each of them and provide an answer to go through this. Okay, I've specified the answers to those three questions and the answers are all different. They can't be the same. I'm going to go ahead and click finish. All right, so at this point, Sharon Bishop has completed her sign in. Now, what's going to happen if she forgets her password? Well, let's test that out now that it's set up. So I'm going to click on Sharon Bishop in the upper right here on the myapps.microsoft.com site, and I'm going to choose sign out. So we're going to sign back in as user Sharon Bishop. I'll click next. And of course, she doesn't know her password. So she tries to put something in. It doesn't work. And she'll see that she has a link here to reset it now. So I'm going to click on that link. So it's already filled in the user ID for Sharon Bishop. Then it wants me to enter the characters I see in the picture. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'll click on next. Then we have our security questions because that's what user Sharon Bishop has set up. So I have to answer these three security questions, not one of them. We configured the authentication methods so that users would have to enter in the answers to three of them. Okay, I'm going to fill in the answers. And when I successfully answer those security questions, I'm then prompted to enter and confirm a new password. And then when I do that successfully, it says, get back into your account. Your password has been reset. So we are good to go. The user was able to reset their own password without involving the help desk. Then we have a link down below, of course, to sign in with your new password. Click here. So I'm going to click that link. I'm going to sign in as user Sharon Bishop again with the newly entered password. And then I'm taken directly, in this case, into the myapps.microsoft.com website, which is what I specified initially when logging in. Azure AD fraud alerts are useful so that if users are set up for multi-factor authentication or MFA, and one of the authentication methods, for example, is to call the user, if the user gets one of those calls yet they haven't initiated a sign-in, that's suspicious. Normally, if the user receives a phone call, what they'll do is type in the pound symbol when they get the message from Microsoft, and then the sign-in continues. Or they can use a fraud code, which is by default zero. They can type in zero and then the pound symbol, which locks the account because it's a suspicious type of request that the user has received. They didn't initiate a sign-in. So how do we configure all of this? Well, here in the portal, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure I've navigated to my Azure AD tenant, which I have. The tenant is called Quick. 24x7. The next thing I'm going to do in the navigation bar is go all the way down and choose security. And then I'm going to choose MFA for multi-factor authentication. And from within here, you'll see in the left-hand navigator, fraud alert. That's what I'm going to click on. It's not on by default, 
but there's not very much that we need to do to enable it. So I'm going to turn it on to allow users to submit fraud alerts, automatically block users who report fraud. So the account will be blocked if, for example, the user receives an MFA phone call they didn't initiate and they type in zero pound, the account will be locked by default. So you can determine if that's on or off. And you can also determine the default code that the user would enter. The default is zero, and I'm going to leave it as such. So at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and click save. Now, what will happen is that if a user's account does happen to end up being blocked, it'll show up here in the MFA area under block slash unblock users where we could see the user account that was blocked because of this, and we could opt to unblock them. You can use Azure AD conditional policies to allow access to resources such as an app only after specified conditions have been satisfied. So to do this here in the Azure portal, I've navigated to my Azure AD tenant. To work with conditional access policies, I start by going down to security in the navigation bar for Azure AD. The next thing I want to do is go into conditional access. Now, when I go into conditional access, I'll see a number of default policies that are created. But what I want to do is create my own policy. Basically, my goal here is to make sure that any users trying to access Office 365 must be using a certain device, maybe an Android device, and they have to be signing in using MFA. So those are the two conditions. So I'm going to create a new policy. I'm going to click the new policy button up at the top to make that happen. So I'm going to call this Android Access Off 365. Now I can specify certain users and groups by clicking on that on the left and then starting to navigate through Azure AD if I want to specify select users and groups. In this case, I'm going to choose all users and I'm going to choose done. Now, notice it says don't lock yourself out. This policy affects all user accounts, including your administrative account. So be careful with this. So here I might select specific users. So I can choose users and groups. I can go down and I can select specific users and or groups. So let's say I'm going to choose user Cody Blackwell. So I could add one or more users or groups to which this conditional access policy should apply. I'm going to click done. Now the next thing I want to do is specify cloud apps or actions. In this case, I'm interested in apps. So I'm going to choose select apps. I'll click select. These are the apps that are registered with your Azure AD tenant. So I've got Office 365. I'm going to select that and then I'll click the select button at the bottom and I'm going to click done. But we haven't specified conditions quite yet. So I'm going to go down for conditions and click on that part of the policy. That's going to open up a new conditions blade where I want to specify the device platform because currently it says not configured. So I'm going to click on that and I'm going to choose select device platform. So configure, yes, select device platform. Let's say I want them only to be using Android devices because that's all our employees have been issued. So there's no reason for any other type of device to be used for this particular purpose. I'll click done. I can then specify many other things such as locations that users are coming in from and so on. I can also specify client apps they might have to have installed and the state of the device. However, that's all I'm going to do here. I'm going to click done. Next thing I want to do is scroll down and I'm going to go to access controls. So what I want to do is I want to grant access in this case for Android device users in Azure AD, specifically user Cody Blackwell to access Office 365 and I want to require multi-factor authentication or MFA. All right, so I'm going to choose select to add that. And I want to turn this policy on. I can have it in report only mode, which is kind of like an audit mode to see what would happen. But if I actually want it enforced, I would turn it on. And then I would click create to create the policy. And we can now see our custom conditional access policy shown on the list by the name of Android Access Off 365. In this demonstration, I'm going to enable multi-factor authentication or MFA for an Azure AD user. The first thing I've done here in the portal is already navigated to my Azure AD tenant Quick 24x7. And within that, I've gone and viewed my users. So I'm in the all users view. 
Now, when you want to configure multi-factor authentication, you need to get into the appropriate location here. There's a button across the top, and depending on your video screen resolution, it may not be visible. You might have to go to the context three dot button, where you can then select multi-factor authentication. That's going to open up a new web browser window where you'll see your users and the multi-factor authentication status, which is currently set to disabled. That's a default for all users. So I want to enable multi-factor authentication for user Cody Blackwell. So I'm going to turn on the check mark for Cody Blackwell. And on the far right, under quick steps, I'm going to click enable. Then I'll click the enable multi-factor auth button that pops up. Then I'll click close. So we can see that multi-factor authentication is now enabled for user Cody Blackwell. So what we're going to do then is sign in as user Cody Blackwell to see what happens. So I've specified Cody Blackwell's sign-in information. What I'm testing here is connecting to the myapps.microsoft.com URL. And I'm going to click Next. And I'm going to put in the password for that account. And then I'll click Sign In. So we get this triggered message that says more information is required. Okay, well that's happening because we've enabled MFA. So I'm going to go ahead and click Next. So it says, okay, additional security verification. How should we contact you for MFA? Now the available authentication methods here are authentication phone or mobile app, and then we can specify some other options. So maybe I'll choose mobile app, receive notifications for verification. I'll turn that on. And now I'm going to choose the setup button. So what it says is, okay, configure the mobile app on your mobile device. So I've got an Android phone. And I've already installed the Microsoft Authenticator app. So within that app, what you can do is add a new account by scanning this QR image down below, which is what I'm going to do on my mobile phone. So in step two, I'm told to start the app. In my case, I'm using Microsoft Authenticator app. Then I need to add an account and specifically it says to select work or school account. That's going to activate the camera on the phone and it's going to ask you to scan in this code. So I'm just going to position my phone and I've just done it. So it says it's activating and ready to go. So what it will do is add that account automatically in the app on your phone for the quick 24 X seven in this case, Azure AD tenant. And there's going to be a six digit pin that's ready to go right away. That counts down every 30 seconds. So it keeps changing. Awesome. Okay, perfect. I'm going to click next. So we've received it. So it's checking the activation status. We'll just give it a moment. And it knows that the mobile app has been configured for notifications. It's currently active. So I'm just going to go ahead and click next. So it says, let's make sure that we can reach you on your mobile app device. Please respond to the notification. Well, on my phone, a message popped up that says, do you want to approve sign in for that account? It's got the account details. I'm going to simply tap on approve on my phone. And after a second, we should see that reflected here. All right, looks good. Then it says, in case you lose access to the mobile app, heaven forbid, well, what should we do? Well, let's go ahead and specify some details. So I'm going to specify my country, Canada. And in this case, I'll specify my phone number for my phone. And then I'm going to continue going through the wizard, accepting defaults. And at this point, we've got multi-factor authentication set up successfully for Cody Blackwell, but we haven't actually seen it in action yet. We've just set it up. So let's go ahead and log out as Cody, and then we'll log back in. So I'm signing back in as user Cody Blackwell, and I'm going to specify the password. So we still need to know the password for the account, but when I do that successfully, it will then ask me to approve the sign-in request. So on my smartphone, in my app, my, in this case, Microsoft Authenticator app, which you can install from any app store, I'm going to go ahead and tap on approve. I approve the sign in. So not only must I know the username and the password, I must possess the smartphone with that app and tap the phone when I'm presented with the question of approving the sign in. So I'm just going to go ahead and continue through this login process, at which point now we are successfully logged in as user Cody Blackwell using MFA. Back here in the portal, now that we have done this, I'm going to go back into the MFA, multi-factor authentication option that opens up a new window. And notice that instead of just showing as enabled, 
for Cody Blackwell because that user has signed in and it's now being used. It says enforced. When you work with Azure AD, there are many security options that can control how users can sign in. To get started here in the portal, I'm in my Azure AD tenant named Quick24x7. What I'm going to start with is scrolling down in the navigation bar and choosing security, since that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about security options. One of the first things I'm going to do here is click on conditional access. Now, here in conditional access, we're currently looking at the policies view. And we can create policies with conditions that must be satisfied before allowing access to things like Azure AD or Azure AD apps. But besides that, there are numerous other things that we can do. For example, I'm going to click Named Locations on the left. Here, we can specify named locations that are essentially treated as trusted sign-in locations for users. So I'm going to click the Add New Location button up at the top, and I'm going to give it a name. So I'm going to call it Headquarters. And from here, I can specify IP ranges or countries and regions. I could select that. But I'm going to specify IP ranges, and I'm going to add an IP range down below. So I've entered in an IP address range that represents my headquarters location. So I'm just going to go ahead and click Create. We can see that headquarters is listed down below. Now I could go back to my policies view. And let's say I'm going to edit an existing policy I have, but I just as well could be creating a new policy. I'm going to click on an existing policy. One of the things I can specify within a policy is a location. So for example, under conditions, I could expand that. And notice on the right in the conditions blade, we see locations. It's currently not configured. So I could select that and start selecting from trusted locations. So for configure, I'll choose yes. I'll choose all trusted locations, or I could choose specific selected ones. Now, I've only got one, so it really doesn't matter, but I'm going to choose Headquarters, Select, Done, Done Again, and Save to save my policy. So you can have a policy, in this case, that's an existing custom policy that allows Android devices to access Office 365. In this case, only from my trusted named location. If I go back to named location, there are some other variations on what you might configure. For example, I can click the Configure MFA Trusted IPs button. That's going to open up a new page with MFA or Multi-Factor Authentication Service settings. So for example, I might specify down here in the block, trusted IP addresses whereby MFA isn't even required. So it says skip Multi-Factor Authentication for requests initiating from the following range of IP address subnets. So I could specify that as well as down below verification options for MFA. If I scroll down on the MFA settings, I can also allow users to turn on the multi-factor remembering option so that on devices they trust, MFA authentication settings after successful authentication are remembered and must be re-authenticated once every 14 days by default, although I could change that. So I'm going to close out of that extra window tab. In Azure AD, you can configure a list of banned passwords that are not to be used by users. Now, you might want to exclude them because they present a security risk to user accounts. To get started here in the portal, I'm already navigated to my Azure AD tenant, Quick24x7. So the next thing I'm going to do in the navigation bar is make sure I scroll down and choose security. After which, I'm going to choose authentication methods. And then within here, I can choose password protection. So we've got a couple of options available here, such as lockout. The default here is to lock out user accounts after three subsequent login attempts where the password is incorrect, and it will be locked out for the duration of seconds specified here, the default of which is 120. We can change those values, but I'm going to leave them. Down below is what we want, the custom banned password enforce list. I'm going to choose yes, and I'm going to enter in a few passwords that should never be allowed. Now, the great thing is you don't have to enter variations of uppercase and lowercase letters that's automatically accounted for for the items in your custom band password list. So I've added a few entries here. Down below, notice that the mode is set to audit. This just tracks passwords that might be being used. If you actually want to enforce 
this. You want to prevent the use of the listed custom band password list, then you have to choose enforced, which I will do, and then I'll click save. So here in my browser, I've signed into the myapps.microsoft.com website as user Cody Blackwell. We might also be logged into something else related to Azure AD, such as portal.azure.com. So it really doesn't matter. But in this case, I'm going to try to reset the password for Cody. So I'm going to click on Cody's name in the upper right. I'm going to choose profile and I'm going to choose change password. So naturally, the first thing I'll have to do is specify the old password. I want to change the new password to this variation of the text, my dog has fleas. Now we just entered in the raw text and lower case letters in our configuration in Azure AD for my dog has fleas, but we said it will look at all variations and it will. So it should prevent us from using this. I'm going to go ahead and copy that password and we're going to go ahead and try to use that to reset it. So I've pasted in that variation on that password here in the create new password and confirm new password fields. It says it's a strong password, which indeed it is. But when I click submit, it should say that it's not allowed. And it does. It says, unfortunately, you can't use that password because it contains words, characters that have been blocked by your administrator. Please try again with a different password. So the result is that our custom band password list is working. You can configure Azure AD such that MFA registration is required for some or all user accounts to enhance security of your environment. To get started here in the portal, I'm already in my Azure AD tenant called Quick24x7. So down in the navigation bar, I'm going to go down and click on security. Now I'm going to click on identity protection, and then I'm going to click on the MFA registration policy. Now here, I have to specify to which users in Azure AD this MFA registration policy applies. So whether it's all users or some users. So we have it set to all users in Azure AD, but we could select individuals and groups that we want to apply MFA registration to as a requirement. However, in this case, I'm going to leave it on all users. Notice we could exclude certain accounts that for some reason we might not want to partake in MFA. So I'm going to go ahead and click done. The next thing is to specify controls. Here, the option to require Azure MFA registration is checked on. So I'm going to go ahead and choose select to make sure that's enabled. Down below, if we want this policy enforced, in this case, MFA registration is required for every user, then we could simply turn it on and click save. This means upon next sign in, any user that's currently not registered for MFA they will be prompted for it. A managed identity as it relates to Azure really references permissions that can be applied to a resource like a virtual machine. You might have custom code running within an Azure virtual machine and instead of putting in the credentials to access other Azure resources directly in your code, instead you could have that done at the VM level through a managed identity. And you can set this up initially when you deploy a VM or after the fact. Let's take a look at both of those variations. So to start with, I'm going to click create a resource here in the portal. We're going to start stepping through the motions of deploying a VM. So under popular, I'm just going to click on Windows Server 2016 data center. It doesn't matter what I select here because I'm not going to create it. But I do want to point out the management tab here as part of the new VM creation process. So here in the create a virtual machine page or on the basics tab, I'm just going to skip right ahead and jump to management so that we can focus on the issue at hand, which is managed identities. So I'm going to scroll down on the management tab where under the identity section, we'll see an option called system assigned managed identity and it's off by default. So I could turn that on. Now, by doing this, I am associating a managed identity with this VM, and then I could go elsewhere to other resources and in the IAM configuration, Identity and Access Management, the permissions, and I could add this VM's managed identity. Now, we can also do it for an existing VM, and let's take a look at that. So I'm just going to go home here. It'll discard my current settings because I don't want to create the VM anyway. So I'm just going to click OK. That's fine. Now, I'm going to navigate to my virtual machines view where I'm going to open up an existing 
virtual machine. Now, when you're looking at the navigation bar for an existing VM, if you scroll down, you'll see identity. This is where the managed identity config resides. Now, we can see currently that the status for system assigned identities is set to off. Just going to scroll to the right here. Now, a system assigned managed identity means it's tied to the resource. In this case, the resource I'm referring to is my virtual machine. So in other words, it's not going to create a separate Azure resource as a managed system identity. It's simply tied, in this case, to my virtual machine. Using a user assigned managed identity means it's used for the same purpose, to allow the code in the VM to authenticate without putting credentials in the code. The difference is that a user assigned managed identity is a separate Azure resource unto itself. I'm just going to go with system assigned. The status is on. Now I've turned it off and saved it. This is what it looks like if system assigned managed identity is not enabled. There's nothing down below. But if we turn on the status and then click save, and then yes, we're good to go. Now, how does this get used? Well, for that, as an example, let's say that we've got code running in that VM that needs certain permissions to an Azure storage account. So I'm going to navigate to my storage accounts here in the portal. I'm just going to open one of them up and I'm going to assign RBAC permissions by clicking on the access control IM blade. Now within here, I want to add permissions. So I'm going to click the add button, choose add role assignment. When you add a role assignment, you can specify for assigning the access to an Azure AD user, group, or service principal. And from that drop down list, I can see system assigned managed identities. And I'm going to scroll down and choose virtual machine because that's where we set it up. And I can see here the virtual machine is available. So I'm going to select that and add it. So what I'm doing is assigning whatever role I choose from up above. So I can select the permissions that should be required let's say storage blob data reader, I'm assigning it to the code running in that virtual machine. That way, as a developer, I don't have to build that into my code itself. So I'm just going to go ahead and save that assignment. And when I go to role assignments by clicking that tab, I will see that that role assignment has been configured. Let's just check that out. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. So storage blob data reader permissions were assigned to the managed identity for our virtual machine. You can register apps within Azure AD. By doing this, you are integrating your app with the benefits of authentication and authorization that Azure AD provides. So to get started here in the portal, I'm going to navigate to Azure Active Directory. I'll make sure I'm in the correct tenant. And I'm going to scroll down in the navigation bar up until I see App Registrations. Now, when I see app registrations, I'll see any existing apps that are already registered with Azure AD. Remember, the benefit is that you're essentially funneling authentication requests here through Azure Active Directory. So I'm going to click New Registration up at the top. And I'm going to put in a display name for the app. This is going to be what users see. I'm just going to call this Sample App 1. And I want to use this application for accounts in this organizational directory. So my quick 24x7 Azure AD tenant. Although if you have multiple tenants, you could specify any Azure AD directory. However, I'm going to leave it on that. Scrolling down the redirect URI. So for web, I can specify the redirection. Basically, when a user successfully authenticates through Azure AD, which is the point of us doing this, when they try to access that app, we can have an authentication token sent to the app. And we can do this by specifying the redirect URI. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and fill this in. So maybe the redirect URI for this app is https colon slash slash sampleapp1.com slash auth. So I'm going to go ahead and register the application with Azure AD. Depending on how apps are written to handle authorization, in the overview blade of our newly registered sample app, we can click on the endpoints button on the right to see a variety of different types of endpoints, such as for OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, the Microsoft Graph API endpoint, the Federation Metadata Document, SAML, and so on. 
Over on the left, if we click branding, aside from the name that we've already filled in, we can specify other details that users would see, like a new logo for this app, the homepage URL, and so on. If I click on authentication, we can see what we filled out when we registered the app, the web redirect URI, and even further down below, we can specify a logout URL, which can be important as is suggested here for single sign out to work correctly, if single sign on is being used. We can even click on token configuration. Remember, a token is issued by Azure AD after successful authentication, and the token is what's handled off handed off to the app to allow user authorization. Depending on how the app is coded, it might need to see certain types of properties and values, and that's called a claim. And so here under token configuration, I could click add optional claim, let's say ID for the token type, and then I could specify the items that should be included, such as a given name or an email address, a family name, IP address, because maybe the application is coded to consume that and needs to see it to give the user the appropriate authorization in the application. We can also click on API permissions over on the left if we want to make sure that this app has specific permissions to specific APIs, application programming interfaces. That really depends on how the app is coded, but we do have an add a permission button. And if you're feeling adventurous, you can make changes to a lot of these settings directly in the application's manifest config file by clicking manifest. So in this course, we've examined Azure AD users and security options, including how to deploy and manage Azure AD tenants and users, and also how to configure sign-in security settings. We did this by exploring the role of Azure AD as it relates to authentication and authorization. We looked at how to create a new Azure AD tenant, switch between those tenants, and how to configure Azure AD verification methods. We looked at how to use the portal, CLI, and PowerShell to manage Azure AD users. We looked at how to manage guest user accounts and how to create users through Bulk Create, and how to use Bulk Invite for guest users, how to assign product licenses to users, and how to allow users to reset their own passwords. Next, we looked at how to enable Azure AD fraud alerts and configure Azure AD conditional access. We looked at how to enable multi-factor authentication, or MFA, for users, and also how to limit Azure AD authentication. We looked at how to use banned password lists and enable identity protection for Azure AD user accounts. And finally, we looked at how to configure an Azure AD managed identity and register an app with Azure AD. In our next course, we'll move on to explore how to download, configure, and work with Azure AD Connect to link Azure AD with an on-premises AD environment.